All right, the Rules Committee will come to order. Uh, today we are considering H.R. 4502, a seven bill appropriations uh, minibus. After years of the prior administration pushing an unprecedented era of disinvestment, we are turning the page. This Democratic Congress and the Biden administration are finally turning the page. The, this package makes key investments in our middle class, seniors, students, veterans, and service members, farmers, and small businesses, and I could go on and on and on. It includes resources to confront the climate crisis head on and funds the most racially diverse programs of any package of its kind. This package will not only help us continue to recover from the COVID pandemic, but it will also build a more just and equitable future for many years to come. I'm especially proud that this measure expands access to healthy foods like fruits and vegetables to more than 6 million people through the WIC program. And it ensures that more than 40 million people in SNAP eligible families get the benefits that they need. It also makes key investments in child nutrition programs like school meals. It also, I'm also glad uh, that the Hyde Amendment is nowhere to be found. Because however we feel about abortion, we shouldn't deny health coverage just because someone is working to make ends meet. The decision about whether to get an abortion is a deeply personal one, and we don't know the circumstances. But I do, I do know this, we should not defer to the politicians and special interest groups who want to impose their values on others. We should trust women to make their own decisions about what's best for them and their families. It's about freedom, justice, and respecting women's personal autonomy. Lastly, I want to recognize <coughs> the extraordinary work of the staff here uh, on both sides. I want to thank the appropriation staff and the rules staff. Um, um, almost a thousand amendments and revisions have been submitted over the past week. And they have worked day and night through the weekend uh, to sort through all of them. Uh, work with the parliamentarians um, and they have worked to coordinate with members' offices. Uh, most people, including a lot of members, have no idea of all the work that staff does on the, on the committees of jurisdiction and on the rules committee to actually make their amendments presentable so they can actually be in order. Um, and, in fact, we have already received more amendments this appropriation season uh, than the prior one. So I expect a lot of discussion today, but let me begin by turning to our ranking member, Mr. Cole, for any comments he wishes to make. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for reuniting me with my close friends who I've spent a lot of time with <laughs> over the last couple of weeks, and I'm going to enjoy uh, spending some more time with them. I couldn't, uh, couldn't be prouder of our committee as an appropriator. I couldn't be prouder of my chairman and my ranking member and, and all my colleagues. I know uh, my good friend from California uh, and my good friend from Pennsylvania feel the same way because they're wonderful members of that committee as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, today's hearing covers a large appropriations package that incorporates reported bills from seven of the 12 subcommittees of the Appropriations Committee. The package totals $770 billion in federal discretionary spending, including over $250 billion coming out of the Labor, Health and Human Services, and Education Subcommittee, where I'm privileged to be the ranking member. Today's package is an excellent illustration of the question I've repeatedly asked the majority during the 117th Congress. Are they here to make political points or to make law? Sadly, this package seems to suggest the former is once again the majority's goal. At the end of the day, the appropriations process is one that must be both bipartisan and bicameral. It requires input from both parties in both chambers, and it requires both parties in both chambers to reach a final agreement. The bills that result from the process are not always the bills I would write, they ultimately end up reflecting the input of all members of Congress, representing a fair compromise and producing the best results for the American people. Unfortunately, the package before us today makes no pretense of being bipartisan and sets us off on the wrong foot. Instead, it's a truly partisan package, drafted solely by the majority and reflecting the priorities of the majority. While this is certainly their right, drafting a bill this way destines it to failure in the Senate which must cooperate in a bipartisan manner, and therefore it has no chance, as written, to become law. The problems with this bill start with the unrealistic allocation levels. The majority chose to mark these bills to spending levels that reflect only progressive liberal priorities. These spending levels call for an increase in non-defense discretionary spending of 17%, 
while calling for an increase in defense spending of a meager 1.7 percent, effectively an inflation-adjusted cut. At a time when the United States is facing continual crises ranging from the Middle East to Afghanistan and across to the South China Sea, it's hardly a time to starve our national uh, security of needed funds. Yet in using these unrealistic levels, that's exactly what the majority is doing. The package before us cuts out bipartisan policy priorities that have been carried in appropriations packages for decades, while also adding in liberal and progressive riders that simply cannot pass both chambers and become law. The most shocking demonstration of the majority's misstep is the decision to strip out the Hyde Amendment, the long-standing bipartisan commitment that no federal taxpayer dollars can be used to fund abortions except in limited circumstances and the commitment to protect the conscience rights of the majority of American taxpayers who are opposed to publicly funding abortion. In the 45 years since the Hyde Amendment was first enacted, by a Democratic Congress, I might add, uh, it, was saved, uh, it has saved more than 2 million lives nationwide, 47,000 in my home state of Oklahoma. It's been supported by presidents and lawmakers of both parties, including every Democrat on this committee, here um, in the last Congress, uh, when Chairwoman Delora included the Hyde Amendment in the Democrats' FY 2021 Labor HHS Appropriations Bill. And until recently, of course, President Biden, when he served in the United States Senate and while he was vice president and even campaigning for president uh, until two years ago, supported the Hyde Amendment. Removing language that has been included in appropriations bills for decades is not only an overreach by the far left, but it also threatens to destabilize the entire appropriations process itself. Appropriations bills simply cannot pass both chambers and be signed into law without the language incorporated in the Hyde and Weldon Amendments. I filed an amendment to today's package joined by every single Republican in the House as co-sponsors to restore the Hyde and Weldon Amendments uh, to this package. I urge the majority to include this amendment so that we can restore these important life-saving and conscience protections to this package. I also urge the majority to restore all the other bipartisan policy provisions and remove strictly partisan ones so that we can reach a final deal on the spending for the 2022 fiscal uh, budget. If we fail to do that, uh, we will end up with a continuing resolution. And so all of these uh, increases at whatever level won't occur because the Hyde language and the Weldon language will be in a CR. Uh, so that's really the, the question in front of us, whether or not my friends want a, a uh, budget uh, that is negotiated between the two sides where they can achieve uh, many of their priorities or they want to go into the second year of the Biden administration with the budget from the last year of the Trump administration. Uh, you know, a budget that was negotiated by a Republican president, a, a Republican Senate, uh, with a Democratic House. Right now you've got the presidency, you've got the House, and you've got the Senate. So I wouldn't think the CR is where you want to go. But I can tell you, if that language is not back in the bill, that's exactly where we are headed. And if we don't make some adjustments in domestic as opposed to defense spending, I also think that's exactly where we are headed. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you. I look forward to the coming week, and I yield back. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you for your opening. I'd now like to welcome our witnesses to provide testimony in H.R. 4502, the fiscal year 2022 uh, minibus. We will uh, first hear testimony from the following appropriations subcommittees, Labor, Health, and Human Services, Agriculture and Rural Development, and Energy and uh, Water. So Chair DeLauro, Ranking Member Granger, Ranking Member Cole, Chairman Bishop, Ranking Member Fortenberry, Chairwoman Captor, Ranking Member Simpson, we are all delighted that you are here. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just and, didn't want to get up and interrupt. And um, uh, in any event, um, thank you for being here. I now recognize the gentlewoman from Connecticut, uh, the Chair of the Appropriations Committee, Ms. DeLauro. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and to you and to Ranking Member Cole, the members of the committee, I thank you for that opportunity to present H.R. 4502, a package of seven fiscal year 2022 appropriations bills. I, too, want to say a thank you to the staff of the Appropriations Committee on both sides of the aisle and as well to the staff of the uh, uh, Rules Committee for their, uh, really, their on hours and hours and hours that they put into, uh, uh, into these bills. After decades of disinvestment 
and the devastation of the coronavirus pandemic, the time has come to reinvest in the American people. And we have an opportunity to build the architecture for the future, to make vital investments that address inequities and elevate American workers and families. The transformative funding increases in the legislation before us will create good paying American jobs, grow opportunity for the middle class and small businesses, and provide a lifeline for working families and for the vulnerable. Our investments in education, nutrition assistance, rural communities ensure that every American has access to the resources and support they need to lead healthy, happy, and productive lives. By rebuilding our public health and physical infrastructure uh, and confronting the climate crisis, we are creating and sustaining good-paying American jobs and building back better from the pandemic. As chair of the Labor, Health, and Human Services Education and Related Agency Subcommittee, I want to turn to the transformative investments we are making in that bill to lift up struggling families, to support the vulnerable, to help prepare our nation for future challenges. The $253.8 billion we provide in the Labor HHS bill represents a historic increase of 28%. The bill invests in education and high quality child care with $7.4 billion for child care and development block grant, $12.2 billion for Head Start, nearly a $20 billion increase for federal support for high poverty schools, and record funding for students and disabilities, with disabilities. The bill also provides continued support for social and emotional learning and whole child approaches to education to meet the nuanced needs of all students. The bill provides a $400 increase for the maximum Pell Grant, making post-secondary education more affordable, accessible, and achievable for more students. And with $1.13 billion for programs serving historically black colleges and universities, minority-serving institutions, community colleges, and under-resourced institutions of higher education, we are making our education system more equitable. It gives workers the skills they need with $1.6 billion for employment and training administration, including a total of $285 million for registered apprenticeships and $3.1 billion for Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And this bill also provides $100 million for the Strengthening Community Colleges Training Grant Program. And together, these investments will enrich our nation's workforce, create jobs, especially as our young adults move into the workforce. To protect workers' paychecks and benefits and ensure workplace safety, this bill provides $2.1 billion, an increase of $305 million for worker protection agencies. It heeds the lessons of the pandemic by investing in public health and cutting-edge medical research. We provide a record investment for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, including $1 billion for public health infrastructure and capacity, with an increase of $250 million for CDC's global health efforts. We also continue in the, uh, national, to invest in the National Institutes of Health, who made it possible to have a COVID-19 vaccine ready for use in less than a year. The $3.5 billion increase we have included will continue to accelerate life-saving and life-sustaining biomedical research. This bill supports the President's request to establish the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, or ARPA-H, which will be indispensable in achieving breakthroughs in the treatment of diseases such as diabetes, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. To address the mental health crisis that has only been exacerbated by COVID-19, I am proud of the $100 million we were able to provide to help communities create a new mental health crisis response partnership pilot program in response uh, uh, in partnership with our law enforcement agencies. And as the ranking member knows, this comes directly out of suggestions made at one of our hearings where we discussed mental health and law enforcement. And once again, this bill provides $50 million for gun violence prevention research at the NIH and the CDC. This money will save lives and make our communities safer. Finally, I am proud that this bill supports the more than 3 million men, women, and young adults who receive the full range of family planning and reproductive health services funded by Title X through a game-changing increase. And we ensure equal treatment for women, no matter what their zip code is, by finally repealing the discriminatory and harmful Hyde Amendment. 
I have just scratched the surface of the historic and unprecedented investments contained in this funding package. And together, they meet this moment of great challenge for our country and the world. I respectfully request an appropriate rule for floor consideration, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. I now turn to Ranking Member Granger. Thank you, thank you, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole for allowing me to testify on H.R. 4502, a package of seven fiscal year 2022 appropriations bills. I wish the circumstances were different and I were here speaking in favor of this important piece of legislation. Unfortunately, there's not bipartisan support, so I'm here to ask the Rules Committee to allow amendments to H.R. 4502 so it can be improved. I want to begin by acknowledging the tireless efforts of our full committee chair, uh, Ms. DeLauro, and the subcommittee chairs and ranking members who will be testifying today. In addition to having a rigorous hearing schedule, in just 10 days we held 24 markups. It is quite an accomplishment to be sitting before you with all of our bills reported out of committee. But it's disappointing that our work product does not reflect the extraordinary level of effort of members on both sides of the aisle. To put it simply, after months of committee activity, the bills have too many fatal flaws. The problem started at the very beginning. There was no Republican buy-in on the $1.5 trillion spending level requested by the administration that was then pushed through on a party line vote. Republicans on our committee also unanimously opposed the funding allocations for the individual bills. The non-defense spending proposal is too high and the defense spending is too low. Last but certainly not least, these bills represent the most sweeping policy changes I have ever seen. In addition to allowing the House to consider amendments to bring spending in line with what is needed during this time of record deficits and debt, I urge the Rules Committee to allow amendments that address important policy issues. My request on policy issues is in two parts. The first part is very simple. I ask that the Rules Committee allow bills to be amended to reflect the status quo in critical policy areas. It should be no surprise that members on my side of the aisle are most concerned about the reversal of policies that have been in place for years to protect life. I remain adamant that the Hyde Amendment and other long-standing bipartisan provisions like it must be incorporated in all of the appropriation bills this year. In addition, there are numerous other long-standing policy provisions that were stripped from these bills that should be restored. The second part of my request is just as straightforward. The new controversial changes that were added this year should be allowed to be amended on the floor and members on our side should be able to offer competing ideas. Mr. Chairman, I know you have an enormous challenge. The power and responsibility rests with the Rules Committee to decide which of the hundreds of amendments submitted will be made in order and debated on the floor of the House. I hope the members of this committee will take to heart the requests made by members on our side of the aisle and work together with us to improve this product. Protecting the ability of the House to debate important legislative provisions would be a positive step forward in developing appropriations bills that can be signed into law. In closing, I want to remind everyone that we have some significant decisions to make in a short period of time. With the House only planning to be in session and voting for 13 more legislative days before this fiscal year ends, we will soon be faced with the painful reality of a continuing resolution or a governmental shutdown. With that in mind, I'm going to close my comments and yield back so we can get to work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, I now turn to Ranking Member Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I was uh, reflecting, uh, and I'll get to my prepared remarks in a minute, that uh, how many times I've been in front of this committee with my good friend, the chairman of the full committee, because we worked together for six years on this bill. And I always like to point out, for the five years before I became chairman and she was 
the rank, my partner's ranking member, we never got to Labor H bill even out of our own committee. Uh, for six years, we've not only gotten it out of our committee, whether I was chairman or she was chairman, whether we were the majority or the Democrats were the majority, no matter who the president was, we got it across the line. And on all six of those occasions, and to be fair, first four, she never voted for my first bill, nor should she have. Uh, and in her two, I did not vote for her first bill, nor should I have. But we both voted for final passage six consecutive times. So we know something about how to get this bill done. And there are certainly a lot of things in this bill that I support. Uh, I'm very supportive of, of the uh, increases for the NIH, the CDC, uh, for the increases in the strategic stockpile. I think the experience that we've all just gone through tell us how wise those investments are, and we've been making them in this committee steadily for a number of years. I particularly, uh, um, my, my friend, the chairwoman, knows I'm very fond of TRIO and Gear Up, and she's very generous towards TRIO and Gear Up. So I can go through and find a lot of things in here I'm supportive. Uh, but I associate myself with the remarks of our ranking member. You have to look at the whole package. And the whole package, this is an extraordinary growth in the size of government. Department of Education is 40 percent by itself, a 40 percent increase in a single year. So I like TRIO and Gear Up and some of these other programs, but I think that's just simply too much, particularly given, uh, you know, um, uh, the restraint on the defense side of the budget. Uh, so, uh, you know, I look at this, I suppose, Mr. Chairman, the context of the president's initial budget. Uh, it was a $6 trillion budget uh, that was sent to Congress. And the bill today uh, at the Labor H portion really closely mirrors his request. Uh, but proposing the highest spending level since World War II, the price tag alone is just simply unrealistic. And while Congress holds the purse strings and is ultimately responsible for providing the annual funding for the federal government, the president's budget request reels, uh, reveals, frankly, radical priorities and proves, uh, uh, you know, his total disregard for fiscal responsibility. We shouldn't follow him down that path, but in this bill we did. First, instead of focusing on the priorities of all Americans, President Biden's budget request elevates controversial policies over the pressing needs like strengthening our national defense and bolstering the tools to address and manage the crisis at our southern border. In fact, the budget calls for billions of dollars to fund progressive policies like Medicare for All and the Green New Deal and those outlined in uh, the President's so-called American Jobs Plan and American Families Plan while recommending an effective cut in funding for our military. With China and Russia growing their militaries by the day, that's a deeply, deeply uh, misguided uh, decision. Beyond shortchanging our defense and spending big on progressive policies, President Biden expects the American people to foot the bill. His budget proposes a $55 trillion tax increase on American individuals and businesses over the next decade. And I think the passage of this budget would presume uh, that those kinds of taxes uh, would be required to sustain it. Despite promises made on the campaign trail not to raise taxes uh, on those of low and middle income, the president's budget actually would allow existing tax cut to expire and would uh, immediately increase the tax burden on hardworking Americans. As individuals, as families, as small businesses, we simply can't afford that. Finally, and for me, the uh, you know, most importantly, the most egregious part of the president's budget request, which I was very disappointed, as I mentioned earlier, to see reflected in this bill today, is the removal of the Hyde Amendment, which protects life and prevents federal taxpayer-funded abortion. Since it was first enacted in 1976, and again, under a Democratic Congress, uh, it's estimated that this provision has saved more than two million lives while protecting the conscience rise the rights of the great majority of Americans who are opposed to publicly funded, uh, taxpayer-funded abortion. Even when President Biden was serving in the Senate, uh, he then expressed his support for the inclusion of the Hyde Amendment in appropriations bills and showed support for the provision as recently as just two years ago while campaigning for president. Moreover, it's been supported by lawmakers, including, again, every member sitting in this room today, and signed into law by presidents of both parties every year as part of appropriations bills. Mr. Chairman, you know that Democrats in Congress do not have the majorities capable of passing this bill on their own. In the days and weeks ahead, it's my hope that members of both sides of the aisle 
and in both chambers can negotiate spending that is reasonable and will not lead to financial disaster. But the first step toward that negotiation will be the full reinstatement of the Hyde uh, and Weldon amendments, including conscience protection language added 16 years ago that was also removed from this bill, which again protects American doctors, nurses, and other health care professionals from participating in an abortion if they have moral objections. This is a, an essential right of every American, and its removal is a danger to us all. I want to point out that even President Biden's budget did not propose the removal of uh, the Weldon uh, uh, Amendment. Uh, these protections need to be reinstated for this bill to move forward. Quite frankly, everyone in the room knows that the bill will never pass the United States Senate without their inclusion. I think we should anticipate that now so we can cooperate and find common ground in other areas. And a majority of the American people, Mr. Chairman, support that view by a margin of almost 60 percent to 38 percent in the most recent polling. In closing, while this bill does fund many good things, and while I certainly appreciate the openness of the process in which the gentlelady from Connecticut approached the development of her mark, I oppose the bill as drafted. The price tag is too high. The bill contains uh, poison pill policy riders, funding for unauthorized program, and bows to a leftist agenda that is out of step with the values of the American people. I'm hopeful that many of these issues can be corrected during the debate in the House floor and that a rule will be granted which allows full and free debate on all issues of importance to members. But the restoration of the decades-old bipartisan compromise language that protects the lives of unborn American children and the rights of all Americans to freely exercise their conscience must be included or this bill will never see the President's desk. It's just that simple. I'm hopeful that uh, my amendment can be considered at the appropriate time and we can continue to work together, Democrats and Republicans, to craft a compromise bill that's good for the American people. That's my sincere hope. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Bishop. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, uh, uh, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole. Uh, in behalf of the Subcommittee on Agriculture, Rural Development, Food and Drug Administration, and related agencies, I'm proud to present our division of Minibus One uh, and to discuss the important investments that we've made. Uh, our fiscal year 2022 allocation is $26.55 billion, which is $2.85 billion over fiscal year 21. Uh, the bill addresses three key priorities. First, it provides nearly $400 million in investments to ensure equitable participation in USDA programs. Second, the bill provides nearly $350 million to address the impacts of climate change. And third, it fully funds federal pay costs and it rebuilds the leadership offices at USDA that were decimated over the past several years. Our bill fully funds domestic nutrition programs, and I'd like to highlight two vital investments. Uh, the first is $834 million to increase the amount of fruits and vegetables in the WIC food package. And the second ensures that SNAP does not run out of money by providing a, quote, such sums, end quote, appropriations for the fourth quarter of FY22. Our bill also maintains strong investments for our international nutrition programs, including $1.74 billion for Food for Peace grants and $245 million for the McGovern Dole program. The bill continues to make significant investments in our rural communities uh, by providing $4.7 billion in budget authority for rural development programs. Uh, this includes rural water and wastewater infrastructure improvements, support for community facilities, and of course, broadband expansion. The bill once again includes the 10-20-30 anti-poverty provision for rural development programs to ensure that communities most in need are not left behind. The bill provides $3.4 billion for agricultural research, which helps the United States produce the most abundant and affordable food in the world, and it provides more than $2.9 billion in farm and conservation programs. The Food and Drug Administration is funded in our bill at $3.47 
billion dollars in discretionary funding. Uh, within this total, there is an increase of $78 million to address the opioid crisis, rare cancers, and to resume unannounced in-person inspections in the two largest foreign drug manufacturing uh, countries in the world, that's uh, China and India. It also includes a $65 million increase to avoid or more quickly respond to food outbreaks and to address heavy metals in baby food. Finally, the bill funds 111 community project funding requests from members on both sides of the aisle. I'm proud to say that the Agriculture Subcommittee is known for its bipartisanship its cooperation and its collaboration, and this year uh, was no different. I'm happy to say that once again, our bill was reported from full committee by a voice vote. I'm also proud that we continue to have strong bipartisan cooperation uh, on the bill. And while the majority and the minority don't always uh, agree, and we do disagree on matters of policy from time to time, uh, the agriculture, rural development, and the safety of our food and our drugs, and the livability and sustainability of our ecosystems uh, are issues that are of mutual concern uh, for us here in this country and across the globe, and they are bipartisan concerns. Uh, they're neither Democrat nor Republican. Uh, we truly seek to approach our work so as to collaboratively achieve the greater good for our country and for humanity. I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, I want to thank uh, our leadership, uh, both the majority and the a minority of this uh, committee, the Appropriations Committee. I certainly want to uh, thank my ranking member, Mr. Fordenberry, uh, and all of our staff for their hard work in making this uh, uh, product uh, that we're presenting to you today. Uh, with that, uh, I look forward to answering any questions that you may have, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Ranking Member Fortenberry. I said I'm particularly grateful to the chairman and his staff for helping us meet most member requests and produce a reasonable base bill that I hope we can build upon as it moves through this process. Chairman McGovern, production agriculture is the mainstay of the Cornhusker State where I live, but also of America's economy. The vastness of our land, our ingenuity, our technological prowess allow our nation to provide the most abundant, low-cost, nutritious, and diverse array of foods in the world. Our trade imbalance would be so much worse were it not for this remarkable success. And in fact, our farmers and ranchers are so productive that we are empowered to meet America's charitable impulse by moving approximately $2 billion in aid overseas to persons facing food insecurities. Investments in this bill build upon this amazing productivity. I do want to highlight something going on back home in Nebraska. It's what we call the farm of the future. To enhance efficiency, regenerative capacity, and new forms of small-scale niche agriculture that marry high-tech with high-touch and connect the farm to the family, the rural to the urban, and the farmer to the table. The increased investments in this bill advance these promising concepts, including management of farm data by the farmers themselves. Now, we are all aware of the appropriate and growing sensitivity to environmental health. Farmers and ranchers, our nation's first conservationists, have a long history of properly stewarding our natural resources. Uh, while I'm grateful for the bill's investments in better cover crop practices and control of fertilizer runoff, it's important to emphasize that farmers and ranchers are on the front lines of bringing about environmental security. And so finding the practical application to address the emerging science on climate requires investments in 
a new paradigm in which agricultural producers are empowered to make smart market-based decisions both to enhance profitability and a healthy, clean environment. That's what's called the fullness of sustainability. Minimizing out outputs while minimizing inputs while maximizing outputs and increasing production at lower cost, putting more money into farmers' pockets. I'm also pleased this bill continues to support the very successful Farm to School program, including regional coordinators now for this very program, further the connecting the urban to the rural and the farmer to the family. And Mr. Chairman, if I can indulge your attention for a moment, I'd like to introduce a new concept right, right now. I believe our school lunch program should be encouraged to, produce, produce, to purchase nutritious foods from local farmers. Now, let me point out several areas of concern in the bill. Uh, one is which that includes a provision that reverses meat and poultry line speed systems that Secretary Vilsack had earlier championed during the Obama administration. Additionally, the WIP program is a lifeline to ranchers and farmers um, recovering from floods and fires and droughts and hurricanes. I, I do believe it's essential that we replenish funding for this crucial and important and underfunded program, especially with natural disasters increasing in the West. Agriculture has this unique ability, as the chairman pointed out, to unite across political, social, as well as economic divides. And this bill grows the traditional agricultural family with innovative initiatives that add value to commodity groups, augment specialty crops, expand local economies, and tap into the growing trends of how we know our own food. It also expands and strengthens partnerships between minority-serving institutions within our land-grant system. Chairman McGovern, as we all know, during this global pandemic leap, during the global pandemic, we experienced a digital leap. And this bill rightly increases support for rural broadband. Here's one concern, and I think we can all agree on. We still need better metrics to ensure the program helps those who need it in ways that they actually need it. It's more than wires laid. Rural broadband is about telehealth and telework, teleeducation, precision agriculture, e-commerce, and small business. It's about the quality of social, cultural, and economic life, what I call the ecosystem of livability. Now, Importantly, this bill addresses what Chairman Bishop brought up. Over 80% of our active drug ingredients and 40% of finished drugs in the American market are produced outside of the United States, including in China, where the very place of the pandemic originated. I'm happy to see more resources in this bill for unannounced inspections. Now, Chairman McGovern, because of the sincerity and balanced approach of Chairman Bishop, my Preference, of course, is to highlight all of the positive aspects of the bill, but I am obliged to address, address some additional concerns. Uh, Ranking Member, Member Granger laid it out very clearly and rightly that the proposed non-defense increases in this bill and others are too high, with an overall 10% increase over last year in this bill alone. The bill also contains problematically an unauthorized nutrition program provision that grants unlimited funding in the final quarter of the year. And of course, as we all know, this is an issue for the authorizing committee to take up. With all that said, I, I look forward to working with you all to think creatively as to how we solve these problems and get us to a place where we can pass a good bill into law. I yield back, thank you. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Kaptur. Thank you, Chairman McGovern and uh, Ranking Member Cole. And uh, also I'd like to acknowledge the very collaborative and uh, jovial uh, working partnership with Ranking Member Simpson. Uh, and to thank our staff, uh, Jamie Schimmick, Angie uh, Giancarlo, and also um, Matt Kaplan, uh, who will be leaving our staff in just a few days for uh, brighter horizons. We will deeply miss him. Uh, the 2022 Energy and Water Bill takes a significant step forward to secure the imperative of American energy independence, as well as foster world-class scientific innovation. It provides respectable funding to better address the needs of the current moment, and it provides a stronger foundation to build back better to address the increasing challenges created by climate change. And this bill maintains a firm commitment 
to America's nuclear security capabilities and nonproliferation activities. Our subcommittee is dedicated to sustaining and defending uh, life uh, here in our corner of Mother Earth. We are reminded every day how vital our work is to meet the challenges of the desertification of America's West, the increased and record flooding of our heartland, and the battering of our four coasts caused by warming oceans and fresh waters, and the climatic conditions they generate. We must protect and restore our freshwater resources and rebuild infrastructure to sustain life as well as deliver goods to market. Our bill invests over $53 billion to provide strategic resources to address these challenges while creating good paying middle class jobs in communities across this country with a greater commitment to those too often left behind. This legislation takes concrete action to develop and deploy technologies necessary to ensure a cleaner, more equitable, and reliable energy and water future. Let me walk through key investments in the bill quickly. $45.1 billion for the Department of Energy itself, $3.2 billion above enacted. America's about 95% of the way to becoming energy independent, but not in perpetuity. We have a lot of work to do. So within the Department of Energy, the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy receives record funding of $3.7 billion, $83 million above the enacted. ARPA-E receives $600 million, a $173 million above enacted. The Office of Science receives $7.32 billion, $294 million above enacted, and we responsibly fund our nuclear deterrent and increase funding for nonproliferation programs. The Army Corps receives $8.6 billion, a $1.9 billion above the budget request, and I'm still not satisfied with that level, uh, to support our nation's water infrastructure. We provide approximately $2.05 billion for the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund to dredge our nation's ports and harbors. The Bureau of Reclamation receives $1.9 billion, $413 million above the budget request, including $191 million to address the western drought. And our bill increases funding for regional commissions, which promote economic development in distressed counties. In short, this bill sustains and defends life on our corner of Mother Earth by providing critical funding for water infrastructure, clean energy, and a credible nuclear deterrent, all while supporting the creation of good paying jobs in every region of our country. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you all may have. Thank you very much. Ranking Member Simpson. Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole, uh, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to testify today regarding the fiscal year 2022 energy and water appropriation bill. I'd like to thank all of you for the hard work that you do, uh, that you, uh, do to ensure a fair and orderly process. I'm going to be very brief because I understand that you've got another panel after this and then you've got like seven or eight amendments you have to consider. I, so, <laughs> something along those lines. So. And my good chairwoman, uh, Ms. Kaptur, has discussed what's in the bill. Uh, I don't, don't find any need to repeat that. But I'd also like to thank Chairwoman DeLauro and Ranking Member Granger of the full committee and uh, Chairwoman Kaptur. Uh, for their leadership and support of the important programs in this bill. It has been a pleasure to work with uh, all of them, and they have worked in a bipartisan manner to try to address the concerns of both Republicans and Democrats, and I appreciate that. The bill includes funding for programs with bipartisan support, such as the Army Corps of Engineers and the Department of Energy Research and Development programs, although not necessarily in the amounts and proportions that I would prefer. In particular, I am disappointed that the bill does not include funding for the versatile test reactor. I joined Congressman Weber in filing an amendment to draw attention to the importance of establishing this research capability, and I ask that that amendment be made in order. Unfortunately, the energy and water bill being brought to the floor is part of an overall funding framework that does not have the bipartisan support. Like the President's budget request, this framework overfunds many non-defense programs and shortchanges our national security needs, as I think you've heard from every ranking member. For example, the Department of Energy's 
weapons activities program is funded at a level that does not even keep up with inflation. We must uphold our nation's strong nuclear deterrence posture, and to do that, we must adequately fund the activities necessary to maintain a safe, reliable, and effective stockpile. The resources in this appropriation bill don't give us the funds to do what's needed to, to uh, rebuild the infrastructure that is very, very old uh, in our uh, weapons programs. I am hopeful that we can work together to reach an agreement on a bipartisan funding framework that will appropriately address our defense and non-defense priorities that will allow all members to support individual bills like energy and water. I thank you for your time and your attention. I respectfully ask for a rule that provides members with an opportunity to amend and improve the bill to the greatest extent possible. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. I appreciate all the work that all of you have put into this bill, and, um, and I don't have any questions. I, I do want to say, Mr. Fordbury, the, the, you raised the issue about um, uh, your desire that schools be able to purchase food from their local farms. I, I agree with you on that. Um, one of the challenges that we have is that we have, some, we have a lot of schools in this country that don't have kitchens, uh, that don't have refrigeration, that can't, um, can't do that. Uh, and so, you know, as we look forward, we need to be looking at how we up, upgrade school infrastructure. And I'm, 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 I have an amendment that I'll be offering on the floor to provide some funding to help get the Biden administration to do a White House conference on food, nutrition, health, and hunger. And uh, this topic of, uh, of, of nutritious food in schools and how our far local farms could be, uh, play a greater role I think is uh, is ripe for that uh, conference, so I look forward to hopefully working with you and and others on that. But uh, but I appreciate all the work that you have done. Uh, normally I would turn now to Mr. Cole, but I can't. I I, he has no questions <laughs> of himself because he was. So I'll, just, I'll turn to Dr. Burgess. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Cole. Since I'm using your time, let me let me ask you. I mean, you brought up in your excellent testimony how the Hyde Amendment was actually passed. Uh, originally when there was a Democrat control of the House of Representatives. And <clears throat> there have been other times that I recall where there has been an attempt to remove the language of the Hyde Amendment from spending bills, but then it's always been restored. So w what have you learned from those past experiences? Is there a, is there a path forward for us is this something that can be fixed going forward? First, let me, let me flag. This is a little bit different. I mean, while there have been attempts to remove Hyde before, we've never had a bill actually presented without Hyde in it since it was first put in. So the last two bills in Democratic Congress both had Hyde language and Weldon language in there. Now, to be fair to my friends on the other side, they certainly always express their opinion. If I can change this, I will. Uh, and uh, so, I, again, uh, you have the ability to do that here. But I think the mere fact that uh, every single Republican uh, endorses the amendment that I'll present later, uh, and the fact that there, you have to get to 60 in the United States Senate means that it's coming back or we'll end up with a continuing resolution. It's really pretty simple. Uh, and so we're going to have a big fight here. Uh, I think my friends wisely over the last two years avoided that fight, and I think that eased, uh, eased us to the, uh, the end of it. You know, last year was a difficult year. We all talk about it a lot, but on the Appropriations Committee, uh, and I give uh, the chairwoman and the ranking member and their counterparts in the United States Senate credit for every single government agency was funded, and they were funded within the calendar year, and there was never a, a threat of a shutdown. We've had too many of those kinds of threats. So, you, you know, when we recognize one another's red lines and each side has them, uh, then I think uh, we can work together and we can make a lot of progress. And we've made a lot of progress the last time. But this one, I, and again, when this first came up, uh, Mr. Burgess, uh, uh, I think it was in December of last year, we actually had a hearing about the Hyde Amendment and the Labor Age Committee. Uh, and again, that was an appropriate place for us to discuss it. We've made this crystal clear all the way through uh, that there is not going to be a crack on this. There's not going to be a change on this. We are going to hold the line here. And the math suggests that we have the ability to do it. So um, I would just hope, again, we recognize that. Uh, there are a lot of people that this is a, 
an amendment that still, according to all the polling, the overwhelming majority of the American people favor. You know, we're not holding an unpopular position here. We're holding a popular one. Uh, we're not asking anybody to do anything they haven't done before. Most of every member in this room, other than uh, perhaps uh, Ms. Fishbach, uh, you know, if you've been here, you voted for this. Uh, so we're not asking you to do something different. We, you know, this is a democratic decision, in my view, to upset an existing agreement. You're perfectly within your rights to do it, but uh, it will have consequences on the entire appropriations process. Now, do I think we can get there? Yeah, I do. Again, I, I point to uh, the relationship I've been privileged to have with the chairwoman of the full committee, uh, and the fact that we got, this is one of the most contentious bills we have. There's lots of disagreements between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, uh, my friend, Mr. Bishop, my friend, Mr. Fortenberry, work in an area where, as they both said, we have a lot of consensus. That's true with my friend, Mr. Simpson, my friend, Ms. Kaptur, too. That's not as true with the Labor H bill, uh, and it never has been. Nobody's fault, but I'm just, I know we can work together. I know we can get there because we've done it before. But it, again, I don't want to ever do anything other than direct and straightforward with my friends on the other side. This is a deal breaker for us, and uh, we're not apt to change our opinion. So, hope that answers your question. Well, almost. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think. Probably just like you, I, I, I was somewhat surprised that the current president, when he was a candidate, who had voiced support for Hyde in the past, uh, essentially ran on not continuing the Hyde Amendment. And that's a difference, I think, going into this appropriations process, is you have a president who has already voiced hostility to that protection, which we've historically provided in the past. Does that worry you at all? Was it was I surprised? Well, does it worry you that the president has... Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, it concerns you when you see somebody's held an opinion for 40 years, reverse the opinion. And, look, I have high regard for the president of the United States. Uh, uh, and he's a, a gifted uh, legislator. We worked on VAWA together, worked on Cancer Moonshot together when he was vice president of the United States, uh, you know, long experience in this institution. I chalk this up uh, as something he felt like he had to do when he was running for president uh, to, to appease elements in his political base. And again, I'm not, not being critical of the president for that. But I think he also understands the legislative consequences. And I think the legislative consequences are such that, you know, we would end up with CR after CR after CR as opposed to change the budget. And we have plenty of people in our caucus that would like that. Uh, I will tell you as an appropriator, I don't like that. Uh, because I think we need to adjust every single year. And as, as my colleagues up here know, there are thousands of lines in the federal budget that we need to look at every year. Uh, you know, the example I always use, you know, if you need 100 Abrams tanks one year, but you only need 65 the next, why would you still buy 100? Because you're in a CR and you can't start new projects. There's all kinds of problems with this. So appropriators, even when the power shifts, and it certainly shifted in this last election, uh, you know, want to go about their work. But it still has to be bipartisan. There still has to be, uh, you know, areas uh, because again, you just simply can't get there uh, without the active cooperation of, of both parties. Uh, and uh, when we haven't gotten there, and I've seen year-long CRs before, I don't think that's good. And that was under a Republican majority in the House, a Democratic majority in the Senate, Democratic president. Uh, I don't think that was a good place to go. I don't think it was good for the country. I don't think it's good politically. And again, I value the work that my colleagues and I do on this committee. I know it makes a difference. There's a lot of good stuff in these bills. And there's a lot of places where we will agree as opposed to disagree. But this is not one where we can agree, and nor can our side, I think, uh, be expected to yield. And uh, I don't think we're going to. Let me just add that I really appreciate you bringing up the, the Weldon Amendment uh, for people who work in, in hospitals and health care, the prospect of being forced to participate in something in which you, your conscience says you can't is something that this Congress has wisely, I think, always protected. 
and uh, the results of that would be would be truly tragic. We have just come through a year where we said our healthcare providers are our heroes, and we want to do everything we can to lift them up. Now you would see an exodus from the profession, from people saying, I, I simply can't be part of what you're asking me to be part of. And that, again, truly would be tragic. So thank you for underscoring the Weldon Amendment. Uh, if people who have not been here as long as you and I may not remember the, the fights over the Weldon Amendment from several years ago, but it, it is an important, an important mark to have in there for people who shouldn't be asked to do something that violates their own their own core principles. Um, let me just ask a question on the Energy and Water Division. Um, I didn't hear any mention of cybersecurity. Is that all covered under Department of Homeland Security, or are we concerned about cybersecurity in the Energy and Water Division? Well, we definitely are concerned about it. And in terms of the funding that's provided for the Department of Energy, obviously there are incentives for uh, additional cyber protection for the department and its labs. Uh, we acknowledge the work also the Department of Defense uh, does in this arena as well as Homeland Security. So we don't, we've had situations where um, power lines have been attacked and so forth. So the Department of Energy um, uh, Organizations that work with the Department of Energy have had these uh, occurrences, and we are trying to better equip the department uh, to to deal with those. But it is not the only instrumentality within the government of the United States that has major cyber responsibilities. Sure. Well, and I appreciate that, and I understand that. Uh, but with the recent headlines on the the ransomware attacks yes. on various aspects of the energy <clears throat> infrastructure, I mean, it's truly frightening. And the, uh, the ability to do great damage to this country is, has unfortunately been demonstrated. And you know, one of the things that worries you is you know people are paying attention when those things occur. And look what happens when we do this. Um, it just seems like such a, it's going to be such a temptation for people to, to further exploit that. Uh, I appreciate the work the Department of Defense, Defense has done. Uh, I think... There, yeah, but it is it has got to be multifactorial because we are perhaps facing a, a threat unlike anything that we've ever faced in the in the past, and most people aren't really aware of the severity of the problem as it exists out there. And you know, I I know, Congressman, that you've experienced that directly in Texas, uh, with some of the cyber attacks that have uh, occurred there in, in different arenas. Um, I can um, assure you that a lot of the sensitive information that is held remains held and was not penetrated. Um, the figure for the department of the money we're providing the department is 177 million uh, for work in this in the cyber sector, and that's just the Department of Energy. Mr. Simpson, do you, do you feel that that is adequate for for what we're facing? Yeah, that's a $21 million increase over last year, but I will tell you, I agree with you. I think cybersecurity is our biggest threat uh, in this country. You can do more damage with a cyber attack than you can with anything else, and so that's something we have to be aware of. But every department has some cybersecurity money in that they deal with, whether it's the Department of Defense, Homeland Security, or others. I think, personally, we need better coordination between all of these different agencies in the amount of money and how we spend money on cybersecurity, and I'd like to see a bigger... Uh, range of that uh, so that we, so that every department isn't doing their own thing. And I know there's some coordination now, but uh, I think we could do more in that arena. I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, uh, I'll talk to you more about that uh, offline, but I think that is, you're right, that is going to be one of the keys to providing the protection we know this country needs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got a lot of other stuff to say, but uh, I'll hold it for later and I'll yield back. Oh, yeah, thank you. And, I, and before I yield to, to uh, Mr. Torres, I just want to say, I mean, on the, on the Hyde Amendment, um, you know, I mean, there are many of us who believe this is a discriminatory policy, um, uh, and it's been routinely extended um, uh, each year through legislative riders. Um, and um, and I think, look, at the bottom line is, um, however one feels about abortion, I, is that many of us believe that politicians in Washington should not be allowed to deny someone's coverage uh, for it, just because uh, those people are working to try to make ends meet, um, and so that's that is the difference here. 
Um, and um, and so I uh, I just wanted to point that out. Uh, I, did did you want to respond? To this extent, I mean, I I think even while it's existed for forty years. Is your mic on? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It, it's existed for. We have had a discriminatory policy that has existed for forty years or for forty-five years, and it would appear that uh, we have an opportunity to uh, uh, to, to reverse that. Uh, and you know, it denies help to the poor. Uh, in this case, disproportionately denying people of color health services that are available to those who can afford the choice. And I, I think it's worth noting and. Um, because there are strong feelings on both sides on this is um, how do we deny health care coverage because uh, someone is working to make ends meet? Um, uh, who, who are harmed the most by the Hyde Amendment? Uh, and uh, more than half, 58% of the women affected by the Hyde Amendment are women of color. Almost one third, 31% are black. 27% are Latina, and nearly one-fifth, 19% are Asian Americans and Pacific Islander women, as well as indigenous women also covered by Medicaid. Uh, so, I, and the other point, and one quick point I would make, is that with recent polling data um, uh, that we have seen, and this was as recent as uh, mid-July, July 20th, the resounding majorities of voters of all ages and different race and ethnic groups in battleground con congressional district support Medicaid coverage of abortion services. So in fact, it is supported by the country. And just because you've had a discriminatory policy for 40 or 45 years doesn't mean that we shouldn't be about the business of uh, overturning that discriminatory policy. Thank you so much, thank Mr. Thank you, Chairman. Mrs. Torres. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, want to thank you and uh, Chairwoman DeLauro for um, your statements on the Hyde issue. Um, it's, as, as, a, as a woman, as a mother, um, and as a wife, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's incredibly frustrating to um, sit in committee time after time to hear um, and, and listen to um, politicians want to dictate and you know what women could and, and should not do with their bodies um, as if we are property of um, it says missus but that is a choice um, you know it's a choice that I have made by the way for 35 years to the same person um, so thank you for your comments um, you know, the pandemic has laid bare not just uh, the health inequities in our nation, uh, but the numerous economic housing and infrastructure challenges that we need to urgently address. Um, I see these issues um, as, an, uh, as a concern to our national security as well. Um, and this package of bills that we are considering today successfully begin to address many of those inequities. Um, this minibus covers a range of issues critical to the American people, including health care access, the needs of our veterans, affordable housing, transit, and much, much more. It takes critical new investments that will help working families and small businesses make ends meet in my district and around the nation. And as a member of the Appropriations Committee, I am particularly pleased that several of my priorities are included in this package. The Labor HHS section of the bill includes $8 million to help college students succeed by ensuring that they have housing, food, and other assistance so that they can focus on learning our future leaders to focus on their education. This program is modeled on the basic act that I introduced earlier this year. And the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Bill includes $5 million in funding to ensure that the Departments of Transportation and Housing and Urban Development are coordinating 
in the development of the Thriving Communities Program so that affordable housing and transit access go hand in hand. That bill also includes 12 million for a regional infrastructure accelerator, which will help governments plan for coordinated transportation investments, public-private entities working together. Um, this funding will provide our fellow Americans with the resources needed to find good jobs and to focus on their education and help their communities thrive. So I am a proud member of the appropriations uh, who worked so hard on these bills as well. And I just wanna thank the subcommittee chairs that are here today for their uh, leadership and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Reschenthaler. Thank you, Chairman, I appreciate it. And uh, I wanted to note that I was drinking polar water again. <laughs> For those inside, who don't know, polar chair. water, polar seltzer is made in Worcester, Massachusetts. It's, it's the purest water in the world. <laughs> that's, that's right. No PFAS. Well, sorry to, sorry to digress for the members on the panel, but uh, I just wanted to uh, start off by just thanking uh, Chairwoman Delora. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a joy to be on the committee and Ranking Member Granger. Uh, as someone that's new to the committee, I really appreciate uh, all the time uh, you spent and how, how you helped myself and my staff uh, through, the, through the process. And I'd be remiss if I didn't also thank uh, Ranking Member Simpson. I'm on your subcommittee, of course, and, and Chairwoman Kaptur. Uh, truly great to be on that subcommittee as well, so thank you. With that, uh, with that said, I just, uh, Ranking Member Granger, with, since it is my first term on the committee, would you just like to give historical perspective on how this process has been different than, uh, than in the past in terms of bipartisanship? Have you noticed any uh, differences? Uh, would you like to talk about how this has been different in any way? It, it's a tremendous difference, and, and I, I think a very disappointing difference, because when I first came, now I've been there here a long time, 23 years, but came in as a freshman, and you spent most of your time really understanding the bills that were coming and how they were being built and what, what it meant. And, and that, that study and that process was not partisan. You didn't just do it as a Democrat or Republican. You worked together, and particularly when there are issues that were difficult, then you tried to come to a solution that we could all support. And I think it's the biggest loss we've endured uh, as an organization, as a nation, I'm very concerned about it. I think we came out with better decisions, not always in favor of, of what I wanted to write it, just exactly the way I wanted to write it. But instead we said, what's the problem and how can we solve it? Thank you. Thank you, Ranking Member Granger. Uh, Ranking Member Cole, I, I know that you and Dr. Burgess were talking about the Hyde and Weldon uh, provisions. I, you know, I, don't, I don't want to belabor the point, but I know you were saying that there's no way this is actually going to become law with these provisions in it. Would you just like to talk about the prospects of a government shutdown and a long-term CR? Again, I know that there was an interchange between you and Dr. Burgess, but would you like to elaborate on anything in well, addition? I, I certainly hope we don't have a government shutdown. I think, uh, you know, there's always three possible outcomes to the appropriations process. The worst is a government shutdown. The second worst is a CR. The best is a negotiated bipartisan uh, passage of, of legislation. Um, so I think we won't have a shutdown. I don't know anybody that's arguing in favor of a shutdown. I think that would be a terrible tactic. I would tell you uh, some people might argue that, uh, you know, if we didn't get well denied, I, I just don't think that's a good thing to do ever. That's just my personal view. So I would not be in favor of that. But I do think, again, I've been around here and see us, seen us stumble into year long CRs before because each side miscalculated uh, where the other was at. That's why, and again, I respect my friends. Their opinion has changed on this view. Um, again, I, I respect that. Mine hasn't. And, and the fact that, that uh, again, every single Republican in the House is co-sponsoring my amendment, I think, is a pretty good indication of how adamant uh, uh, our opinion is. As a matter of fact, I think the ranking member used the word adamant in her remarks before the full committee, I will be brief but adamant, I think was the exact phrase. Uh, it, uh, and I thought she was. Um, 
And uh, I think that that's going to be true in the Senate, too. Look, we work very closely with our our friends on the other side, probably more than, than any other community. We're interacting all the time. That's one of the reasons why, by the way, I'm hopeful, uh, because uh, Senator Blunt, Senator Murray, have worked very well with Chairwoman DeLora and myself for six years. Uh, this isn't a new, I mean, we've all six been at one in one position or another here. So I, I think we, we know how to get to a deal because we did it six times in a row. But again, part of that is just being frank and honest about what the red lines are on both sides. As a matter of fact, I quite often uh, quote uh, my friend Senator Murray, and it was on another life issue where uh, uh, we, were, we were trying to put something into the bill that then Speaker Ryan wanted very much. And I said, you know, my speakers raised this issue to me repeatedly. I got to bring it up here. And the senator looked across the table, and I'll never forget she looked at me and said, Tom, uh, you can have a deal or you can have a fight, but you can't have both. Uh, and I thought that was pretty wise counsel. I repeated it verbatim to then Speaker Ryan. He said, go get me a deal. Uh, and we did, and we had to step back from something that we believed in very deeply. So again, I respect that that happens in this process, but uh, you know, I'm just trying to be as, as direct and clear in my communication. Uh, again, I hope we don't get a shutdown. I would ne never be for that. I hope we don't get a CR. I think we can do a lot better for the country than that. There again, you know, my my concerns about the overall bill are the same as the, the ranking members. Uh, I think the defense number is too low. I think the domestic number is too high. And I think these important life provisions need to come back in. Uh, but within those boundaries, gosh, do I agree with my friend Chairwoman Delora on the NIH? You bet I do. Uh, do you think I agree on ARPA? Yeah, I think so. We're going to have an interesting discussion on that about how we make sure it doesn't become the 29th Institute, that it really is. You know, do I like higher numbers in TRIO and GIRO? I sure do. So uh, there's a lot of areas of agreement here. Um, and you just don't want to risk those areas uh, by focusing only where you disagree. But uh, again, that's, uh, that's where I'm afraid we're headed, and I hope we don't get there. But there's, there's a lot of time in this process and uh, again, I have a lot of faith in my colleagues on both sides of the aisle um, in both chambers of Congress who are appropriators, because mostly appropriators like to reach an arrangement, uh, and they generally find a way to get there if you'll leave them to their own devices. Thank you, Ranking Member Cole. Uh, Ranking Member Fortenberry, uh, on the, uh, the Ag Subcommittee, to your knowledge, were Republicans consulted on the language granting unlimited spending for SNAP? Uh, given that we give it what falls under this, uh, this bill? Uh, no, that's one of the problematic provisions that is in the bill. We also have uh, an emergency fund that's very substantial, about $9 billion, as I recall, sitting there, just in case we have some emerging need, like we had in the pa pandemic. So um, to simply deem that, basically, with unlimited spending, we think is inappropriate, and obviously would fall to an authorizing committee's jurisdiction. Are there any ramifications beyond that for if you have the unlimited funding for SNAP? Well, it's a peculiarity. I mean, we, we, we need to designate how much funding we're going to give. And if there's an emergency that comes up, we've built in redundancy into the system. If it's beyond that, then we need to address that as a Congress as a whole. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Simpson, I know that you've heard me talk numerous times about, uh, about China and especially uh, critical minerals. In fact, you're probably sick of hearing me say it. Uh, but given the fact that China is the largest polluter, and again, just to put in perspective, China emits more than the United States, all of the EU, and Japan combined, and they're actually increasing their CO2 emissions. We, up until the pandemic, were actually decreasing our CO2 emissions. But given that in mind and their control of critical minerals to the tune of 80% of what we depend on, uh, does this bill adequately address our reliance on China vis-a-vis -vis the critical minerals? No, I don't think anybody, any bill does. I think that's something we've got to address. It's an issue we've got to address in Congress. Both critical minerals and rare earths uh, are a problem. And a lot of them we are 100% dependent on, uh, on countries that don't like us, frankly. Uh, and if you look back what China did to Japan in, I think it was 2015 or something like that, where they were having uh, some disagreements with China and Japan about the South China Sea, they held, China held Japan hostage with their critical, 
critical minerals and actually hurt their industry and stuff. We can't let that happen here. I think we found the same thing out with the pandemic, that we are dependent for a lot of medical uh, uh, supplies and so forth from China that we should not be dependent on. The sad thing is, in this country, we have these, we have these minerals and these critical uh, rare earths here in this country, but most of them are on public lands. Having access to them and being able to mine them is, uh, is what's, ne what's necessary so that we're not so reliant on a foreign country. But when you talk about mining, people, some people think that you still, you know, you're still you taking a fire hose and washing away the side of a mountain. That's not how you, that's not how you mine anymore. Uh, it's become a, a pretty clean uh, industry and stuff. And so we need to, this is a discussion we need to have. And I think Chairwoman Capture and I have talked about having a hearing on this uh, later on this year uh, on the, the access to critical minerals and, uh, and rare earths. Thanks, Dr. Simpson. And uh, in terms of um, nuclear issues, does it, do you think this bill, there's appropriate funding in this bill to deter a nuclear attack on the United States? To deter a nuclear attack on the United States, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a lot more than just this bill that does that. Our whole defense uh, posture does that. Uh, what I am concerned about and what I mentioned in my opening statement is we have to keep a safe and reliable stockpile uh, in, our, in our nuclear weapons stockpile. The Department of Energy has to certify that to the president every year. Unfortunately, uh, the infrastructure is, uh, of, of our nuclear weapons labs has been run down substantially. Some of these facilities are years and years and years old and need to be upgraded and modernized. We started to do that, and then we're kind of slowing down now. And I think we need to invest more in, our, in our, uh, the weapons activities within our budget, not just in nonproliferation, but also in making sure that our stockpile is safe and secure. Thanks, Dr. Simpson. Uh, lastly, uh, Chairwoman Captor, I know that we've talked a lot about the Great Lakes, and I don't represent an area that abuts a Great Lake, but Lake Erie is incredibly important to Western Pennsylvania. Would you like to just talk about anything in this bill that, that helps and aids the Great Lakes uh, in, in our reliance on, on that area? Yes, thank you for bringing up the Great Lakes. Before I answer that question very quickly, I have a couple numbers to give you. Uh, in terms of the critical mineral activities, we provide $152 million across Department of Energy accounts in that arena, and I can guarantee you, because I visited the lab myself in Pennsylvania in the area of fossil uh, energy, uh, looking at uh, materials like coal for rare earths and uh, making a ton of coal uh, produce something other than what it's been doing lately. And uh, so there's a lot of research that goes on on that. Uh, front and we provide for it and then also in terms of nuclear security just to put on record the National Nuclear Security Administration Activities Fund uh, Account is at 15.5 billion and we fund all of our um, Warhead extension programs and we also fully fund the budget request for plutonium pit production so um, I feel very uh, confident uh, confident on that in terms of uh, the Great Lakes, um, as this distinguished committee, as I look across this committee, um, there is not a single member. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Morelli, I believe some of his region drains into Lake Ontario, or, or Lake Erie, excuse me. Yeah, so uh, at least there's one member, but so often I go into meetings here and I look around and I think, hmm, well, this is interesting. Uh, so I have found great lack of knowledge about our general part of the country, so I thank you for bringing it up. I think it's uh, fair to say that the flooding that has recently um, uh, harmed Michigan has not been in the news a great deal. If you talk to Michigan members, they feel excluded from the national news. Uh, the Great Lakes are at an all-time high. We're at a critical point in the Chicago region. Uh, that isn't Lake Erie, uh, however, uh, because of rising water levels in the Great Lakes. Um, I am um, satisfied, but not completely satisfied, with the Army Corps budget at this point for what we're facing across the country, and I'm hoping that it gets plussed up as we move to uh, conference and so forth with the Senate. 
Um, but uh, without question, the, uh, to give you a sense, what I found with most members of Congress, and I'll be very brief, when we talk about the Great Lakes, they think of little puddles. If you emptied Lake Superior, just Lake Superior, it would cover North and South America one foot high. These are seas. These are inland seas, the largest body of fresh water on Earth, and we have many challenges. Um, and um, uh, certainly keeping them pure because of what's happening in agriculture. Uh, with greater rainfall, you have greater runoff. And so we are having these algal blooms, including toxic algal blooms that cut off the water for three days in the city that I was born and live in, city of Toledo, Ohio. It's very serious. And we can't figure out how to work in concert with the land. Uh, we have to remove the, the um, phosphorus and nitrogen. America doesn't know how to do that yet. And so we really have a major threat to our water resources as a land and city planner. I think I'm in the right position for this moment in history, actually. And uh, I'm looking at excess water in certain places in the country and asking myself, in fact, um, the um, uh, Susie Lee from um, uh, Las Vegas has a big interest in uh, land planning and water planning. And I really think we have to look at some maps and really think about moving um, water. Uh, she gave me an interesting figure. She said that the, um, when the Mississippi floods, if we're at 400 million acre uh, feet of water and we go up to 500 million, uh, we have real deep flooding along the Mississippi. But she said to get uh, in the Colorado River, uh, she said, do you know how, much, how many acre feet go in there every year? I said, I don't know that number. She said 12 million. She said, so uh, there's excess water in some places in the country, and if we could somehow figure out a diversion program, so just know that we're looking at that and trying to figure out what is the engineering answer to this question for parts of our country in so much trouble. Um, uh, anyway, thank you for asking me the question, and uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk a little bit about the Great Lakes region. Thank you, Chairwoman. With that, I yield back. Thank you. And I just want to uh, respond to something that Mr. Reschenthal has said because, uh, you know, this is live streamed and there may be three people watching this nationwide, and I don't want them to be confused. But he raised the issue of, of SNAP. I just want to make, the, make it clear for the record. Uh, you know, um, you can't get SNAP unless you qualify for it. And you qualify for the program if you're poor enough uh, to uh, to be able to qualify for it, uh, and um, you know, and during the pandemic, we saw a lot of people lose their jobs. We saw a lot of people fall on hard times, and who needed the benefit? And um, we're, um, and as the economy gets better, fewer and fewer people will need to rely on SNAP. The other phenomenon is that right now, the majority of people who are on SNAP who can work actually work, but they. Their wages are such that they still qualify for the program. So SNAP is a program just uh, is about putting food on the table. Um, so I just I didn't want anybody to get the misimpression that somehow uh, that it's something other than that. Um, uh, I mean, and um, and uh, in any event, um, I now yield to Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thank you. And starting there, I was going to compliment the committee on the SNAP and on the. Uh, different programs to, you know, do our best to eliminate hunger. And uh, you're aware that we've been uh, holding a number of roundtables. Uh, the chair has uh, commenced this in a hopes that we can have uh, some kind of a, a conference with the White House designed to eliminate hunger. And so just appreciate that section of the bill because it's, it's so important to so many Americans. So um, I just want to thank... Uh, uh, Labor HHS uh, for listening to my priorities, especially the one, uh, Chairwoman, you mentioned uh, sort of on the gun violence stuff, but this is a little different tack. You added some money to see what the potential emotional effects and the mental health effects are of the active shooter drills that kids go through at schools. And, you know, is it beneficial? Is it detrimental? You know, I mean, obviously, Colorado, uh, we've had more than our fair share of... Uh, mass shootings, um, and uh, we take this stuff very seriously. But, you know, how, what are the best practices? So I just wanted to thank you for making that part of, uh, of your bill. 
And then um, Chairwoman Captor on the water part of this, it reminded me um, of the old saying in the West, whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. Okay, and obviously the ability to divert water, I mean, that brings up all sorts of issues, but clearly in the West, uh, we've been undergoing a drought now for a very long time. And, and uh, even though the front range of Colorado has been pretty wet this, la this last year, all the smoke from the fires in California, Oregon, Montana, Washington, Idaho, um, just sort of come right down uh, the front range. And so this is something that needs, uh, obviously, a lot of attention. And I did have one amendment uh, that I'm going to bring forward, and that involves the National Renewable Energy Lab, where um, you've, you've plussed up uh, EERE, but you changed a line item on construction uh, for the National Renewable Energy Lab, which is in uh, mm -hmm. my district, and I'm going to try to return it to what the administration had requested. So, but otherwise, I just thank the committees for listening to our office, working with us on pretty much every subject. And then the last thing I'll say is, Congressman Simpson, you mentioned, but this is for the next panel, I guess, or tomorrow, you said something about uh, keeping up on our nuclear stockpiles, where it's not even keeping up with inflation kind of reminded me of our salaries. But I'll leave that for uh, subject for tomorrow. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fishbach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just, a, just first and foremost, I just wanted to say, uh, Chair Captor, it's not, it doesn't border my district. It borders uh, Congressman Stauber's, but I'm very, very aware of Lake Superior and its importance, so. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's very important to the state of Minnesota and the Mississippi River and all that. But, um, but uh, I, I did want to ask uh, Ranking Member Fortenberry about uh, Congressman Reschenthaler mentioned, uh, you know, one of the controversial, and maybe I'll go like this, I don't, um, one of the controversial uh, policy is in, the, in that part of the bill. And I'm just wondering, are there others um, and, uh, that would be considered uh, a concern? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. I uh, attempted in my opening remarks while appropriately committing the chairman to, to highlight some distinctions, and I think they're important, um, one of which obviously is the spending level. Uh, there's a, a reasonable base bill here that um, is very complementary to the, the breadth and depth of agricultural interests and our nation's desire to have a vibrant food and drug administration as well. So. In the critique of certain aspects of that, I never want to lose the spirit of, again, the, the links that we've gone to to try to cooperate in building a good bill around one thing, food. I, I, without this, everything falls apart. And this might be often overlooked, but it's absolutely critical public policy here to provide the stabilization policies for farmers and ranchers, promote environmental health, but also to protect those with food and insecurity. Now, with that said, we can believe, we believe that we can do this appropriately and well with lower spending levels. Um, this is 10%, particularly given, for instance, defense is less than 2%. Um, Ranking Member Granger has pointed that out. Secondly, there is an issue that I'd like to point out, and it's delicate because I want to do everything obviously I can to ensure that any, anyone working, particularly in a meatpacking setting, is safe. Uh, and during the pandemic, for instance, one of the uh, meatpacking entities that had received a line speed waiver um, actually was able to remain open at the height of the pandem pandemic. And you remember where we were starting to have backups because certain slaughter capacity shut down. And that creates food insecurity. You can't hold animals back for very long, as you well know, Representative Fishbach, where you live before you start getting a backup problem and a supply constraint. In other words, higher meat prices or they're not simply there available on the shelf. So this particular plant actually was able to, people turned to it to increase capacity and they had implemented pandemic procedures that kept their workers safe. In other words, they had very limited outbreak situation there. 
So the point being is, if we're smart and we're creative, we can actually assure that plants that are well run with good intention people can actually be highly productive and keep persons who work there safe. The line speed issue was one that actually Secretary Vilsack worked out during the Obama administration. So again, the change here is an area we disagree with. Thank you, Ranking Member. And, and Ranking Member Fortenberry, on that kind, kind of same uh, vein, do you think that there is an opportunity? Are there, is there a place, I mean, to realign that spending to, is there a, because agriculture, the Agriculture Committee is usually the most bipartisan. And so I'm wondering if you feel like there is a place where you could find a common ground and create a bill that could be supported bipartisanly? Uh, absolutely. Um, we've done that year in and year out, and I hope we can get there. Um, it's a little bit hard in this context to start going line by line. I think the chairman wouldn't want me to start doing that either. But at the same time, again, in ordinary increases that keep up with new demands of new public policies, some of which we've mentioned, that are smart and effective government, while letting go of things that are older and stale and no longer applicable. That's just, again, effective legislating. I think we could dramatically get there. Um, I noted as well, if I could editorialize for a moment, that the Agriculture Committee uh, was unanimous in passing a bill on broadband. And the chairman and I have worked very aggressively on this very point to try to fund that area much more substantially as an example of trying to be malleable and creative with public policy to meet an emerging need. I think we always have to do that. Sometimes that means letting go of the other things that are no longer useful. And I appreciate that, that, that and that was passed uh, unanimously. Um, as a matter of fact, the chair forgot to call for the nose because it passed, <laughs> but he did, so it, it was okay. But um, yeah, and so that was a great example of, of the um, bipartisanship that we could have in agriculture. Um, and then just one kind of final question to either the chair or to ranking member. Um, you know, are there any WIP program funds in the bill? Because I know that, you know, this has been critical in addressing and, and you know, Minnesota's facing a drought right now and, and the derechos in Iowa. And just wondering if there was any money in there for that. I believe that there are funds in the bill uh, for WIP. Uh, the WIP is a very, very valuable program. Uh, and I think uh, the authorizing committee, and I'm fortunate to be able to sit on that committee also, uh, is really focusing on the, uh, uh, the WHIP program because of uh, uh, the exigencies that you are now mentioning mm -hmm. with respect to drought. And I hope that we will be able to deal with that uh, uh, in, in short order. Uh, if I could refer back to uh, the question to the ranking member uh, about uh, some of the issues uh, uh, we, we all want to have uh, our food supply chain um, uh, working as it should, but the pandemic uh, really indicated to us that we do have some, some, some problems. And of course, there were waivers that were granted for uh, land speed. Uh, but of course, uh, we also uh, have a very, very serious obligation uh, to preserve the health, safety, and welfare uh, of the people who are on the front lines uh, producing that food uh, so that we can have uh, a nutritious uh, food consistently uh, to fight uh, any food insecurity that we might experience. And so it's a real, a real careful balance. It's a sort of a tug of war. Uh, how do we adequately protect the health, safety, and welfare, but then allow the industries that produce the food uh, to have uh, best practices that allow them to do it uh, more efficiently. Uh, but I think that uh, if we err, we should err on the side of protecting those workers. Uh, and hopefully, uh, we can do both. And that's what we, we try to do. And sometimes we, we may disagree on how far we should go to do that. Uh, but I think uh, we are able to, uh, to address that uh, uh, in a reasonable way. Uh, and take a reasonable approach and, and uh, really try to have the, the greater good at heart when we do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Ranking Member Fortenberry, do you have something to add to that conversation? Oh, just, I, I appreciate the Chairman's remarks. But back to the WIP program, um, it, it, we don't have enough money right now to cover 2020 losses. And so um, I appreciate the Chairman pointing out it's a very important program. Again, back to the general construct of things that we need to plus up because this is so critical to stabilization of the food supply when there is a natural disaster where there is no fault 
of any producer out there. This is one of the things that the government has done to ensure that fundamental aspect of public safety is protected, our food supply. So if we can work on that and work through um, replenishing WIP, I, I, I think it would be very helpful to this bill. Thank you. Thank you both to the chair and to the ranking member. And I yield back, Mr. Th chair. Thank you. And before I yield to Mr. Rask, I just want to ask unanimous consent to ensure on the record a statement of the administration policy in support of H.R. 5502. Mr. Raskin. Chairman, I appreciate the testimony of all these fine legislators and no further questions. I yield back to you. Ms. Scanlon. Thank you. <laughs> I can't find it. Um, I also appreciate the, the hard work that we know has gone into this bill and particularly ap appreciate the opportunity to submit community funding projects um, we had um, 10 of our projects were accepted by the committees. We really appreciate it. It's a number of critical programs for our region, everything from um, opioid treatment opportunities to um, workforce and economic development to mental health resources to supplement law enforcement response to 911 calls. So we really appreciate the efforts of the committee on that behalf, and I yield back. And let's hope we can get bipartisan support in support of those community projects. Uh, Mr. Morelli. Yes, very briefly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I appreciate and want to thank the, uh, the chairs, both of the, the committee, uh, Ms. DeLauro, and the subcommittee chairs and the ranking members. I think, you know, having gone through the, uh, the, the tragedy of the past year and a half, this is a real opportunity to make significant investments moving forward that elevates the lives of all of American families, and I think the committees uh, on both sides uh, worked very hard to do that, and uh, I'm very grateful. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of people yet to speak tonight, so I'll, uh, I'll, keep, uh, I'll end my comments there and yield back, but I want to thank uh, all the individuals for being here. Thank you very much. I think Mr. Desanye, I don't think is, I think WebEx is down, so I don't think we, we, we're not getting him. Uh, Ms. Ross. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, too, am grateful to all of the, our colleagues on the Appropriations Committee for putting together a bold collection of bills to fund our government and help our people. Um, I do want to just speak briefly on two things. One, I'm thrilled as a freshman to not have to vote on the Hyde Amendment, um, and I'm thrilled that it has been removed from the Appropriations Bill as somebody who has been an advocate for all women, no matter their economic status, to be able to make crucial decisions for themselves and their families. I also want to thank the committee for including an amendment that I introduced to the Labor HHS Education Division budget that will highlight challenges faced by pregnant and parenting students. And today, nearly 22% uh, of undergraduate students are parents. Um, but these students face significant barriers in education from difficulty accessing college to insufficient child care and lack of holistic supports. And I've done a lot of work to try to get more help for community college parents to be able to get child care. But as a result, pregnant and parenting students experience disproportionately low graduation rates, as well as a median debt that's nearly two and a half times that of students without children. Pregnant and parenting high school students face additional obstacles too frequently and too frequently find themselves pushed out of school entirely. In order to enable these students to reach their full potential and provide for their families, we need to invest in a variety of facets of our education system, from financial aid to campus child care to inclusive housing. We also need better data on pregnant and parenting students, especially from educational institutions themselves. And so my amendment instructs the Institute of Education Sciences to conduct a study on obstacles to pregnant and parenting students in the pursuit of education and provide uh, recommendations for improving educational outcomes, including graduation rates for these uh, students. I hope this study will inform our efforts to end the school push out and help pregnant and parenting students and their children succeed. Um, so I thank you for in, um, including this amendment in the package that we'll be considering, and I'll yield back. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions of this panel? Seeing none, thank you very, very much. We appreciate it. Uh, you're free to go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah. Um, I'd like to welcome our second panel of witnesses to provide testimony from the following appropriation subcommittees, financial services and general government, um, interior and the environment, military construction and veterans affairs and transportation, housing and urban development, Chairman Quigley, Ranking Member Womack, Chair Pingree, Ranking Member Joyce, Chair Wasserman Schultz, Ranking Member Carter, Chairman Price and Ranking Member diaz Pilart. we are all happy that you are here. Um, and I now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Chairman Quigley, for any opening remarks he may have. WebEx Optical Test, one, two, three. Okay, I don't know who the hell that is, but it's, it's none of you. Okay, all right. <laughs> there we go. Now that I learned how to use the mic. Okay, I just say, I need a little order in the committee as we get all here. What's going on? Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the Rules Committee, I appreciate the is opportunity. Your mic? Is your yeah. mic? Okay, okay, it's good. Okay, good. Really Go on. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on the rule for the fiscal year 2022 Financial Services and General Government Appropriations Bill. The bill you considered today was developed in consultation with Ranking Member Steve Womack. Uh, we may not always agree on everything, but I appreciate his partnership, friendship, and developing the best possible bill during this challenging time. I'd also like to chair the full, thank the chair of the full of the committee, Ms. DeLauro, for her leadership and stewardship of the committee, as well as the committee's distinguished ranking member, Ms. Granger. The bill recommends $29 billion. This is an increase of $4.8 billion over the comparable fiscal year 2021 level. The bill includes $13.6 billion for the IRS, an increase of $1.7 billion above fiscal year 2021, a first step toward restoring the significant cuts the agency has suffered. The increase will improve enforcement activities and support better customer service. <clears throat> Notably, the bill includes $330 million for community development financial institutions, which is $60 million above fiscal year 2021 level to provide critical resources to underserved communities. In addition, the bill provides $324 million for the Small Business Administration's Entrepreneurial Development Program, which is $52 million above the fiscal year 2021 level. The bill includes significant funding for the General Services Administration, including $300 million for a new electric vehicles fund, $100 million for GSA to manage climate change risk, and over $1 billion to modernize and improve the GSA real property portfolio by reducing their climate impact and improving resiliency. The bill includes $300 million for the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Program, an increase of $10 million. A drug-free communities program is funded at $110 million. In lead up to the 250th anniversary of our country in 2026, the bill includes much needed funding for the modernization of the National Archives Building, which houses the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. The bill includes $8.15 billion in discretionary probes for judicial branch, an increase of $432 million to fund protective services and physical security needs in courthouses and ensure the continued operation of the federal judiciary. The bill includes funding for agencies to protect everyday consumers and retail investors, including the Consumer Product Safety Commission, the Federal Trade Commission, and the Securities and Exchange Commission. I'm also proud the bill removes several longstanding policy riders, including many that dictate to the District of Columbia how to manage its own affairs or spend its own money or that harm and limit transparency in political spending. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to highlight an issue that has been a priority election security. The bill before us today includes $500 million for payments to states to help them meet the challenge of ensuring the real security and integrity of American elections. This represents our continued commitment to long-term funding for election security. I look forward to discussing these issues and more today. I thank the Chair and yield back. Thank you very much. Ranking Member Womack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to the Ranking Member, Mr. Cole, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I would like to recognize uh, the uh, great words of Chairman Quigley and the fact that we work well together. What's even more amazing, he's a Cubs fan. I'm a Cardinal fan. And, uh, and so there you go. We both stink this year. And, and <laughs> his words, not mine. We always think we're in it. Um, 
I'm grateful that Chairman Quigley included many priorities for Republican members and addressed several bipartisan provisions, including helping small businesses, combating cybercrime, and supporting anti-drug programs. Unfortunately, uh, as currently drafted, not surprising, the bill's uncontrolled baseline spending is not justified and ignores our unsustainable fiscal trajectory. It also contains several controversial policy changes and riders that I can't support. In light of the unprecedented pandemic spending, I was hoping that in fiscal 22 we'd start making the tough choices necessary to chart a responsible fiscal path forward. Instead, this legislation proposes a 20 percent increase in discretionary spending over fiscal 21, and numerous agencies funded in the bill we're talking about received double-digit percentage increases over last year. We're already seeing the inflation and historically high debt ushered in by the administration's excessive spending. It is important, in my strong opinion, to address the needs of our nation, but I also believe it has to be done in a responsible way. I'm greatly concerned these realities will hinder recovery and burden future generations of Americans. There are also several controversial policy changes included in the bill, such as allowing D.C. tax dollars to fund abortions and removing the prohibition on federal employee health benefits funding for abortions. While I can't support the bill as written, I remain committed to working with my colleagues to secure a bipartisan and bicameral agreement and eliminating controversial policy changes. I ask that the Rules Committee adopt a rule that provides an opportunity for every member of the House to have their input into the bill. I've submitted two amendments that I believe the full House should have the opportunity to debate. The first one would stop the second tranche of the Treasury Department's COVID grants from being paid to state and local governments. Those are due out next year. In March, the majority used reconciliation to enact a partisan bill that provides $350 billion to state and local governments. That's so much money that the funds had to be distributed in two tranches, the first one this year, the second one a year from now. It's been reported a majority of states will come out of this pandemic with revenues above. Let me say that again. A lot of states are going to come out of this pandemic above pre-COVID revenues. Arkansas, as an example, ended its fiscal year at the end of June with an almost $1 billion budget surplus. As I mentioned, this trend is not unique to my district. Surpluses are being seen throughout communities across the nation. It's clear a second round of funding next year is not needed. This is not free money. This is borrowed money. They're not asking for it. We shouldn't provide it. As a mayor, I learned that every tax dollar should be treated as precious. We should not be spending taxpayer dollars simply because we can. My Second Amendment prohibits funds in the bill for the Postal Service to create a pilot program to modernize its current postal banking services. As everyone knows, the Postal Service is in a financial crisis. The Postmaster General testified before our committee that they're projected to lose $160 billion over the next 10 years. While diversifying revenue is a hot phrase in the financial world, this is not the avenue Congress should force the Postal Service to take in their mission to become solvent. The Postal Service has a hard time keeping up with its core mission, day-to-day deliveries. A recent study found that one in five pieces of mail is arriving late. There needs to be a focus on its core mission of delivering reliable, affordable, and universal physical mail, not expanding into areas where the Postal Service doesn't have expertise. The recently released Postal Service 10-year plan for reaching financial stability does not include expanded banking services. We should not force the Postal Service into a new mission against its will. Look forward to your questions following these comments today and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ranking Member Womack. I now recognize the gentlewoman from Maine, Chairwoman Pingree. Thank you, Representative Torres. Um, And to you and Ranking Member Cole, members of the Rules Committee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the FY 2022 Interior Environment and Related Agencies Appropriations Bill. 
I want to thank the chair of the full committee, Ms. DeLauro, and extend my gratitude to her for the outstanding leadership she's provided to our committee. For fiscal year 2022, the subcommittee is recommending a total of $43.4 billion for the Interior Environment and Related Agencies Bill. This is an increase of $7.3 billion over last year's enacted level, a 20% increase. I'm proud that this bill makes long overdue investments to care for our planet, fight the climate emergency, and to meet our trust obligations to tribal nations. The bill prioritizes the protection and preservation of our landscapes and biodiversity. It supports the administration's initiatives on climate change, such as the Civilian Climate Corps, and it affirms the role of science as the foundation for decision making. Climate change is causing more extreme weather events and drought conditions, as well as worsening existing problems like the threat of invasive species. These factors all contribute to an increasing threat of high-intensity wildfires in the West. The Interior Bill provides $5.7 billion for wildfire fire management and invests in programs to help the health of our forests and make them more resilient. The bill also includes major investments to clean up pollution and protect human health and the environment. The bill provides $11.4 billion for the Environmental Protection Agency, the highest funding level in the agency's history. This bill boosts Superfund spending by 27% and will accelerate the pace of cleanup of toxic chemicals from the country's most contaminated sites. It adopts a whole-of-government approach to address environmental justice and invests an unprecedented $248 million in these efforts. Additionally, the bill provides $4 billion for grant programs to make drinking water and sewer system improvements, remove lead from our taps, improve air quality, and strengthen our recycling infrastructure. These grants have profound impacts on public health and the environment, but they are also economic drivers that create good-paying American jobs. Following our work in the CARES and American Recovery Plan Acts, the bill supports the arts and humanities by providing $201 million for both the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. The cultural sector has been particularly devastated by COVID-19, and this funding will help to support relief and recovery for community organizations across the country. Finally, this bill supports Native American families by investing in a strong and resilient Indian country, including through education and healthcare programs. The bill invests $4 billion in Indian affairs programs, including an additional $180 million to address climate change impacts. For Indian health services, the bill provides an additional $1.9 billion towards meeting federal treaty and trust obligations for healthcare. The investments in this bill will improve the lives of Americans. I urge my colleagues to support the bill, and I thank you for allowing me to testify on it today. I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Ranking Member Joyce. Thank you, Acting Chair Torres, uh, uh, Chairman McGovern in absentia, Ranking Member uh, Mr. Cole, and the members of this committee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today discuss the fiscal year 2022 Interior and Environment Appropriations Bill. I'd like to thank the Interior Subcommittee Chair, Congressman Shelley Pingree, <clears throat> for her hard work on the bill. She has been a wonderful colleague, and I commend her for her thoughtful and judicious way. She has handled the business of the subcommittee during her first year as chair. While I would have made some different decisions in crafting the bill, I appreciate Chair Pingree and her staff made a genuine effort to accommodate requests from members on both sides of the aisle and to address many of our national priorities. The Interior Bill before us today provides funding for the important programs that help conserve and protect our nation's natural, cultural, and environmental resources and increase the federal commitment to honor our treaties and trust responsibilities to American Indians and Alaska Natives. I'm particularly grateful that the bill includes strong initiatives to protect the Great Lakes. As many of you know, protecting the Great Lakes is one of my highest priorities, so I was very pleased that the bill includes robust funding for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to build on prior year investments to reduce harmful algal blooms, address coastline uh, erosion, and eradicate invasive species. Unfortunately, despite the bipartisan components and shared priorities within the bill, I cannot support the measure as currently drafted due to policy concerns and massive increase in the proposed level of spending. This bill includes several new controversial policy riders that would curtail U.S. energy independence by limiting conventional energy and natural resource development. And while adding new controversial provisions, the bill simultaneously eliminates several long-standing 
common sense provisions that have enjoyed historical bipartisan support. I am hopeful that as we move forward, Chair Pingree and I will be able to work through these policy dis disagreements with our colleagues. We must also address the spending in this bill before we can reach a final agreement. The interior bill before us today proposes a $7 billion increase in discretionary spending with many agencies receiving double digit percent increases. And it does so without an overarching budget plan. As a result of COVID-19 pandemic, Congress has provided trillions of dollars in economic stimulus and relief to help Americans tackle unique challenges. <clears throat> On the heels of the sun precedent spending, as we continue to restore our way of life and reignite our economy, it is imperative that the federal government makes the tough choices necessary to live within its means. Despite my concerns about the policy riders and unchecked spending levels, I'm committing to working with Chair Pingree, Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Granger, and the rest of our colleagues to resolve these differences as we move through the fiscal 22 process. Finally, I want to thank you, Chair McGovern and the rest of the Rules Committee for considering amendments to the bills from members on both sides of the aisle on the House floor. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to testify before you today. I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize the gentlewoman from Florida, Chairwoman Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to discuss the Military Construction, Veterans Affairs, and Related Agencies Division of HR 4502. Um, I also want to thank Ranking Member Carter, who really is a pleasure to work with and who has become a dear friend. I'm proud of the bill that we put together, together, to meet the needs of our service members, support our military families, and provide for our veterans. This bill highlights our continued commitment to our service members and their families, as well as to our veterans. The allocation of $124.5 billion in discretionary funding is $11.4 billion above the FY21 enacted funding level and $1.3 billion above the FY2022 budget request. Within that total, the bill provides $10.9 billion for military construction, $2.9 billion above the enacted level, and $1.07 billion above the President's budget request. For the Department of Veterans Affairs, the bill in, it provides a total of $113.1 billion in discretionary appropriations, an increase of $8.7 billion above the 2021 enacted level and $176.4 million above the President's budget request. Clearly, we are making a big investment in both VA and military construction this year, and I believe this bill makes smart investments in critical projects and programs that make a real difference in the lives of service members and our veterans, which is our committee's role. One of the things I'm most proud of is that our division contains the vast majority of the requests that we received from members on both sides of the aisle. It reflects bipartisan priorities, and I would hope it would achieve bipartisan support on the floor. I'd like to take this opportunity to mention some of the highlights of the bill. As part of the military construction title, the bill supports needed military projects, as well as invests in energy resilience at our military bases and provides $150 million for PFAS cleanup at contaminated installations. The bill includes $213 million to construct seven new child development centers, which is $193 million more than the request. With 9,000 children of service members on a waiting list for child care, this investment is imperative. To address another important category that is critical to improving the quality of life for our men and women in uniform, $550 million in the bill is dedicated to construction of 12 new barracks. This is $237 million above the amount in the budget request. There is also $1.4 billion for family housing construction in this bill, including $116 million for housing support costs to address issues such as mold, vermin and lead in military family housing, which unfortunately is shocking that I actually have to say that, that, is, that those are problems that we actually have very serious issues with and our subcommittee has been tackling them over the last couple of years. The bill also provides $100 million for climate change and resiliency projects, which is $86 million above the FY21 enacted level and $100 million above the FY22 budget request. This is a critical issue for many installations and we continue to make this a high priority. At the Department of Veterans Affairs, the bill provides the funding needed for our veterans to receive the medical treatment and other benefits that they have earned. The bill includes $97.6 billion for VA medical care, $100 million above the budget request, and providing for approximately 7.1 million patients to be treated in FY22. In particular, I'm proud that it makes significant targeted investments to support gender-specific care for women, homelessness programs, opioid abuse treatment and prevention, whole health, rural health, and $13.2 billion in mental health care services, including $599 million for suicide prevention outreach. The bill also boosts VA investment in medical and prosthetic research 
an area of bipartisan member interest, bringing the total to $902 million. Other areas of interest include robust oversight of the EHRM implementation, responding to the disability claims backlog through increased funding for the Board of Veterans' Appeals and Veterans' Benefits Administration, ensuring access and care for veterans in rural and underserved areas, including telehealth, and improving treatment of conditions that disproportionately affect our veterans. And finally, the bill includes funding for the four related agencies that support our service members and veterans, including funding to complete construction of Arlington National Cemetery's much-needed southern expansion project, which will create 80,000 additional burial spaces. This bill invests in the programs that improve our military readiness and honor the veterans who have given so much through their service to our nation. I look forward to seeing a rule that will enable this important measure to move forward on the floor. And I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Ranking Member Carter. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Torres, and uh, I want to thank uh, Chairman McGovern and, and Ranking Member Cole and the members of this committee for the opportunity to testify on FY22 Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Appropriations Bill. Now, this is a good bill. It supports our troops and their families and the nation's vet veterans, and I wish I could, could support it. Some highlights, including $213 million in the bill, uh, provides for seven new child development centers and $350 million for 12 new barracks projects, some of which were, are very important to my district. We also make progress on important military construction projects such as the ground-based deterrent system and the shipyard infrastructure organization plan. The fully funded funds, uh, the bill fully funds, uh, the bill fully funded veterans health care and includes nearly $600 million to fight the scourge of veteran suicide. It also provides funding to tackle the claims backlog caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and continues the investment in electronic health records. And I'm prayerfully hoping that we will someday conclude that particular project. <laughs> um, while there are things that we could have done differently in Milcon BA Bill, my primary concern is the majority's approach to all the FY22 appropriations bills. We need a framework that appropriately and adequately allocates funding between defense and non-defense programs. We also need to ensure that those who have harmed Americans and the United States remain at Guantanamo Bay. There's no reason to allow those detainees on U.S. soil. In closing, let me Thank my subcommittee chairwoman, Wasserman Schultz. She's a dear friend who's had a really rough year. And I'll tell you, I've said it publicly before, and I'll say it again. Her year proves she's a real trooper, and she's handling very well. And I hope they finally found that last person in that building. Uh, I want to thank their staff. They worked very hard on this bill. And together, they did a very good job. I just hope we can come together sooner rather than later to achieve our common goal of supporting our troops and their families and the, um, our nation's veterans. Thank you for holding this hearing. Forgive my voice. It sounds like the voice of doom. Uh, <laughs> But I'm glad to be here. Now you yield back. We, we are so glad that you are here, too, Mr. Carter. I now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Price, Chairman Price. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Torres, uh, Ranking Member Cole, other members of the Rules Committee. Happy to testify before you today. And I want to start, as I um, always do, by thanking um, my partner, Ranking Member Mario diaz Balart. He's uh, collaborative, he's cooperative, and the fact that we um, are able to work together does make this a better bill, reflecting many bipartisan priorities uh, 
that all, I think all of us should be proud to support. Division G, the uh, T-HUD section, uh, represents a renewed commitment to upgrading our aging transportation infrastructure, addressing our nation's affordable housing and homelessness crises, bolstering our resiliency to natural disasters and a changing climate, remedying inequities and disparities in our housing and transportation system, and prioritizing safety. Whether we're talking about preventing carbon monoxide poisoning in public housing, or improving the way we certify new aircraft. Overall, the bill includes $84.1 billion in discretionary funding. That's an increase of nearly $8.7 billion over fiscal 21 enacted levels. Uh, the bill also includes major increases in contract authority for formula grant programs that draw on the highway trust fund rather than discretionary funding. And in that respect, it, of course, reflects the Invest in America Act that just passed the House. On the housing side of the ledger, we're keeping more than 4.8 billion people stably housed by, by fully renewing all housing choice vouchers and meeting the renewal needs of several other programs. This is coupled with um, critical new investments, including more than 125,000 new tenant-based vouchers for low-income families and people experiencing or at risk of homelessness, and over 4,000 new affordable housing units for seniors and people with disabilities. The bill increases the public housing fund by 11% to preserve nearly 1 million units of affordable housing and to improve the, long, the, the living conditions for the more than 2 million individuals served by this program. The bill also provides significant increases to community development block grants, to the home program, and to neighbor works, all of which help expand affordable housing and spur community revitalization and generate jobs and economic activity. Our bill also does right by transportation. All modes receive robust funding, including highways, transit, rail, aviation, bike and pedestrian projects, and ports. The bill nearly doubles investment in passenger and freight rail, expands port infrastructure programs by almost a third, and emphasizes safety at the FAA. The bill includes the necessary resources to ensure all projects in the Federal Transit Administration capital investment grants pipelines, new starts, small starts, all those can move forward in 2022 and it provides $1.2 billion for the heavily oversubscribed RAISE program, formerly known in various eras as Tiger and Build. <laughs> uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to light our continued need for efficient but equitable, efficient and equitable transportation networks and expanded access to safe and affordable housing to ensure that no one is left behind as we rebuild our economy. We target assistance to areas of persistent poverty in this bill, and we provide $100 million for a new Thriving Communities Initiative, ensuring that regional planning efforts focus on promoting equity and environmental justice and resilience. The bill also invests in resilient, clean, clean and multimodal transportation across the board and, and supports green housing through improved energy and water efficiency. So in closing, uh, uh, colleagues, this, this, bill, this year's T-HUD bill uh, makes forward-looking investments in our housing and transportation infrastructure while uh, boosting safety and protecting vulnerable populations. It will benefit communities across America and lay the foundation for economic growth and recovery. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you might have. Thank you, Chairman Price. I would now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Ranking Member diaz Villard. Thank you, Chair Torres. Uh, I also want to thank Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole for the opportunity to testify on H.R. 4502, particularly on Division G, which is the transportation and housing part of the bill. I would also like to thank Chairman DeLauro and Granger, Ranking Member Granger. We, we obviously have some differences and disagreements uh, in the committee at this stage of the process, but that should not and does not stop us from working together uh, to try to get legislation to the American people. I, I particularly, however, want to thank Chairman Price for his friendship, for his openness, and really more importantly, for his integrity. Uh, the relationship that we have just didn't start this year on this bill. 
but throughout, frankly, our partnership on this bill for now several years. The bill includes funding and language requests from members, members of both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats. Now, my friends, this is no small task, but it reflects the approach of this committee to allow members to bring their best ideas forward to improve the way our government functions, frankly. Uh, I'm very pleased that this bill continues investments in our nation's highway, rail and transit, and airport infrastructure. These programs will build on progress that we have made in recent years throughout this bill, creating jobs and, frankly, spurring innovation. The bill continues to make progress improving port infrastructure, and as the chairman mentioned, and improving our freight uh, networks and safeguarding our supply chains. The chairman has once again made DOT safety programs a priority. Our roads, railways, and skies are safer due to our shared priority uh, on safety. Resources for air traffic control modernization, aviation certification programs, airport infrastructure will continue to support the busiest and yet the safest air traffic control system in the entire planet. Chairman's Price commitment to addressing homelessness and housing for the elderly and disabled is clearly evident in this bill. Chairman Price and I share the goal of promoting affordable housing and providing a safety net for our most vulnerable citizens. Now, while I, I applaud many of the decisions made in this bill, a $9 billion, $9 billion top line increase, 13% above last year, is something that I just can't support. The, 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 my concerns are, are varied, but I'm especially, for example, concerned about the dramatic expansion of, of HUD assistance programs in this bill, in part because these increases would need to be sustained in future years. This expansion of HUD programs would lock in an annual multi-billion dollar liability on this bill for years to come. And again, this would crowd out our ability to make targeted, responsible uh, transportation and housing investments in the future. It would tie our hands. I don't have to tell you all that our national debt exceeds $28 trillion. And it's only going to continue to grow under the majority's approach to spending. So members on my side of the aisle have made it very clear that we cannot support bills that give excessive, excessive increases to non-defense agencies, by the way, especially while shortchanging our national defense. The majority's unwillingness to move towards a bipartisan approach threatens to put our work at a standstill and force us into a series of wasteful, counterproductive, counterproductive short-term continuing resolutions, something that, that all appropriators obviously hate. So again, I cannot vote for this bill in its current form. But I'm absolutely confident, my friends, that we will be able to work together, work through our differences, and reach an agreement in this bill as we move through the process. Also, the bill can be improved with many of the amendments that this committee will be considering in the coming days. So I would urge, respectfully urge you to approve a rule for this bill that supports an open and fair process for members of both sides, on both sides of the aisle. Uh, I end by once again thanking Chairman Price for his commitment to a collaborative approach, his openness and transparency, and yes, even though it may not be cool to say these days, he is a friend, a trusted friend, and for that I am very grateful. I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your work on this. Mr. Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a few questions. Let me start uh, with my good friends, Mr. Quigley and Mr. Warmack. Uh, President Biden established a Safer Federal Workforce Task Force the first day in office. It's my understanding uh, that, you know, it's expected to issue guidance on telework, remote work, a number of other items like that in the wake of the pandemic. Given potentially, I think, really sweeping changes here, I was questioning the timing and wisdom of providing the, the GSA, General Services Administration, with an increase of a billion dollars. Shouldn't we, like, hold that back, wait for these recommendations to come forward, and then see whether or not that increase of that magnitude is appropriate? Well, given the circumstances, we felt we needed to go forward. There's no guarantees that anything suggested or uh, offered to be put in place will actually take place. But we also uh, would like to give the uh, agencies under our control the flexibility they need 
and uh, you know any any means toward doing that. Uh, but we also obviously support the administration's desire to keep our workers safe. So I still think there's enough flexibility there uh, to do both things and uh, to encourage that behavior. Well, to me, it's a cake and eat it too proposition. Um, I don't think there's any question that if you survey uh, the, the biggest companies in our country, even smaller for that matter, uh, the concept that was born primarily out of the coronavirus phenomenon, the work from home uh, concept has, uh, I think, has really matured and become a vital staple in the, uh, uh, you know, in the, it, you know, if you will, in, in the arsenal of our, our corporations. They are taking advantage of the opportunity. In fact, many of the CEOs that I talk to, and I've got several in my district uh, from, from very large, very famous companies that tell me that it has kind of changed their whole outlook on, um, on, on productivity. And in fact, many of them have told me that a lot of their workers that are working from home are more productive. Look, I, I personally think that the federal government agencies should be a reflection of what's going on in, in the private sector. That if, in fact, it's working in the private sector, there's no reason it cannot work in the government sector. So I do not favor right now the notion that we need to plus up the GSA when I think it's highly likely that there's a lot of space that is going to be unused that we're going to be maintaining uh, that, that may, may never be used again for uh, the, the purposes that it was originally intended for. So uh, I, I just, at this stage of the game, I think it's wise for us, if we're really going to be good stewards of the tax dollar, to see how this unfolds uh, in the next year before, there's plenty of time to be able to plus up the GSA if in fact there was a need. But I think we're going to see an entirely different scenario unfold. Well, I, I can tell you from personal experience, traffic patterns from Alexandria to D.C. have changed dramatically and for the better uh, in terms of how easy it is to get in here. Because there's clearly a lot of people that normally are used to coming to work here that I'm sure are doing a good job, but they're, they're not coming in anymore. So. Again, I think uh, we should wait a little bit on that. Let me go next to uh, our friends, uh, Chair Pingree and Mr. Joyce, and let me say for the record, uh, boy, I wish we broke these bills out uh, because I probably would vote for this bill. Uh, there are some terrific things that you guys have done together uh, in this bill on Native American communities from health service to a, a variety of areas, and I want to personally thank you for that. Uh, it's been a longstanding bipartisan commitment on this subcommittee, which I was privileged to serve on with both of you for a number of years, and I just, uh, you, you both continued that, and it's very grateful. I was worried at one time that, that uh, frankly, uh, Mr. Joyce would steal everything for the Great Lakes and leave nothing for the Indian. We've got a one-two one, deal, but he's actually always come through, and certainly my friend Maine, the chairwoman, has as well. I do bring to your attention, because I will offer an amendment on this, and I know this is a matter I offered and withdrew. We have a very unique situation in Oklahoma coming from a Supreme Court decision. I've actually distributed a Washington Post article about it. And, um, and uh, again, I'm, not, I'm wedded the Supreme Court and has not, not by anything the tribes did, although they certainly were in favor of the decision, but uh, uh, we had some really smart criminal defense lawyers that went and made the argument that you never abolish the reservations in Oklahoma. So if an Indian commits a crime on an Indian reservation, the state government has no direct jurisdiction. The feds do, and tribal law enforcement does. Uh, and it did that over an area comprising about 40 percent of the surface of Oklahoma with about 1.8 million people. And so this has really caused a lot of problems. I have legislation that would deal with it, although not everybody supports the legislation that I would offer. The federal government has put in the um, DOJ bill, and I actually wrote a letter in support of this, an additional 70 plus million dollars for extra help for U.S. attorneys, extra help for the FBI, extra help for uh, uh, U.S. Marshals. And they need it because uh, they're picking up a lot of stuff that local law enforcement used to do. But there's precious little in the Biden budget for tribal law enforcement, who actually will handle 
a larger number of the crimes. The major crimes will probably migrate mostly to the feds because tribal courts are limited in the, the, the severity of the penalties that they can, uh, you know, uh, impose. And certainly if you're dealing with a rape or a murder or something like that, you're going to probably go to the feds. But um, so I, I will just tell you the tribes are spending tens of millions of dollars that none of them budgeted for. And this is not their obligation. This is a federal government trust responsibility on Indian land. And the definition of Indian land, according to the Supreme Court of the United States, has changed dramatically. So I don't fault my friends on the committee for not doing it. We're just grappling with it now. So please don't take the amendment I offer or anything as a criticism. You've more than demonstrated your commitment in these areas and your joint work together in the bill. But I am going to I actually talk to the chairwoman of the full committee about this this morning. We're going to continue to try and push because they need some relief from somewhere. Uh, and uh, these tribes, again, are deploying tens of millions of dollars. They did not have the police forces, the court systems, or the incarceration space to handle this. No, you know, they haven't done jurisdiction like this in 100 years. And they've got pretty capable courts. They've got pretty capable uh, law enforcement on their own trust land, but they don't, they don't hold the entire area in trust. They hold their facilities in trust. Uh, but this has now been expanded exponentially, you know, where we're shoving responsibilities. So, again, Congress needs to look at this. We have the power of the purse. Uh, and, again, I'm not even being critical of the Biden administration in the sense that they didn't have much about it in their own budget. They just got there. Uh, and this is a pretty new Supreme Court decision. But waiting till next year is not an option here. Law enforcement happens every day. And they're spending millions of dollars already handling thousands of cases uh, that they weren't supposed to have to handle, or at least nobody envisioned them handle. So, I, again, I'm sorry to go on at length there, but I use every one of these opportunities. There's no reason why any member that's not from Oklahoma would know any of this or should understand any of this. So, uh, again, I don't fault anybody, but I have to take the opportunities I have. And so I will be offering that amendment. But please don't take the amendment to think I have any disagreement with the broad thrust of what you guys did on Native American policy. You did a good job and uh, very grateful for that. So I don't really have a question. I just wanted to make that, that point. Let me turn quickly to my friends, uh, Mr. Price and Mr. Diaz-Ballard. Uh, I was looking at the recommended questions. I am not going to ask you about California high-speed rail. I heard enough about it in our meeting. and. Uh, uh, I do fear another dime going into it, but I thought my friend, the chairman's answer, that nothing in this bill dictates that they can apply for it, uh, was a fair answer. I just think it's such a boneheaded project, but we spent a lot of time talking about it. Uh, but I do want to ask uh, my friend, uh, uh, Mr. Diaz Ballard, uh, you know, this has, you know, what we've plus this bill up 15%. Um, what, what do you see, and, and there's a lot of great things in this bill. Again, it's not a critical question, but it's a problem we have in all these bills. It's kind of nice as appropriators to have all this extra money, but someday, as my friend Mr. Womack pointed out, it is borrowed money. It does come with an interest cost. So um, just give me a general view of that extra money. Are you pleased with uh, where you're targeting it? Would you do it a little bit differently? You know, you had the ability to, to do it. And, and again, you two famously work well together. You even talk nicely about one another behind each other's back. <laughs> if I may, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you. Look, I, I, the, the chairman has done a, and as I mentioned before, and it's, it's funny that you say that, Mr. Cole, that we do speak highly of each other, not only when we're in, 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 in meetings, but we actually... Uh, have a relationship of trust. He's, he's, he's done a phenomenal job. Uh, and he's done so making sure that this is a fair bill. And, but I'll tell you, one of the problems that, that the chairman has, and, and I had when I chaired as well, you're always on pins and needles because you don't know what your future obligations are going to be. Um, and so, uh, for example, this year alone, just, just inflation costs to renew assistance to households uh, uh, was about $2 billion this year. Basically, the chairman had to deal with a $2 billion shortfall before any decision was made. And so, uh, obviously, those are some things that we have to do. You're not going to toss people who have 
um, you know, housing, you're not going to throw them off. Needy families, you're not going to you're not going to kick them off of housing. So when you expand that pool, and by the way, it's obviously meritorious, but when you expand that pool, the problem is the hole that it's going to create that we know it's going to create. This is not a this is not a hypothetical uh, in future years, and so. Um, I've talked at length already about some of the differences and some of the things that, that I agree with the chairman. But again, I think um, two things. First place is that I think we all know that these bills are going to, except for defense, non-defense discretionary, is probably going to go down um, just because uh, if there's going to be a bipartisan deal, um, that's what we know is going to happen. Defense will probably go up. Non-defense will go down. Um, and so now while I, I, I caution some of these decisions that will create, uh, frankly, tire hands in the future. Uh, here's what I am confident of, Mr. Cole, that uh, once there's a bipartisan agreement and once we know what those numbers are going to be, uh, the chairman and I and the subcommittee will be able to get together uh, and make good decisions based on whatever that number is. Um, and I think we all understand the number is going to be less. But I just I, I do not want to sound critical of the decisions that the chairman has made. Would it be different if I was chairman he was ranking member? Yes. Um, but, but I think he would probably tell you that, that uh, those decisions, when I chaired it, were made in a very open process, and I will tell you they have been made in an absolute transparent uh, process by Chairman Price. Well, and I want to thank you both for your excellent work and your excellent working relationship. Some of the things you were able to do in community funding projects, which I thought was very open and fair to all concerned, and uh, uh, you guys were very uh, receptive. Uh, one last point, Mr. Chairman. I don't want my, my friend, the chairwoman of the, the BA subcommittee and my good fellow classmate to think I didn't have questions for him. I just learned a long time ago when I was uh, a member of the chairwoman's uh, committee on ledge affairs and then later when I chaired it, she always knows more about her damn bill than anybody else does. So you really don't want to tangle with her. Uh, and the judge is Texas tough, so I don't want to mess with him either. But I do look at this bill pretty carefully because I have a large veterans population. I think you guys did a really splendid job working together in a lot of areas. And I know there's always changes along the way, but I just think you got the big questions right, and, and we'll make whatever adjustments around the edges it takes to get the deal done. But just uh, thanks, for, thanks for thinking uh, so deeply and profoundly uh, about the men and women that put their life on the line or have put their lives on the line. Uh, for us, and uh, remembering we have an obligation to them. You guys did a nice job in this bill. So thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Torres. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Chairman McGovern. I really don't have any questions. I just want to say thank you to uh, my colleagues, um, you know, for coming to our committee here today. You see I get two or sometimes three votes on uh, on your bill. So um, thank you for accepting, you know, my priorities for my district um, and priorities such as funding um, the IRS. Um, uh, Chairman Quigley, you know, not my favorite uh, agency, but, you know, we all have to pay our taxes and ensuring that um, they are fully funded and have the staff on hand to be able to do that um, so that we can fund uh, things like sidewalks for a little tiny town called Purgatory, by the way. Uh, I'm so happy that Purgatory is getting their sidewalks. Not in my district, not in California, um, but it is a priority. And I'm not saying that to be facetious. I'm just saying sometimes through the member um, priority appropriations, it is the only way that um, a little town like the town of Purgatory can get, you know, the basic um, infrastructure in their community. So with that, I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Chairman McGovern. Um, thanks, panel, for the uh, superlative presentations. Um, I guess the only thing I would add is a rare moment of agreement between myself and uh, Norma Torres. Uh, this is our one opportunity to uh, to talk about some of the federal agencies that, that generally don't get a lot of attention. And, um, <clears throat> Mr. Quigley and, and uh, Mr. Womack, the Federal Trade Commission is under your appropriations guidance, and there have been some things recently that have concerned me a lot about what I'm seeing out of the Federal Trade Commission. Bear in mind, I used to be on the authorized, I used to be chairman of the authorizing subcommittee, 
that had the Federal Trade Commission under our jurisdiction. I held the first oversight hearing in a couple of decades on the Federal Trade Commission. But um, since that time, it's it seems like they are going in a direction that uh, I frankly don't understand. So I will have some amendments to deal with the Federal Trade Commission. Same with Mr. Cole. I'm not uh, suggesting that you all didn't do your work, but it, these are these are issues that I believe need to be pushed to the forefront. Anyway, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Perlmutter. Well, Mr. Chairman, oh. before you, I, I just want to respond to the gentleman. We appreciate your thoughtful uh, comments and amendment. Uh, we were all just wondering how you and the gentleman to your right found the exact same tie store today. <laughs> <laughs> We actually have dress requirements on our side of the aisle. <laughs> Mr. Perlmutter. Oh, that's funny. Um, a couple things. One, uh, Mr. Reschenthal or Mr. Joyce and I serve on uh, the Modernization Committee together, and our goal there is to make sure we update our technology around here, that our personnel and staff have, uh, you know, what they need to do a good job and be willing to stick around to make sure that we all can work together to be effective for our uh, constituents and to make sure our committees work. And I got to just compliment all of you. Um, you all work together a lot. You have your differences of opinion, uh, but you always end up with a product that eventually we all or most of us can support. And I, you know, I think that's kind of what we're hoping we can get across the board in terms of the Congress generally. Now, whether we can or we can't, I think you're, uh, you're all an example of this. And you all like to work together. It makes this job a lot more satisfying and fun. You know, there are differences of opinion. And I just wanted to say that just listening to this. So now... I've got a couple points. Uh, Mr. Womack, I want you to know you have a common bond with Mr. Morelli in the Cardinals. Okay, so if you need somebody to speak up for the Cardinals or you want to go watch a game together, he's the guy. Does he have any eligibility left? <laughs> <laughs> because we need help. We need help. <laughs> um, I do have uh, a couple comments on your amendment on the post office. Um, so we just had a hearing in financial services on this very subject, on post office banking, on public banking through the Federal Reserve, a number of other things. So I, I may agree with you on where you, where you think this should head, but let's not forget that the post office did banking for a long time. From We had a panic back in 1907. One of the responses was to create the Federal Reserve, and the other was to create post office banking that lasted till about 1970. So it may not be the right answer, but I'm not sure I'm going to go as far as you would go to prohibit them from doing it. I think we should keep our options on the table. It may not be the right place to go uh, to help the unbanked and the underbanked, uh, but it is something some people are suggesting. I'll just let you react to that. No, I understand. Uh I, I go back to what I said in my opening, and that is that the Postal Service has a uh, uh, has its share of challenges ahead of it, and uh, and 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 because the current postmaster does not have uh, the banking issues in his shall we say rescue plan, uh, his tenure plan, uh, I, I'm I'm not real sure that Congress uh, allowing that kind of operational activity. Uh, to be experimented with would do nothing more than take away from its core mission. I think it needs to, and, and, and frankly, I think that you can say that about a lot of the federal agencies, where they get in trouble is when they stray from their core mission. And that's how we grow the size of government uh, and, uh, and, and create this uh, enormous cost uh, to the discretionary side of government. So I, I just believe that it's best that they stick with their core mission, fix those problems, and, uh, and let the bankers bank. Mr. Quigley. I was reminded at the turn of the last century, the telegraph company said, we don't want tele telephone patents. We're in the telegraph business. What they didn't know was they're in the communication business. Post office, to a large extent, is uh, in the business of helping people any way they can. And I understand the notion of mission creep here, but let's, re 
let's understand one other thing that's happening that we need to be aware of as well, the number of branch bank closures, particularly in rural areas. Uh, you know, you're, you're hearing people say, where do we go you know, to do basic banking? And if the only institution in, in, in a very large area you know, is the post office at least has to be considered. Okay. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I, I want to thank the Milcon VA uh, for um, adding to uh, a program that I uh, helped uh, sponsor many, many years ago, which is the VA uh, Centers of Excellence in Epilepsy. We saw so many of our servicemen and women returning with different kinds of brain injuries and variety of things, and the VA, when it undertakes a study, uh, can really help uh, the whole nation, whether you're a veteran or not, um, understand it better. So I just wanted to uh, say to you, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, and to the judge, thank you on that one. <laughs> thank you for your dedication, uh, Mr. Perlmutter. This has been an important issue to you for many years, and we've been trying to make sure that we can help enhance that program. And um, you're right, the VA is the largest integrated healthcare system in the country, and so there's a lot of value added that we can provide when we allow them to use, apply their expertise and resources to help not just veterans, but everyone. Uh, and Madam Chair, I, I, I will just add and appreciate uh, Judge Carter's remarks earlier, um, and just in response to um, his comments about the, uh, the final victim of Surfside. The final victim of Surfside was identified today. And so that is now 90, brings it to 98. And uh, so everyone that was accounted for and that was in the building has now been identified. Unfortunately, not surviving. And I appreciate all the members' concern. Um, to Ms. Pingree, Mr. <coughs> Joyce, uh, just thank you for working with me on the United States Geological Survey building that we would like to have uh, built at the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, the earlier panel we were talking about critical minerals and uh, science, and that would house uh, all the scientists and engineers that are in a building where the roof literally is ready to fall in. So it's going to be more expensive than what uh, uh, is provided in, in uh, your appropriations in this particular bill, but at least we can get going. It's got the design feature to it, and, and hopefully if, if other parts of the the infrastructure bill or the like come together, then we can get this whole thing done. But I just appreciated your listening to me on this. Just quickly, I, I really appreciate that there are members who understand the importance of the USGS, and I uh, certainly appreciate our opportunity to have a conversation about it virtually every day. And <laughs> <laughs> we'll look forward to many more in the future. Okay, well, thank you. To, uh, my, I turn my attention now to somebody else who's heard from me pretty much every day. And that's uh, Dr. Price and, and Mr. Diaz Ballart on uh, refunding a security deposit to our transportation district. And I just, I really do want to say thank you to all of you. Uh, you've worked uh, so well with me and, and with my staff. And uh, I just appreciate, uh, David, you listening to, to the concerns that I had. And you've been, you know, you and your staff have been working on this for a couple of years, but it's, it's very helpful if we can get that taken care of. Well, thank you. We we certainly have um, have worked on this for uh, for a long time. I uh, I have to say this is about as good an example as I can imagine of uh, of the the service we get from our staffs around here. I mean the the combination in this case of um, of ingenuity, a, a problem that really has eluded solution. Uh, the, the, the combination of ingenuity and figuring this out and persistence in pursuing it is, is just um, what, what did, the, did the trick. And so I, um, I take my hat off to the staff who have worked with us uh, to, to get this uh, finally resolved. Thank you, and thank your staff for us, please. And with that, I yield back to the chair. Thank you. Mr. Reschenthaler. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to Chairman Quigley for recognizing, I'm not sure exactly how you said it, but I think you were trying to say that Doc Burgess and I both have impeccable senses of style, so thank you. <laughs> I ran out of time. But. <laughs> uh, thanks, Chairman. Uh, Ranking Member Cole, do you mind just taking some time to talk about some of your concerns of the, uh, the pro-life protections that were stripped out of the 
uh, FSGG uh, part of this bill. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I meant Mr. Womack. Excuse me, Mr. Womack. Yeah, Freud, Freudian slip. I looked good asking the question with the time. <laughs> well, uh, so basically, you're talking about. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming the DC health benefits part, uh, which is part of it. And uh, uh, the, as you know, the the uh, uh, the committee has historically appropriated DC funds, uh, and as a result of that, we have had the protections, uh, the hide protections in those. Uh, uh, in those funds as well. So when you drop Hyde and, Wal and, and uh, Walden protections out of the bill, uh, then obviously it's, uh, it's going to affect one of our major uh, uh, beneficiaries of our oversight, and that's uh, the District of Columbia. And then it uh, drops the longstanding language prohibiting use of funds for federal employee health benefits. So those would be the two primary uh, areas where Hyde and Weldon uh, intersect in, in our particular subcommittee. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Womack. I appreciate it. Ranking Member Joyce, I just had a question about uh, energy uh, independence. Do, do you know how funding priorities in this bill would shift our uh, independence and what kind of impact it would have on our energy independence? Uh, thank you for the question, <clears throat> question uh, Congressman Rishenthaler, the man with impeccable taste. Uh, <laughs> The bill includes funding and several new controversial policy riders that would curtail U.S. energy independence by limiting conventional energy and natural resource development. There is increased funding for conventional energy and environmental reviews, and potentially new burdensome permitting requirements. The bill also includes several new controversial policy riders uh, that would, A, uh, limit offshore energy development, to prohibit uh, funding to review or approve a mine plan in the Rainy River watershed uh, in Minnesota, and three, to weaken Congress's direction that energy derived from forest biomass is carbon neutral. As we pursue realistic free market and innovative solutions to climate change that protect the interests of the American people, our community, and our country, economic well-being, we cannot lock America out of the domestic energy and minerals needed for a smooth transition to a cleaner energy future. Our economy continues to depend on an all-of-the-above strategy, and these added provisions would undermine our ability to meet that demand. Thank you, Ranking Member Joyce. Uh, Ranking Member Mario uh, diaz I'm sorry, Ranking Member diaz Bilart. I feel uh, like I, every time I sh I'm talking to you, I should be asking you questions about Cuba. But uh, since we're talking about T-HUD, I'll, I'll just focus on that. Can you speak to the uh, new equity and climate requirements for transportation programs, and specifically how they'll impact state and local agencies? You know, I, I appreciate that, I think, very important question. By the way, I apologize about, about having my back to you, but that way I don't have to look at your really nice tie, and, and so I don't, have to, I, don't, I don't have to get so envious. Uh, on a, on a, this is a serious subject that I appreciate from bringing up. I am concerned that, that the administration will add layers and layers of requirement on state and local grantees in the name of pursuing equity and climate goals. You know, there's a directive, uh, there's directive language in the build, what used to be build and now raise program, for example, that requires that the secretary prioritize, prioritize projects that address equity and climate change. And so again, not only are there potential additional burdens on grantees, um, but I will tell you that I think this is an invitation for armies and armies of consultants to just come forward to show what that means and to, you know, to address these goals. Um, there is also, uh, I think, a, a problem with transparency. You know, how are those decisions going to be made within the administration? Because let's, let's be very clear, and I think we all know that, many of those decisions are clearly subjective. So, again, I just don't think that we should be adding layers of, upon layers of paperwork to grantees. Um, I think, instead, I think we should be working together uh, to actually not increase burden, uh, regulatory burden on grantees and others, but to reduce regulatory burden. I think that's the way forward. Um, particularly when this is an area where, again, is subjective and decisions are made, frankly, uh, unlike how they're made in this committee, um, they're, they're in many times made behind closed doors by faceless, uh, nameless bureaucrats. So again, I, I just think that's, uh, that's, that's uh, opening up a very dangerous can of worms. So I, I appreciate, I think, the very important question. I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member diaz Blart, And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Um, thank you, and I just want to say that not in this committee. We don't do things, you know, 
faceless. Uh, we're all here, except for my face mask. Um, Mr. Uh, Raskin. No questions, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Fishbach. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ranking Member Joyce, I noticed that there's a policy writer regarding mining that uh, has permitting and review in the state of Minnesota. And I was just wondering if this provision was offered by the members whose district affects or in consultation with them, or how, how was that handled? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, question Representative Fishback. This year, the interior bill includes several new controversial policy writers, including, as the one you have noted, uh, the provision prohibiting the funding to review or approve a mine plan in the Rainy River watershed in Minnesota. Limiting mining activities such as the northern Minnesota could uh, impact the ability to develop critical infrastructure and hurt an industrial sector that supports good, high-paying jobs in rural communities. The new policy riders, like the Rainy River uh, provision, were not included on a bipartisan basis, and we were not consulted before they were added. Just like last year, we can reach a final agreement for the FY22 and be signed into law. We'll need to remove these provisions like this that do not have bipartisan support. And so, Ranking Member Joyce, I just want to make sure I understand. There was no consultation with the minority or those members uh, whose district this affected. I can say that there was no uh, consultation with myself and members. Uh, I cannot tell you exactly whether or not the member whose district was affected was... And thank you. I think Congressman Stauber may be here later, so I will ask him. But um, And there's also two policy writers related to livestock emission that have been included in previous years, and um, and but they weren't in this year. And I'm just wondering, did the majority give you any inclination as to why they weren't included this year? Well, the majority dropped the two EPA agriculture provisions that have been enacted in every interior bill since 2010. These important provisions protect livestock producers from unnecessary and burdensome regulations, and given that they've had long-standing bipartisan support, I was surprised the majority did not want them to include the provisions in the base text. Restoring these two provisions and a handful of other bipartisan legacy provisions will be critical as we finish our work in, in FY22. Thank you, Ranking Member Joyce. And I, I have offered two amendments that would uh, insert these long-standing uh, prohibitions back into the bill, and I hope my colleagues will support those with me. And thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. And we look forward to hearing that at the appropriate time. Mr. Morelli. Uh, I just want to uh, express my thanks to the, uh, the chairs of the various uh, subcommittees and the ranking members. Uh, appreciate the dialogue. Appreciate your hard work. And uh, since Mr. Perlmutter has completely outed me, I won't get into the Cubs-Cardinals thing here. So <laughs> thanks. thanks so much. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Desaunier. I have nothing to add, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ms. Ross. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll be very brief. Thank you so much to um, the Appropriations Committee uh, chairs and ranking members for the outstanding work that you've done on these bills. Really a testament to, um, to how to work together and, um, and really work hard for the American people. I do want to just point out one um, area, which is um, renewable energy that's come up a little bit so far. And I think that the bill makes a significant investment in renewable energy and creates tens of thousands of good paying jobs. And this has been very important to my home state of North Carolina. Um, and I want to point out that we lead the East Coast in offshore wind energy generation. And this potential is also not just for creating the energy, but having a manufacturing workforce that stands ready to support offshore wind projects up and down the Atlantic coastline. Um, we, we could achieve eight gigawatts by 2040, and if these goals are achieved, we could power 2.3 million homes um, by 2040. Unfortunately, former President Trump in issued a 10-year moratorium on offshore shore wind that will take effect in 2022. And this moratorium puts our state's ability to develop this resource and capture its economic and environmental 
um, potential at risk. So for that reason, I've offered an amendment to the bill that would prohibit the use of funds to implement the 10-year moratorium on wind leasing while leaving the moratorium on offshore oil and gas leasing in place. The am amendment um, is similar to a bill that I introduced with Congressman Tonko, and it's essential to meet our state and national climate goals. So I urge my colleagues to support this amendment when it comes up and the underlying bill. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Does everybody ask questions? I, I think Mr. Neguse has no questions. Unless, Mr. Neguse, do you have questions? No. <laughs> uh, when, your, when your chairman tells you you have no, no questions, questions, Mr. Chairman, no questions. <laughs> okay, then. Thank you very much. You're all free to go. <laughs> you usually have no questions. <laughs> all right. I want to welcome our next panel, Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas, Mr. Cole, Dr. Burgess, Mr. Good of Virginia, Mr. Grothman. Mr. Smith and Mr. Hinson. Ms. I'm sorry, Ms. Hinson. Ms. Hinson, I'm sorry. All right. Mr. Cole, we'll begin with you since we're, oh, Ms. Jackson, well, you go. Yeah, go ahead. Why don't you go? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have two amendments I'd like to discuss, uh, both of which have been discussed at great length. Uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, just submit my prepared statement for the record, if I may, Without and talk objection. off the cuff about both of them. Uh, oh, excuse, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mr. Cole. The First Amendment, uh, of course, is the amendment to restore the Hyde and Weldon Amendments to the Labor H Bill. And it's important to remember, and I've made this point before, but uh, every single Republican in the chamber is co-sponsoring this. I don't know that I've ever seen an amendment uh, from our side that had that kind of unanimity. Uh, and I've listened very carefully to the discussion, uh, both in the Appropriations Committee, because we had this debate there, and certainly in this committee. And look, I have a great deal of respect for people uh, that, that uh, differ on the issue, you know, because I think they, they obviously feel strongly and passionately about this. Uh, for whatever reason, over the years, my friends on the Democratic side have changed their thinking on this, and this has become, it seems to me, an issue of... Uh, equity uh, and an issue of, of um, choice, you know, from the Republican standpoint, it's an issue of life and an issue of conscience. So obviously we're arguing with a different set of assumptions. And uh, again, I don't say this critically, I mean, clearly the Democratic Party's changed because the Hyde Amendment was passed with overwhelming Democratic majorities in the House and the Senate. So. You've rethought your position of that over a long period of time, and, and uh, that's certainly your right. Uh, our, our side has not changed, and I say this as an appropriator. Uh, look, the last thing in the world I want is to not get an appropriations bill done. Uh, that's, uh, that's what appropriators do. We think it's important to fund the government, uh, but this to us, just as it is to you, is an absolute uh, red line. And... Uh, if we get to the end of this process uh, and uh, that language is not in there, I can just tell you, uh, you know, CR will be the best outcome then. And you could have a shutdown. I would hope not for the reasons I said earlier. I just don't believe in government shutdowns. I think they're always a failure. I think they're always a mistake. But um, there are a lot of th good things in this, these bills. There's a lot of things we agree on. There's certainly some things we don't agree on. I've been around the appropriations process long enough to know those things get worked out over the course of bargaining uh, several months. But on this one, I don't think we're likely to agree. So at some point, you're going to have to make a fundamental choice on this. Uh, I would prefer that the amendments be adopted earlier. Uh, we might lose them on the floor, or, you know. You never know. There are pro-life Democrats. We we didn't. We actually had a bipartisan 
uh, vote supporting uh, the restoration of the Hyde and Weldon Amendment. So uh, everybody can wrestle with their conscience however they feel is appropriate, and I respect that. But as somebody that spends a lot of time looking at appropriations bills and thinking about how to make them become law, not how to stop them, uh, I can assure you if we don't deal with this issue, um, it, it'll never, it may not get out of the House. It certainly won't happen in the United States Senate where it requires 60 votes. So none of these bills will ever get to the president's desk unless we resolve this issue. I think this amendment is the appropriate way. Again, you've changed your minds. We haven't changed ours. We're not asking you to vote any differently than most of you have voted in the past. Um, and uh, you are asking us to do something. I actually went back and checked it. There's only one Republican that has ever voted for a labor H bill that did not have the Hyde Amendment. That's Don Young, and that's because he arrived here two years before the Hyde Amendment became law, three years. So he actually did vote for one. But every other Republican that's voted for labor H bill has always voted for the Hyde Amendment, and frankly, uh, so so have Democrats. Uh, so that, to me, is important. The second issue I want to talk to you about is the McGirt issue. I, t I took uh, my privilege as being the ranking member to educate you a, lot, a little bit about it, and uh, let me talk a little bit more. I would ask, Mr. Chairman, for the record uh, to include uh, the Washington Post article that I distributed earlier. Without objection. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And it gives you some understanding. And, and I preface this um, with the remark that, uh, again, I'm certainly not disappointed with members of the Appropriations Committee. They didn't know very much about this. There's no reason why they should. And I'm not even too critical of the Biden administration, although I will point out in the Department of Justice bill, there's a request by the administration, which I supported. I actually submitted a letter in support of it. Uh, and I think all my other colleagues in the Oklahoma delegation did as well. Uh, where the administration asked for an additional $70 million to deal with extra U.S. attorneys, extra FBI agents, extra um, U.S. marshals, all because of this single decision, McGirt. And again, the decision was, and uh, it wasn't, uh, while the tribe supported it, they did not go to court. These are criminal uh, justice cases that came through the Tenth Circuit, which is the most experienced circuit on Indian issues in the United States, where some really smart criminal defense uh, attorneys went back and did their research and said, you know, Congress never formally dissolved these reservations. And so for the purposes of criminal justice, um, they still exist, which means the state has no jurisdiction over Indians on an Indian reservation. The federal government certainly does. Tribal law enforcement certainly, uh, officials certainly do. Um, We've submitted to the committee and can submit here, and some of this is covered in the testimony, how many millions of extra dollars these five tribes are now spending. They're not spending it next year. This, you know, the, the case took effect immediately, and it's had a domino effect in terms of the appeals being generated and, and what have you. So they are laying out millions of dollars now that weren't in their budget. That's money that comes from social services, health care services, other things. They're deadly serious about protecting not just their citizens, but the non-natives who are now living uh, on these reservations that they didn't realize uh, still in this singular area had this. So there's clearly, if there is a federal trust responsibility to provide for uh, uh, you know, justice and, and law enforcement on Indian reservations. The administration clearly recognizes that by asking for extra money in this very unusual set in the DOJ. They just didn't ask the tribes. Uh, and so that's a pretty common pattern in American history. Uh, and I've actually told some of my friends in tribal governments um, that are arguing that they, they want to be fully funded, I said, I agree with you, and I'll go and make the argument for you. But since the federal government's never appropriately fully funded law enforcement on Indian reservations in 200 years, don't expect them to get it right the very first time uh, up here. Uh, so uh, we also have a legislative remedy, although that's not before us today, and, uh, and there's controversy about that. I wouldn't suggest everybody agrees with what I think is the right approach there. But where there is no disagreement, no matter where you are on the McGirt decision 
or any legislative remedy. Everybody agrees the federal government and the tribal governments need more money for law enforcement, uh, you know, because of something that they did not anticipate a year ago. So with that, I would just uh, urge the adoption of both amendments and be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Thank you, you Mr. Much. Chairman. Thank you very much. Ms. Jackson Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me first of all thank the Rules Committee and thank the Chair and Ranking Member of the Appropriations Committee that did an enormous job. Uh, and as well, I uh, hope that the Rules Committee will continue to support the existence of community projects which have helped those of us who represent impoverished areas which continue to be impoverished. I will speak to a few of the amendments that I have, but I will make the point that all of these amendments have been approved uh, several times by the relevant subcommittees made in order by the Rules Committee and adopted by the full House. And they're offered uh, simply because uh, these issues impact the impoverished persons uh, in uh, my congressional district, but more importantly, really uh, across the nation. Uh, one of them uh, deals with the increase and decrease of about $10 million uh, dealing with the question of diabetes. 34.2 million people or 10.5 percent of the population have diabetes. Obviously, 7.3 million people have diabetes but have not yet been diagnosed. And diabetes impacts all of social, economic, and ethnic backgrounds, particularly African Americans. And I'd appreciate consideration of that. An additional amendment uh, is to support the work of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture by making a modest increase of $2 million in funding to that office for purpose of supporting agricultural research programs at 1890s institutions, which are land-grant colleges, which is their strength. I won't uh, pursue the length of research that land-grant colleges, historically black colleges, have done, but they also are a great asset to this nation by annually enrolling 40 percent of all African-American students in a four-year college. Uh, their prominent research includes, in particular, animal sciences, sustainable agriculture, and much other. And I think uh, an investment further uh, would be uh, helpful to that particular work that I think is extremely important. Amendment number 43 um, deals with the limitation. None of the funds made available by this act are for domestic food programs uh, may be used in contravention of Section 107B of Division A of the Victims of Trafficking uh, and Violence Protection Act. This has been submitted through the Judiciary Committee and was submitted in legislation in that committee for justice for victims of trafficking. But uh, the conciseness of the amendment is uh, that um, it makes clear that providing victims of trafficking access to information about their eligibility to receive SNAP benefits does not constitute the type of SNAP recruitment activities or advertising of SNAP programs prohibited by the bill and by Section 418 of the Agriculture Act of 2014. As I indicated, it is a limitation uh, to be able to emphasize uh, that um, as these individuals are being asked to testify or to uh, give information about what happened, that they need resources. Most of them do not have the resources, and I'd ask colleagues to support that amendment. Final amendments that I will um, just make a brief uh, comment on. Uh, involves, again, impoverished communities. And, and that is under the Transportation, Housing, Urban Development, uh, Section 106, uh, which deals with allowing communities to file civil rights complaints when these large construction come into urban areas and are not concerned about historic preservation. Uh, it is, in essence, a limitation and support of that. Um, another limitation that deals with urban bicycle, motorcycle, uh, and safe <coughs> pedestrian safety programs, which in large states like Texas, uh, we have some of the largest um, uh, loss of life uh, on other mobility aspects other than cars. Uh, we are probably a leader in that. Uh, then finally, the final two uh, deal with the persistent poverty in communities uh, that I represent uh, and making sure that major highways are not constructed without, which threatens homes, businesses, and culturally significant structures without the involvement of those communities. I have evidence that I-45, which is in, uh, goes throughout the state of Texas, is one of the most deadliest highways, and presently major federal funds are being utilized in that project. And lastly, uh, dealing with housing after Hurricane Harvey, we're finding that uh, this is a million dollar increase for fair housing equal opportunity. Uh, that the repairs are still going on from 2017, and the homes are not being rebuilt for multi-generational homes, meaning 
that they are rebuilding the homes and they're giving them one bedroom or two bedroom and saying live with it. Uh, and these homes were not one or two bedrooms, they were much larger and frankly in our community that is discrimination. So we'd ask some emphasis in that area and I appreciate uh, this committee. Uh, and as um, we all know, I just want to say that as you do your work, uh, be reminded of John Lewis, whose uh, passing was just in the last couple of days. And the book says, carry on. So I thank you for your work. Hope thank you very much. Carry on. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Smith. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Cole. Uh, 38 years ago, in 1983, I appeared before this committee to request that my amendment to prohibit taxpayer funding for abortion in the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program be made in order. Democratic members of this committee, Joe Moakley, Tony Hall, and David Bonnier, joined all four Republicans to permit the full House to vote on my amendment. It became law. The Financial Services and General Government Appropriations Bill under consideration today, however, overturns the almost four-decade long law and forces taxpayers to pay for abortion on demand. I respectfully ask that the Rules Committee permit the House to vote on my amendment and other pro-life writers that are being uh, requested today and tomorrow, uh, but to keep this one to continue current law. As you know, according to OPM, taxpayers currently pay approximately 72% of the cost of health care premiums for federal employees and their dependents. Abortion is not health care unless one construes the precious life of an unborn child to be analogous to a tumor to be excised or a disease to be vanquished. Abortion methods include dismembering the child to death, or by killing that baby with poison. Then Senator Joe Biden said, and I quote him, those of us who are opposed to abortion should not be compelled to pay for them, close quote. I agree, and most Americans agree. Over the years, polls have consistently found that Americans do not support taxpayer funding for abortion. The January 2021 Marist poll found that by a margin of 58%, to, uh, who are against it, and 38 who are for it, uh, on taxpayer funding for abortion. And interestingly, a supermajority of 65% of independents oppose taxpayer funding for abortion. I also appeal to my friends on this committee to allow the other amendments, including the Cole Amendment, uh, to preserve the Hyde Amendment and the Weldon Conscience Protection Law. You know, we had during the Obama years, eight years of non-enforcement of conscience protection. And we had so many people. We had press conferences. We had meetings uh, where we brought LPNs, nurses, and others who were being forced, coerced into participating in abortion. One doctor, not doctor, a uh, nurse from New York was forced, compelled to participate in a dismemberment abortion. She did it under pain of losing her job if she didn't. She was protected by federal law. She acquiesced, and she has had nightmares ever since. The Hyde Amendment has saved more than 2.4 million lives. There's a great deal of evidence of that, about 60,000 per year since it was first enacted. So this law, uh, if it's retained, will absolutely save the lives of these precious uh, children. I also have three other amendments I would ask you to consider. One uh, that would provide an additional $3 million to the CDC for Lyme disease. I chair the Lyme Disease Caucus. I've worked very hard over the last 40 years to promote Lyme initiatives. We finally got a big breakthrough uh, with the working group uh, that found that there were about 300,000 new cases every year, uh, and there is much that needs to be done in the area of diagnostics, surveillance, and especially treatment, uh, which is still uh, very, very spotty throughout the country. Also, I'm asking that an amendment to provide $5 million, is more of a sense of the Congress, to the LIMEX Innovation uh, Accelerator. Uh, the Cohen Foundation and Labor HHS have collaborated again on a, an initiative that we're asking Labor HHS uh, to continue on research, diagnostics, and uh, treatments for Lyme. And then finally, uh, a $10 million redirection to, I chair the Autism Caucus. I founded it, I'm joined by my good friend from Pennsylvania, uh, Michael Doyle, uh, in offering this amendment. They have provided $10 million, Autism Speaks Backs, up this, backs this up completely, to expand the Autism Development Disability Monitoring uh, Network, or ADAM. At least nine new sites would be, would be created. Uh, we have a, a, an explosion of cases of young people and others on the spectrum. I have authored four laws, including the Autism Cares Act, uh, which is current law, 
uh, and was signed by the president uh, and, and has been signed by several presidents over the years. Uh, it all came out of casework in my own district. But I say this because this is critical, I think, to really accelerating our work, all of our collective work, uh, to mitigate the, the problems associated with, with autism. I thank you. Thank you. Mr. Good. Thank you, uh, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole, uh, for allowing me to speak before you today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in Division D of the underlying Appropriations Bill, H.R. 4502, there's a provision that prohibits federal funds from being used to implement any limitations on federal employees teleworking or performing union activities on official time in an official federal office space. My amendment before you today would simply strike these provisions Mr. Chairman, it's no secret that Democrats and Republicans have different views on telework, uh, reopening, and returning to normal, along with uh, federal employee unions in general. But despite these differences, I believe that this amendment is a win for all Americans because nobody believes that taxpayers or anyone else should be forced to pay for bad service. Yet paying for bad service is exactly what's being forced on the American taxpayer today. According to a State Department briefing earlier this month, there's a current backlog of over 2 million passport applications, in large part because employees are not coming to work. I suppose or suspect that all of you are hearing from your constituents and your district caseworkers, as I am, about this issue. The current turnaround time for a passport application is up to 18 weeks compared to the previous six to eight week average uh, pre-pandemic. If you need a passport, or sooner than four to five months from now, your only option is to pay an additional $60 for expedited service and then hope it comes in within 12 weeks, which is still roughly double the time that it was pre-COVID. Uh, and that was without having to pay the expedited $60 fee. I hope you can agree that this lack of service on behalf of the American people is inexcusable. But what we're debating today is even worse the House Rules Committee is debating a government funding bill that prevents the ability of federal managers to end telework and prevent the ability of managers to require uh, that union activities be performed outside of federal time and away from the federal office space. Effectively, this bill, as it stands now, requires that taxpayers continue to pay for Washington bureaucrats to phone it in with telework policies and even perform union activities on federal time and in federal office space. Can you imagine a private sector company falling behind by some backlog of two million customer requests and then expanding telework options and union activities on company time and on company property for their employees? Talk about being out of touch, that company would be out of business. It's an insult to our overtaxed constituents that we're even debating making them pay for these special considerations for federal employees. So we've got to stop paying folks not to come to work and stop paying them to conduct union business on the taxpayer's dime in the taxpayer's funded workspace. Uh, if we pass this bill as is and require taxpayers to continue to pay for more telework and for union time for bureaucrats who are two million cases behind in doing their job, we should only call it what it is, which is abuse of the taxpayer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Mr. Grothman. Information. I have eight quick amendments here. I'll try to go through them quickly. Three of them are related to the COVID. Uh, the first one is I toured the border recently, and I really feel as far as addressing the COVID and the migrants coming across, we're not doing anywhere near a good enough job. Um, migrants are turned around and given full treatment if they have a temperature or tested to give full treatment if they have a temperature of at least 99 and a half degrees. Otherwise, they're turned over to the uh, nonprofit organizations, primarily Catholic Social Services, which uh, eventually test them. People who test positive are put in um, uh, hotels, but they aren't secure hotels, and people not surprising since they're trying to get in this country turn around and leave, even if they're COVID positive. They are all offered a vaccine, but uh, at least I've been told by a prominent member of Catholic Social Services, about 10 to 15% are getting it. So you combine those two numbers, and I think 
you've got to say we're not doing a very good job on the southern border. Um, second uh, amendment relating to the COVID, um, I'm asking the funding uh, be increased and decreased by a million dollars for the CDC-wide activities and program support. I want them to look at the role of uh, vitamin D in suppressing severe COVID-19 symptoms. Um, I have dealt with Dr. Meltzer in the University of Chicago. He is not ready to quite go public, but he feels that we could have reduced the number of deaths by about 50% if uh, people had uh, an adequate amount of vitamin D in their system. I am incredibly frustrated that the CDC has not published the uh, benefits of, of vitamin D. And not only would you re could you reduce the fatalities by 50%, but even people who get it, the period of which they are capable of giving it to other people, he believes will reduce as well. So I'd kind of like to force the, the CDC to publicize that a little bit. Um, the other thing with regard to the CDC and COVID, I would like them, can, uh, I'm like one more time, uh, increasing and decreasing the CDC-wide activities and program support by a million dollars to require them to do a study on the benefits of phenofibrate Phenofibrate is a um, drug that is generic, so easily available. Preliminary studies in Israel show that they've had successes in curing uh, the disease for whatever reason, maybe because it is a, uh, skeptics would say, it's because a, it is a um, generic uh, drug that it has not been pushed. But I'd like to see them do a study on that. Um, the Fourth Amendment with regard to labor HHS reduces the increase in higher ed funding by 122 million. Um, the president's budget was, I should have really been much tougher here, but the president's budget was about a 30% increase over last year, which is stunning. Uh, the committee went up another $1.1 billion, or uh, yeah, I'm sorry, another uh, $122 million. So we're just going back to President Biden's request, which I think, given the huge overall spending in this bill, is really the least we can do. Um, other comments? Um, my amendment number 22 is strikes the provision regarding the establishment of a new commission on federal naming and displays. I think um, as far as changing names on things, that can be done by a piece, piecemeal basis on the appropriate committees that are already in charge of that. I think we've had too much anger and uh, dissension already as we have radicals, I would call them radicals, uh, you know, taking down names that have been of historical significance in America for a long period of time. So I'd like to get rid of that commission. Uh, next thing in that area, amendment number 50. Um, I'd like to have the FCC do a study on conducting the change of obscenity and in obscene language and indecent contact being broadcast on the airways. I have constituents back home who are concerned that our culture continues to degrade, and part of that reason is what we see on TV, things that you never would have seen 30 years ago. We pay the FCC to do something about this. They're not doing anything about it, but maybe if they conducted a study, it would force them to be a little more active. Um, uh, next, Amendment 49 with regard to milk on VA. This is another one in which there's just a huge increase in spending over the last year from 14 million up to 100 million. We'd like to go back to last year's in part just because I don't think this is a particularly wise use of funds. And secondly, because given the huge increase in overall spending here, um, taking, a, taking a line in the budget and increasing it sevenfold seems a little bit excessive. And um, finally, Amendment 86, um, prohibiting funds going from the Department of Energy's Office of Economic Impact and Diversity. I think right now we have already too much discussion trying to divide America as to how one policy affects one segment of the population over the other. I mean, it's almost the degree to which you have a feeling that the goal of these committees is to cause division. But there you are. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hinson. 
Um, good evening, Mr. Chair. Thank you for um, allowing me to testify and Ranking Member Cole as well. It's good to be with you. Um, I'm here today to speak in favor of several amendments that I've offered um, to this seven-part um, appropriations minibus bill. Um, these amendments touch various provisions and address various issues, but really focused on a single theme, and that's ensuring um, safety and security, not only for Iowa families, but for American taxpayers as well. Um, after all, it's their money that we're spending, and um, safety and security, I believe, must be our top priority here. Um, so to that end, I've offered three sets of amendments to this package. Um, first, amendments to secure the safety of the unborn and defend life at its most basic level. Um, second, amendments to support border security operations, um, because with the current crisis, all states are border states. And third, amendments um, securing our future by ensuring our children are educated um, in civics education and our communities are taken care of when disaster strikes. Um, so the first two amendments, Hinson number 10 and Smith Hinson number 76 to Division D of um, FSGG budget or uh, appropriations bill. Um, amendment number 10 would uh, reinstate the historically bipartisan DC Hyde Amendment, while amendment number 76 um, that I share with my fellow Congressman Smith here would prevent taxpayer money from paying for elective abortions for federal employees. Um, taxpayers, um, as the Congressman said, overwhelmingly support pro-life protections on their hard-earned tax dollars a recent poll found 60% of Americans would like these protections to stay in place. Um, Iowans shouldn't be forced to pay for elective abortions at all, and to force them to pay for bureaucrats' abortions, and abortions in D.C. is beyond too far. And yet that's what this underlying bill does. Um, since elective abortion is not health care, there is no reason that taxpayers should be required to pay for bureaucrats' elective procedures. Um, taxpayer dollars instead should be used where they can have the greatest impact on stopping harm not causing it. Um, that brings me to the crisis at the southern border, which does continue to endanger those taken advantage of, specifically um, by um, the worst of the worst, the traffickers, um, the, the cartels. Um, Americans are suffering under the weight of um, addiction that's fueled by the cartels, and we're seeing that in communities across this country. And I'm sad to say that I believe the bill before us will um, make that worse. Um, the transfer of over $100 million in border security funds for environmental projects is an insult to hardworking taxpayers, and I believe it jeopardizes the safety and security of American families. At a time when um, our border encounters are at record highs, more than 180,000 in June, that's a, a trend we're seeing go up. Uh, we need to be supporting our efforts by, um, our border security efforts by the men and women of CBP, not defunding them. Um, so my amendments, Hinson number 15, 118, and 119 to Division E, would strike the transfer, allowing CBP to continue to use the funds as intended to keep our country safe at the border. And when it comes to keeping Americans safe as well, we must identify and remove the bad actors, um, abusing the vulnerabilities at the border. That includes the human traffickers, uh, the drug smugglers, and the cartels. Um, and that's why Hinson Amendment Number 88 to Division A is so important. This would strike Section 223 of the underlying bill, the section that prevents HHS and DHS from talking to each other. They they need to be sharing this critical information. Um, and when they're processing, for instance, HHS um, and a migrant child um, unaccompanied, many of whom are being trafficked as they're coming across the border, um, in having those conversations, they may discover um, some troubling information. Um, so we need to make sure that our federal agencies uh, have that ability to talk to each other, share that information, um, to keep people safe, and especially these migrant children who are very vulnerable um, so this amendment would allow the two agencies to really work together and enable DHS to then um, identify and remove um, dangerous traffickers or cartel members who may be taking advantage of these children. So again, this I see as about basic safety and security needs. Um, and then when it comes to American safety, we also must talk a little bit about natural disasters and the impacts on our communities. Um, in August of last year, um, my district in Iowa, Iowa's first district, and several others experienced um, a, a derecho, which is, we called it the land hurricane, basically. Um, Record-setting winds um, and thunderstorms that devastated our homes and businesses and farms. Um, we had uh, sustained winds of over 140 mile an hour wind gusts. Um, so Hinson Amendment Number 63 to Division B would transfer much needed funds from unobligated accounts to replenish the WIP Plus program. Uh, to cover the loss of crops, including from high winds and derechos. Obviously, already does hurricanes and wildfires, but we would like to include derechos in that discussion. Um, an example, I believe, where taxpayer money should be directed to the hardworking, taxpaying farmers and producers that our nation depends on for our fuel supply. 
um, our, our food and fuel supply, um, but who do experience um, disaster beyond their control. Um, I believe they deserve economic security. This helps with that. Um, and then finally, I'd like to speak in support of my bipartisan amendment, Hinson number 31 to Division E, to support civics and American history education efforts through the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, I'd like to thank Congressman Dan Kildee for co-sponsoring this um, and joining on this effort to make sure our young people are educated um, and in championing civics education. Um, unfortunately, a recent study shows a dismal 24% of American eighth grade students are proficient in civics. Um, I have my 10-year-old visiting with me this week. I'm trying to make sure he gets his uh, share of civ civics education by being here. But I think that this amendment is a good way where we can fix this in a bipartisan way. Um, through several projects, the NEH helps our students to gain um, an understanding of and an appreciation, most importantly, for our country um, and the principles on which it was founded. Um, it's crucial the next generation knows that in America, they're capable, they can make a difference on issues that they care about and they're passionate about if they get involved. Um, so again, this bipartisan amendment that we're offering would help to support those uh, very important efforts to ensure that the next generation is ready to lead um, securing a future for all Americans. So thank you, Mr. Chair. For thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If it's permissible, I'll just talk from up here because there's no space at the table. You can talk in the hallway if you want. You go anywhere you want. I know that would be the chair, but so let me, uh, let me first thank my, my friend, Mr. Cole, once again, for uh, bringing us this important amendment on the, uh, on the Hyde and Weldon amendments and certainly want to offer that this has uh, historically been the precedent of, of Congress. Um, my previous uh, life as a as an OBGYN, um, I know the importance of this and that we simply must not allow this to, uh, <clears throat> to be dropped from the appropriations process. Um, it's extremely concerning that the administration and House Democrats are working to remove the Hyde and Weldon amendments, which have long been the subjects of legislative consensus under <clears throat> sabotaging that consensus is going to be a serious misstep, and I urge this committee to utilize its authority to prevent that from happening. Another amendment is to Division D. You heard me speak briefly on the Federal Trade Commission. There is currently a Federal Trade Commission block of a merger, proposed merger, between a company called Illumina and Grail. This amendment would prohibit the Federal Trade Commission from using any funds uh, in this appropriations bill to block Illumina from acquiring Grail. Illumina actually founded Grail in 2015 before becoming a minority shareholder in 2017. Grail has developed a blood test that can screen for more than 50 types of cancer. 45 of these cancer screenings have no other screening test. And again, just in reference to my previous career as a physician, I cannot tell you how the benefit of being able to screen for multiple cancers off of a single blood test. That is truly a gift to, to humankind. Now, Illumina and Grail have filed for Illumina to reacquire Grail, but the Federal Trade Commission moved for a preliminary injunction. The Federal Trade Commission then withdrew its motion in light of a European Commission investigation, thereby procedurally prolonging a decision on the merits, potentially past the time that the deal terms are set to expire. So European antitrust regulators should not be deciding the fate of two American companies and their life-saving advancement. Unfortunately, there is concern that the Chinese are taking advantage of this regulatory delay to advance their own technology. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that we no longer delay this acquisition to save lives and get this test to market so that we can save Americans Look, when I was in practice, Gilda Radner died of ovarian cancer. It was a tragedy. And G 
Gene Wilder um, in his capacity as, as a famous person was able to use his bully, bully pulpit to point out that, you know, there was a test for this and they didn't do it. Well, it turns out there really wasn't a test for ovarian cancer. The test is called CA-125. I did a number of them while I was in practice. The test is notoriously equivocal, uh, notoriously uh, has such a wide span of, of normal that it becomes almost clinically useless. But Grail has developed a test that has significant precision, and Illumina has the mechanics to really advance this. And, you know, you stop and think about any primary care physician or OB-GYN such as I was. I mean, you finish up every day with your, put your head on the pillow and, and just a little prayer that I didn't miss something major today in that flood of patients I saw in the clinic. This is one of those tests that has the ability to be absolutely game-changing. So it may be a little bit unusual in this approach to prohibit funding or prohibit the use of funds that we're providing to the Federal Trade Commission, but I feel so strongly about this issue that uh, is, is the reason that I have brought it to the attention of the Rules Committee today. It only came to my attention within the last week, week and a half, but this is in, it's such a critical such a critical issue that it, I, I, I urge the Rules Committee to, uh, to find a way to make this in order. I have another amendment to Division A, the LIHEAP Forced Labor Amendment. This amendment prohibits the federal energy assistance dollars from paying for energy generated by critical minerals mined in nations who are using forced labor, including China. The Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, which we all refer to as LIHEAP, is an important program that ensures that Americans are protected from extreme heat and cold throughout the year. Unfortunately, current law allows LIHEAP dollars to be used to pay for energy produced using critical minerals, materials, and products produced overseas by forced labor. By prohibiting this practice, my amendment will promote either better practices overseas or more domestic investment, both of which would be welcome. Taxpayer money should never be used to subsidize forced labor practices, whether at home or abroad. Another uh, amendment, um, <clears throat> Representative Bishop has offered amendments to each of the divisions of this megabus to ensure that no federal funds are used to teach or advance critical race theory. Specifically, these amendments would prohibit federal funds from being used to advance or promote the curricula that teaches superiority or inferiority of any race, that the United States is fundamentally a racist country, that the Declaration of Independence or the United States Constitution are fundamentally racist documents, an individual's moral worth is determined by his or her race, an individual by virtue of his or her race is inherently racist or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously, and an individual because of his or her race bears responsibility for the actions committed by other individuals of the same race. America has a rich history of overcoming its obstacles to form a more perfect union. Examining this history improves upon every generation of Americans. If these amendments are adopted, it will ensure that we'll continue to learn from our past, but not punished for the future. Another amendment to Division A, uh, and I want to speak in against the Spanenberger Amendment Number 115. On uh, the Spanenberger Amendment would highlight the ongoing litigation between pharmaceutical manufacturers and HHS regarding HHS advisory opinion requiring manufacturers to sell drugs to 340B covered entities at or below the 340B ceiling price. At the end of last year, the Department of Health and Human Services issued an advisory opinion requiring that drug manufacturers sell drugs to covered entities at or below the 340B ceiling price, regardless of whether contract pharmacies are used to dispense these drugs. Drug manufacturers consequently challenged the advisory opinions, arguing that they had no ob obligation under the 340B to provide drugs to contract pharmacies. This litigation has been ongoing, and like 
expect there will be some activity with, in the very near future. Look, I understand I have a very big 340B hospital, not in my district, but just outside my district, Parkland Hospital, where I did, part, uh, I did my residency, and I understand the concerns that hospitals have surrounding actions taken by manufacturers to limit utilization of contract pharmacies in the 340B program. But in the midst of this litigation, we must not lose sight of the intent and the integrity of the entire 340B program. Given this active litigation, Congress should allow the federal courts to resolve the current issue while taking steps to make meaningful reform. Any solution must address the lack of transparency in the program and the duplicate discounts and diversions in the program. Another amendment to Division A, which uh, was brought by our, our friend Dan Wagner from Missouri, Amendment Number 116, the Born Alive Survivors Protection. This amendment prohibits federal funds to be distributed to an entity which fails to provide proper medical care to infants who survive an abortion. Additionally, it requires health care providers to provide the same care that would otherwise be given to any other infant born alive at the same gestational age. I am consistently shocked that this amendment remains a subject of debate. Um, we are discussing whether the health professionals must provide the same level of care to all babies who are bo born. I urge members to think intently about the meaning of this amendment and provide support. Another amendment from Division A, number 132, the acute flaccid myelitis. In the last uh, appropriations, Labor H appropriations bill, funds were made available for the study and development of therapies for acute flaccid myelitis. Acute flaccid myelitis, uh, also referred to as AFM, is a rare but serious condition that impacts the nervous system, causing muscles and reflexes in the body to weaken. In 2014, there were 120 confirmed cases in 34 states. The numbers spike every other year and have been increasing. I've spoken to a number of doctors who are researchers and treat patients with AFM, including Dr. Ben Greenberg at UT Southwestern in Dallas and Dr. Kevin Messicar at Children's Hospital in Colorado, who have warned me that the pattern of cases spiking every two years is very similar, very reminiscent of what happened with polio. Again, I appreciate that the Appropriations Committee did make uh, funds available in previous appropriations bills. I don't know why it was not included in, in this base bill, but this amendment would provide those funds. Another bill in Division A um, regarding Project ECHO, this amendment would provide $10 million for Project ECHO telehealth mentoring that improves health workforce capacity in underserved areas. Um, in this amendment, I have worked with Dr. Spanaberger that to ensure that $5 million would be provided to fund Project ECHO. The success of Project ECHO can be seen in more than 48 states with over 218 hubs. These sites address various complex conditions and work collectively with over 50,000 primary care providers and healthcare professionals. I've been a Advocate for Project ECHO since sponsoring the Expanding Capacity for Health Outcomes Act in 2016 with Senator Orrin Hatch, which facilitated the integration of Project ECHO into health systems across the country and urge its inclusion in uh, today's consideration. Another um, amendment, which actually is an amendment to each of the divisions in the Appropriations Megabus by uh, Chip Roy, Chip, uh, Representative Roy has introduced an amendment to each division of this bill to transfer any community funding project or earmark to U.S. Customs and Border Protection for border wall construction. There is a crisis along our southern border. We've seen five consecutive months of over 100,000 app apprehensions by Customs and Border Protection of individuals attempting to enter without documentation. In four of those months, the number was above 170,000. The federal government is not upholding its responsibility to secure the nation's border. This fa failure is unduly stressing the border officials and local law enforcement, particularly in Texas. As a result, the Texas governor, Greg Abbott, has authorized a border wall on state property to secure the state of Texas, and Texans should be reimbursed for this cost. 
the administration must close the gaps in the existing border wall infrastructure to significantly <coughs> limit illegal crossings. Redirecting earmark funding will benefit, better benefit all Americans and increase the safety and security of our communities. And I urge support for this amendment. Another amendment. Dr. Dr. Burgess, can I, how, how much longer? I, these, these guys may need a bathroom break. I'm just, how many more? Two pages. All right. Uh, another single, amendment. Single space. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's well, nine point font. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't read anything. I can't read anything smaller. So this amendment uh, to Division A, which would require the National Institute of Health to provide records of grants requested by the Energy and Commerce Committee regarding the EcoHealth Alliance. Earlier this year in March, members of the Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations sent a letter to the National Institute of Health asking for answers about grant dollars provided to EcoHealth Alliance and their work with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Mounting evidence suggests that COVID-19 originated from a leak at the Wuhan lab. Previous administrations have made good faith efforts to provide access to information when requested by congressional committees, which begs the question, why is the administration operating, operating in such an untransparent or non-transparent manner? The NIH has an obligation to the U.S. taxpayer to be open, honest, and transparent about the origins of this virus, and this starts with being transparent about the grants to EcoHealth Alliance, and I urge that amendment be made in order. Um, another amendment to Division C, that would designate $50 million to fully fund Section 7002 of the Energy Policy Act of 2020, which promotes America's domestic mineral security. Critical minerals are an important part of modern life. They are used in mobile devices, health products, and energy production. Most critical minerals are imported from foreign competitors. Our country is blessed with abundant resources, and we should seek to utilize those as much as possible. Unfortunately, America has no domestic critical minerals processing industry due to its higher environmental impact. By ensuring this provision of the Energy Policy Act is fully funded, Congress can promote a more secure domestic critical mineral supply chain, which would promote better energy security. I urge this amendment be made in order. And I yield to the chairman for the... And I know what the witnesses are thinking. Why doesn't the Rules Committee have a five-minute rule? But, um, but in any event, we are a committee where we... I was under five minutes on each of these. Uh, you were on, on each of them. That's, that's, that's correct. Um, let, me, let me just let me thank all of you for your, your testimony. Um, we had talked earlier about the Hyde Amendment um, earlier in the, uh, in the uh, discussion here today. Um, and people have different opinions on that. I, I certainly do. Um, you know, I, I believe um, uh, no matter how anyone feels about abortion, I don't think we should deny health coverage uh, just because someone is working to try to make ends meet. Um, you know, more than half of the women affected by the Hyde Amendment are women of color. Nearly one-third are black, 27 percent are Latina, and one-fifth are Asian American and Pacific Islanders, as well as indigenous women also covered by Medicaid. Uh, and I think that's what inequality looks like. Um, and this is a personal decision. All of us don't know all the circumstances, uh, but I do know this, uh, and that is that we should not defer to the politicians and special interest groups who want to impose their values on others. I think we should trust women and their families to make their own decisions about what's best for them. I think it's about justice. I think it's about freedom. It's about respecting women's personal autonomy. Um, and having said all of that, um, uh, as my colleagues know, um, there is a long-standing practice at the Rules Committee um, under both Republicans and Democrats uh, to not provide waivers for legislating on an appropriations bill. Uh, and, uh, you know, speaking for myself, I certainly am not going to vote to, uh, uh, to obliterate that pre precedent um, uh, to deny women their constitutional right to reproductive health care. Uh, and, um, and so um, uh, I appreciate, you know, I'm sure there'll be Lots of discussion on the floor on this matter, but that is one of the uh, one of the hurdles uh, that uh, these amendments face in this committee. They are legislating on appropriations bills, um, and we do not make exceptions to that here uh, with freestanding amendments. Uh, so, having said all that, um, I, um, I, uh, Dr. Burgess, I, unless you want to ask yourself some questions, uh, I'll go to Mr. Reschenthaler. 
uh, for any questions he may have. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Ms. Torres. Ms. Fishbach. Mr. Chair, I did have some questions. Just first of all, I wanted to thank Ranking Member Cole and Congressman Smith for their hard work on getting the Hyde Amendment put back together. And um, but I will um, reserve myself and not uh, not ask any more questions. And I chair, yield back. Mr. Thank you, Ms. Scanlon. Mr. Morelli. Just to, to note that in New York, uh, we have uh, long provided uh, <coughs> support for women for reproductive services, something uh, that I uh, helped lead in the state legislature and that I'm proud of, and I look forward to uh, hopefully making that the law of the land across the country. I'll yield back. Mr. Desarnier. Nothing to add, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Ms. Uh, Ms. Ross and Mr. Goose. No other questions? This panel is dismissed. Thank you very much. All right, everyone, I would like to welcome our next panel to testify on amendments, Mr. Stauber, uh, Mr. Valadeo, Chairwoman Waters, Mr. Clyde, Mr. Caston, Mr. Carter, and Mr. Kelter. Welcome. We are delighted uh, that you are here. Anything you brought in writing, um, you can submit to rules documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing um, will, without objection, be entered into the record. And I will now recognize Mr. Schauber. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Cole, for the opportunity to testify on two of my amendments. The first, uh, number 76 to the Interior Spending Bill, is fam it's familiar to the Rules and Appropriations Committee. It strikes Section 435, which arbitrarily bans mining in my district. As the sole representative of this area and the Iron Range, I stand with my constituents in opposition to these anti-science arbitrary mining bans. For background, my district has supplied the iron that has built and sustained America. 80% of this country's steel originated as taconite, which was mined by my constituents. Occurring alongside this taconite is the Duluth complex, which contains 95% of America's nickel, 88% of our cobalt, and more than one third of its copper, along with rare earths, platinum, and other minerals, all in my district. Section 435 withholds funding for any mine plan or possible expansion of mining in the Rainy River watershed and the Superior National Forest. The provisions author will tell you it only targets one proposed mine, but let me tell you why that's one misguided and two untrue. First, it's misguided because this project occurs outside the Boundary Waters Canoe area and the mining protection area surrounding the BWCA as established in the 1978 Act. <clears throat> Let me say it again, there is no proposed mining in the Boundary Waters Canoe area or in the already existing buffer zone, despite the rhetoric you hear from the opposition. This ban is misguided because the proposed project will help supply our country's desperate need for critical minerals in the upcoming expansion of renewable energy and electric vehicles. After a mine in Michigan closes in 2024, there will be no more nickel mines in America. My district holds 95% of the country's nickel, and this provision bans even considering it. And Mr. Chair, on top of that, or Madam Chair, on top of that, the proposed mine target has already signed a project labor agreement with the Iron Range Building and Trades, who are supportive of my amendment. And second, the assertions that Section 435 only targets one proposed mine is untrue. 
there are three existing iron ore projects in a rock quarry that lie in or near the Rainy River watershed and Superior National Forest. Should Section 435 become law, these operations, which are necessary for this country's infrastructure, would not be able to consider mine expansions. Therefore, <clears throat> Madam Chair and Ranking Member Cole, I stand before you once again ask, asking simply for floor consideration of my amendment. Let the House vote on whether we want to arbitrarily ban development of our own minerals and infrastructure needs and slash union jobs as outlined in Section 435. I know where I stand and it's with the union miners and the building trades. Who know how to responsibly develop our resources? Madam Chair, I hope my colleagues in the House stand with me. And Madam Chair, Ranking Member Cole, I also urge you to make in order a bipartisan amendment led by myself and Representative Fallon, which increases the circuit rider program by $605,000 in the Agricultural Division. This modest increase is offset entirely, and the House Parliamentary argues no point of order can be raised against it. In the context of this massive federal spending bill, this increase seems like a drop in the bucket, but to small and rural infrastructures, water infrastructures nationwide, it is a tidal wave of, tidal wave of support. <clears throat> Madam Chair, I know you're familiar with the Circuit Rider program, but I'll provide you the context anyway. Circuit Riders provide roving technical assistance to small and rural water facilities. Circuit Riders travel from facility to facility across our small towns, lending expertise and technical assistance because each individual locality does not have the money to pay for their own. Many treatment facilities in rural America have a dozen or less employees. These Circuit Riders save money for local budgets and taxpayers. According to the National Rural Water Association, this measly increase actually allows for 132 more circuit riders. That's 132 more experts traveling across rural America, lending their invaluable knowledge to our rural water treatment facilities. These experts were deemed, quote, mission critical essential employees to ensure rural America has clean sanitary drinking water and robust, robust wastewater filtration during the COVID-19 crisis. And lastly, Madam Chair, if you recall, uh, we also signed a bipartisan letter led by myself and several others, which I'd like to offer for the record. This amendment simply brings the funding level into line with what we requested. So I therefore urge you to make amendment number 57 to the Agriculture Division in order. And Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Valadeo of California, you recognize. Thank you, Madam Chair, Ranking Member Cole and uh, other members of the committee for the time today. Thank you for allowing me to speak to my amendments that highlight an ongoing emergency in my home state. As a result of California's drought and insufficient storage of water from the wet years, communities in my district are running out of water for their residents' daily use. Farmers in the Central Valley have been forced to fallow their fields and dry out valuable orchards due to access to little or no water. Hundreds of thousands of acres of produce will be unable to be planted this year yielding roughly one-fourth of the nation's food that is, and this is not just a concern for Californians, but all Americans. This is on top of the 0% water allocation from south, uh, for the south of Delta contractors from the Bureau of Reclamation. It is abundantly clear that our water must be used as productively as possible. Investing in California's water storage infrastructure is critical to preventing the devastation we are currently witnessing in my district and avoiding food shortages that inev inevitably increase cost of food for every person in the U.S. My First Amendment, Amendment 21 of Division C, extends appropriations authorizations for water storage projects under the WIN Act by an additional year and will allow California to take advantage of our wet years and ensure families and farmers have clean, reliable source of water in times of drought. I ask my colleagues to allow California farmers to continue to feed the world and address the suffering of the California families by supporting this amendment. The WIN Act was signed into law by President Obama, directed federal agencies to develop a new operations plan of the Central Valley Project and State Water Project. This was completed in February 2020. The resulting biological opinions provide flexibility and guidance to make the most efficient use of California's water and avoid waste of this precious resource. Unfortunately, the implementation of this science was immediately obstructed by partisan motives. Before President Trump even signed the memorandum directing the new plans to move forward, 
the state of California threatened suit against the conclusion of years of studies. These biological opinions were independently peer reviewed and informed by the most accurate and best available science. The corresponding operations plans for the Central Valley Project and State Water Project employs this science and data to ensure greater water reliability and availability for communities and farmers across California while continuing to protect at-risk species. This is not a partisan or political issue, it is science. Codifying these biological opinions puts an end to the senseless litigation and will provide farmers with certainty they need to continue feeding the world and ensure families in California have access to clean, reliable water. I ask my colleagues to support the best and most accurate scientific data available by supporting Amendment 22 of Division C. Central California uh, de farmland depends on water contracted through the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project and delivered largely by ways of canals from years of drought. Farmers have, been turned, have, been, have had to turn to pumping groundwater to protect their crops and towns have been forced to pump groundwater to meet their needs. As a result, these communities have experienced land subsidence at the expense of critical water infrastructure. In the past decade and a half, there has been a significant damage to the Frank Kern Canal, the Delta Mendota Canal, and the California Aqueduct from land subsidence. For example, one community in my district has dropped 11 and a half feet. Damage caused by land subsidence has significantly reduced the carrying capacity of these canals. which means obli uh, obligations are unable to be fully met, communities are compelled to pump more groundwater. My amendment would create a program to assist in the funding of the repairs to the damaged canal infrastructure facilities. Unless these canals are fully repaired, this harmful cycle will continue and conditions will worsen. For these reasons, I ask my colleagues to support Amendment 23 of Division C. Thank you again for the opportunity to highlight the importance of these three amendments that would address the terrible drought destroying California and the American West, and I yield back. Thank you. Chairwoman of Waters. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'd like to uh, also thank uh, the ranking member, Mr. Cole, and members of the committee. Today I'm here to discuss my amendment to ensure that federal housing funds are not used to perpetuate anti-blackness and racial injustice. Specifically, my amendment would ensure federal housing funds cannot be used to exclude black Native Americans of the five tribes who are descendants of freedmen. I recognize that na Native uh, communities face some of the worst housing conditions in the United States. That's why I have proposed providing $2 billion for Native communities in my Housing is Infrastructure Act and why I'm moving to reauthorize NAHASDA. However, we must ensure that every Native American household has equal access to federal resources, and right now, that's not the case. Not many are familiar with the history of those who came to be known as freedmen. The freedmen were black individuals who were enslaved by five formerly slaveholding tribal nations. The freedmen were forced to walk the Trail of Tears alongside their slave masters, and at the end of the Civil War, were guaranteed full tribal citizenship under treaty agreements between these formerly slaveholding tribes and the United States government in 1866. Specifically, the 1866 treaties required the five tribes to abolish slavery and to agree to treat formerly enslaved individuals and their lineal descendants as equal to native tribal citizens. Despite the fact that these treaty obligations still exist and are binding on the five tribes, the descendants of freedmen continue to be denied tribal citizenship and other basic rights associated with citizenship like equal access to federal housing assistance. While tribes like the Cherokee Nation have begun to make good on that promise after decades of litigation that ultimately reaffirmed the legal rights of the freedmen, others have not. To this day, there are descendants of freedmen who are denied the full benefits of equal citizenship in certain tribes based on their African ancestry, including access to federal housing funding provided in this bill. 
When Barney Frank was chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, he recognized the plight of the freedmen and was a staunch advocate for their rights. I worked with him closely on legislation to prevent tribes from disenfranchising their descendants. As ranking member and now chairwoman of the committee, I continue that fight for justice for the descendants of freedmen. I am sensitive to the fact that many confuse this issue with tribal sovereignty. However, tribal sovereignty should not be interpreted to give tribal nations the ability to ignore treaty requirements, nor should it be interpreted to prevent Congress from enforcing such requirements. Tribal sovereignty is a recognition of tribes as independent sovereign nations with the right to self-governance. It is not an infringement of tribal sovereignty to prevent federal housing funding from being used to perpetuate the ongoing discrimination and marginalization of the descendants of freedmen in direct violation of treaty requirements that the tribes agreed to. We must stand by the rights pro pro promised to freedmen all those centuries ago by passing this amendment, and I urge my colleagues to support it. And I thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters. Mr. Clyde. Thank you, um, Madam Chair and uh, Ranking Member Cole, uh, for allowing me to join you today. I will try and be brief. I have offered eight amendments to H.R. 4502, seven of which are identical and have been offered in each division. So I only have two subject matters I want to raise with you today. My amendments are number 119 to Division A, number 34 to Division B, number 42 to Division C, number 91 and 92 to Division D number 70 to Division E, to number 60 to Division F, and number 56 to Division G. Uh, number 92 to Division D is um, the exception, so I'll discuss it last. The seven identical amendments, in short, would prohibit any funds from being expended or obligated to departments and agencies under each division until the heads of each take action to bring federal employees back to the office at levels that are equal to or exceed the average in-person staffing levels pre-COVID. The American people are being called back to work as our world returns to normal, and federal employees should be called back too. I think the federal government should lead in this area. After all, they are employed to carry out critical operations of the government, some of which provide face-to-face -face <coughs> services to Americans in offices across the country, such as the Social Security Administration. But the reality is that several federal offices remain either shuttered um, or partially staffed while many employees continue to enjoy extended time at home. As a result, we've seen backlogs and delays pile up from the processing of, processing of passports to veteran records, uh, which are very important. These systems are suffering because of the lack of workers on site to complete the job in a timely and effective manner. And while I appreciate the resiliency of our federal workforce and its ability to overcome serious obstacles in the wake of COVID, there is no tool or technology that can replace the value of in person of the in-person worker. I mean, we're in person here today, you know, face to face, that's important. Moreover, we know how to protect ourselves and others, and so there's no reason for federal employees to not return to the office. My amendment would kick into high gear the return of the federal employees to the workforce as funds would be withheld if they do not act. Um, now I would like to move on to briefly discuss amendment number 92 to Division D Delta. This is a good governance amendment that would restore language that prevents federal agencies from requiring federal contractors to disclose federal election campaign contributions to the government as a condition of the contracting bid process. By stripping this previously included language from this year's financial services and general government bill, Lawmakers would be opening the door to allowing federal employees to condition bids based on one's political leaning and coinciding donations. It's a textbook example of the government being able to select winners and losers based on one's political leanings or lack thereof. You know, this is not a Republican or Democrat issue. This is an American issue. So no one... <clears throat> In no world should one's political leanings be factored into the federal contracting process. If a company proves it can do the best work at the best price and it fairly competes for the bid, then I want that company, regardless of it and its leader's political leanings. And I would hope that every member of this committee would feel exactly the same way. 
Already, we've seen Immigration and Customs Enforcement award a contract to the tune of $86.9 million to Family Endeavors, a nonprofit out of Texas that hired a former official of the Biden campaign and transition team not long before receiving the award. This award was so concerning because it was a no-bid award that, DHS, in, that the DHS Inspector General opened an investigation into the matter. I truly believe that if this House is serious about upholding merit-based competitive contracting, then I respectfully request that the committees make it in order, and I yield back. Mr. Kasten. Thank you, Madam Chair, Chair McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and the members of the Rules Committee. Really appreciate you giving me the opportunity. Um, and I'd also like to thank Chairwoman Deloro and the Appropriations Committee for all their hard work in putting together these, uh, all the appropriations bills. Special thanks to Chairwoman Kaptur on the Energy and Water Appropriations Subcommittee. I'd like to speak today in favor of my amendment number 30 to Division C of the Minibus Bill that I'm offering with Mr. McEachin and Mr. Foster. We're offering this plus minus amendment to indicate support for the Title 17 Innovative Technology Loan Guarantee Program and for the $150 million request for credit subsidies for the program that was included in President Biden's budget request. The Title 17 program administered by the Department of Energy's Loan Program Office was at one point the most effective government agency in terms of deployment of clean energy per dollar. The program had helped finance over $13 billion worth of clean energy projects, not by loaning the government's money, but by providing a guarantee and allowing clean energy companies to leverage private capital at efficient rates that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. Now, unfortunately, after a huge flurry of deal deals at the start of the last decade, the Title 17 program has been able to provide one loan guarantee in the past decade despite having billions in loan guarantee authorities still left by the law that authorized it way back in 2005. One of the primary reasons that we haven't been able to close loans from the program is because under the law, we have required borrowers to provide the credit subsidy at close. Now, what that's done practically is to massively include and increase the equity relative to debt in a project. And so at best, it increases the weighted average cost of capital to the point that developers are left saying, I can do better with the private sector. But more commonly and at worst, you raise the equity needs above the level that a company can access and the project just doesn't get built. Now, as some of you know, and on a personal note, before I came to Congress, I worked as a clean energy developer chasing <laughs> every excess of cheap money that I could find to try to build projects. Um, and we had a mission to, pro to profitably reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I can say from experience that the old adage, if you build it, they will come, is true. And I think we all know that. Not everybody in this room may have enough money to build a solar panel on your roof. But if you've got one up there, you will never go to sleep at night and say, I wonder if I can afford to generate electricity tomorrow. Free is always cheaper than the alternative. And if you make it possible for clean energy developers to access these loan guarantees, they will build projects that will consistently meet consumer demand for cheaper energy and displace dirtier, more expensive sources from the grid. It is a win-win for everybody. Investments in the Title 17 program and the Loan Program Office are some of the cheapest ways that we can deploy the capital necessary for the clean transition, for power that is cheaper and cleaner than the power we have today. These are investments that will pay for themselves and leave our nation stronger. My amendment sadly will not fix that credit flaw, but it is an important first step, a show of support for the Title 17 program, and I respectfully ask that the committee make the amendment in order. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members of the committee, for the opportunity to testify on my amendments for appropriations bill before the committee today. While I oppose the underlying bill with its many misaligned priorities, I believe these amendments will improve the bill. I'll begin with my amendments to Division A of the bill. These would ban U.S. taxpayers' dollars from funding gain-of-function research in China, prohibit funds for paying Dr. Anthony Fauci's salary, and prohibit funds for critical race theory curriculum. The evidence is mounting that COVID-19 originated in the Wuhan Virology Lab, a lab that received American taxpayer dollars to conduct gain-of-function research. 
The scientists at the Wuhan Virology Lab worked for years to insert bat virus spike proteins into the deadly SARS virus to infect human cells. This is absolutely gain-of-function research despite denials from Dr. Fauci. But Dr. Fauci has been unwilling to take responsibility for his mistakes during the pandemic. He suggested for months that masks had no impact on COVID-19 transmissions, only to reverse course and suggest mask wearing for everyone. Yet he later attended the Nationals baseball game and didn't wear a mask when seated only inches away from his peers. Dr. Fauci also knew it was likely COVID-19 originated from the Wuhan lab, according to his emails, but he lied to the American people for over a year and said there was no evidence. Dr. Fauci even spent all last year trying to discredit President Trump for his achievements to combat the virus and the success of Operation Warp Speed. We need someone who's bipartisan, someone who will put America first and make sure we conduct a real investigation to determine the origins of the coronavirus. Over 40% of Americans do not trust Dr. Fauci and he has become more concerned with his career than the American people. He does not deserve to be America's highest paid government employee and we should stop his salary until we find a replacement who works for every American. My last amendment under Division A would prohibit funds to be used to teach critical race theory or similar curriculum. A curriculum that says that the only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination is inherently divisive and should not be in our schools. We'll only overcome our differences by coming together, not by tearing our country apart. Under the other divisions, I've also submitted amendments that would ensure that the federal government establishes policies that reflect the carbon neutrality of biomass. However, I'm pleased to see that the underlying bill includes provisions that do so and highlight the carbon benefit of our nation's forest. Lastly, I have an amendment that would transfer $10 million from the IRS account for enforcement to the National Personal Records Center, NPRC. Many congressional offices have been flooded with calls from veterans needing their records from the NPRC to complete claims for their benefits. Unfortunately, there remains a significant backlog of over 500,000 requests that is delaying veterans from receiving their records necessary to receive benefits, including those for critical health care needs. I was pleased to see that the bill's report recognizes the problem, but my amendment would provide more funds to allow the NPRC to address it. Specifically, it pulls funds from the IRS to do so, which receive a massive 14% increase and has a history of targeting groups based on political beliefs and wasting taxpayers' dollars. Mm -hmm. Those funds would be transferred to the NPRC to immediately address its backlog and allow veterans to get the care that they need. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Mr. Kelter. Keller, sorry. Th thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Ranking Member Cole and uh, the members of the committee. Uh, I'd like to speak on two amendments to H.R. 4502, uh, 4502, the first Minibus Appropriations Act for fiscal year 2022 which affects students and veterans, not just across Pennsylvania, but across the United States. Section 312 of the bill would change the currently enacted 90-10 rules uh, ratio to become 85-15, thereby putting more restrictions on proprietary education institutions' uh, sources of revenue while requiring no similar restrictions on other institutions. Under current law, proprietary institutions must receive 10% of the revenue from non-federal sources. Section 312 would increase that to 15%. Why Congress would limit options for students like this is baffling. The Veterans Education Project has estimated that this policy change will impact 333 institutions who collectively enroll 116,000 veteran and military students. Their research shows that the majority of these students are enrolled in higher performing institutions that demonstrate better outcomes than other institutions. This provision would negatively affect over 300,000 students and 300 proprietary institutions. Limit choices and options to pursue an education and pick winners and losers based on the incorrect notion that proprietary institutions do not deliver value to their students. 
Uh, Madam Chair, we had uh, Secretary Cordona testify before the Education and Labor Committee last month, and he agreed with the idea that educational options should be first and foremost based on outcomes for students. It is not the government's job to decide which options they can pursue and which ones they cannot. I would urge the committee to make amendment number 51 of Division A in order, thereby allowing debate on this measure on the House floor. I'd also like to highlight the importance of addressing the backlog at the National Personnel Records Center, whose facility in St. Louis receives roughly 5,000 military service records per day. The NPRC scaled back its operations last year due to the pandemic. Since its employees must be physically present in order to process requests, those operations have delayed and veterans many of whom reside in Pennsylvania's 12th Congressional District, have been unable to receive their records in a timely fashion. This makes them unable to receive certain military and VA benefits they have earned and deserve. The NPRC has indicated that it is currently using $50 million in emergency funding appropriated last year to address the 500,000 backlog records requests in a timely manner. Madam Chair, if there was ever a time for congressional oversight, this is it. We must ensure that the backlog gets addressed and our veterans are taken care of properly. Additionally, we must ensure that a situation like this never again occurs. I urge the committee to make an order amendment number 114 of Division D, which highlights the need for action on this important matter and for proper oversight of the MPRC's usage of this $50 million appropriation. I thank you for the opportunity to testify on, this, on these critical issues affecting our students and veterans, not just in Pennsylvania's 12th Congressional District, but across our entire nation. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. I will now turn to our ranking member, Mr. Cole, for any questions he may have. I don't have any questions, Madam Chair, but I just want to take the opportunity to express what I know are collective condolences to our friend, Mr. Carter, who recently lost his father. And uh, our Democratic friends might not be aware of that, but we were alerted. So, again, um, we're awfully sorry for your loss, my friend. To that, Madam Chair, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Cole. We are deeply sorry for the loss of your, you. of your father. I will now call on Mr. Perlmutter. I just want to thank the witnesses and their testimony, and I'll yield back. Mr. Reschenthaler. I'd uh, echo the, um, the sentiments of my ranking member, and I'd yield back. Mr. Raskin. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I skipped um, Mr. Burgess. That wasn't on purpose, was it? <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed a pattern. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for being here. I hope all of their amendments are made in order. And, and buddy, I'll just add my condolences. Thank you. It's a tough deal, and uh, we're all here to help you in any way we can. Mr. Raskin. Yeah, I send my sympathies to your family, Mr. Carter, and I, I yield back. Mr. Reschenthaler, since you yielded back, I'm going to call on Ms. Fishbach. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and I would associate myself with the remarks of, uh, of the ranking member Cole and, and our deepest sympathy, Congressman Thank Carter. You. But I also have a question, um, just uh, Congressman Stauber, um, regarding your amendment, um, and you know, what sort of review and permitting does the mine, or does the mine already um, have, what does it actually have to go through to be shovel ready? Um, and what kind of burden would this additional um, permitting cause for the mine? Uh, Congresswoman Fishback, thank you for the, uh, the question and your support for the economic drivers in, in the Northland, uh, northeastern Minnesota. If my amendment is adopted, it does not automatically permit any mines. It still has to go through the process. Uh, and we have the best process uh, and we want the best EPA and the best labor standards in the world. So it will not automatically uh, 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 move forward. It has to go through the process. And uh, the author's uh, amendment wipes uh, the ability for that process to even happen on uh, 234,000 acres of, uh, of mine land um, in uh, our great state of Minnesota. 
And, and Congressman Stauber, maybe you mentioned it in your opening statement, but I didn't, and I missed it, but were you consulted at all um, before this amendment was put into, uh, the, into the bill? Thanks for the question. As the uh, only um, uh, congressional uh, elected official that represents that district, I was not uh, rep uh, asked about this amendment whatsoever. And I, I am assuming, Congressman Stauber, you've uh, you went to the chair and uh, voiced your opinion on, um, on this additional burden for this mine. I did. I, I, I certainly did. And I also want to uh, say that both Republicans and Democrats in my district support my amendment. Mining is our past, our present, and our future in Northeast of Minnesota. And we have the opportunity. And, and the, the, uh, this piece of legislation that is proposed uh, in, in my, uh, in my uh, opinion, is wrong. Uh, and uh, we need to allow the process to happen so we can uh, secure these critical minerals and the expansion of not only uh, hard rock mining, iron ore, but critical minerals and the rock quarry that's part of this uh, uh, piece of legislation. Thank you, Congressman Stauber. And Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Scanlon. My condolences to thank Representative you. Carter, and thank you to all of our witnesses for your testimony. Madam Chair, could you have confused Mr. Reschenthaler with Mr. Burgess because they were dressed the same today? <clears throat> okay, just checking. I yield back. <sighs> Sorry, you're not privy to the best Thai um, fashion show that we had here earlier. Um, <laughs> Mr. Morelli. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to uh, thank all of... Uh, uh, our uh, witnesses for coming and uh, arguing for their amendments, their participation, and uh, I'd extend my condolences as well. Mr. Desaunier. So when I add my condolences to my friend, Mr. Carter, and I yield back. Ms. Ross. Um, I, too, add my condolences to Mr. Carter, and I yield back. Mr. Nagus. I would just join my colleagues in extending our condolences to Mr. Carter and uh, yield back. Um, and I think we have no other questions of this panel. You, you can go. Thank you very much. Uh, Do you want to use the time productively? I've got four statements to insert. Okay, go ahead. You, uh, and Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to insert four items into the record. The first is a statement from Ranking Member Bost regarding his amendment. The second is a statement from Mr. Mast regarding his amendment. The third is a statement from Ms. Cheney regarding her amendments. And finally, the fourth is a statement from uh, Ms. gonzalez Colon uh, regarding her amendment. Without objection, I ask unanimous consent to insert in the record statements from Representatives Lynch, Strickland, Nadler, and Davis. Without objection. So now, Mr. Davidson, Mr. Estes, uh, Mr. Garamendi, Mr. Owens, and Mr. Graves. I think you are our, our and Mr. Wilson. So I think you are our last panel, I think. And so, and then we go vote. So um, why don't we go with Mr. Davidson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks uh, to the committee. I uh, appreciate the chance to testify. Uh, all of my amendments are for um, Section D, Division D of HR 4502. And uh, I'll begin with the first is uh, number 134. Uh, in the deck, and it's another amendment that deals with the National Archives. This is shameful uh, that the Na uh, National uh, Archives Records Administration has a over half million record backlog. Uh, the idea that they could, with a straight face, brief a plan that in 18 to 24 months from whenever they come back to work, they will clear the backlog, it, it, it should offend everyone. It should, it, and it does. It offends every veteran. I've shared that. This is literally their plan. And we gave them $15 million in the, in the corona bus at the end of the year to have more resources. So with the money, $15 million we gave them, they come back and say, our plan is in 18 to 24 months, we can clear the backlog. That is entirely unacceptable. Frankly, I think they need new leadership. Uh, but toward uh, the effort here, my amendment says that no one there uh, is uh, allowed to have paid time off until they clear the backlog. I mean, frankly, I don't want that to happen. I just want them to come up with a better plan. Uh, I've asked them to consider deploying the National Guard. I've asked them to consider outsourcing something. But frankly, the idea that this could be tolerated 18 to 24 months 
from now, you could get your record request as a veteran. People are being denied health care, all kinds of things within our VA medical system, home loans. Who knows what the interest rate on a VA home loan is going to be two years from now? We know it's pretty good right now. It's not as good as it was three months ago. Uh, we need to get this cleared. So that's the first one. The next one deals with the military as well. Uh, frankly, the First Amendment I had passed as a member of Congress, passed in the summer of 2016. Uh, it was called the Don't Draft Our Daughters Amendment. This is uh, reintroduced this cycle uh, on 133. It's Amendment 133 to Division D. Um, and, and it simply says that uh, the Selective Service cannot uh, use any of their funds to implement a rule that, or law legislation that would require women to register for the Selective Service. It passed, you know, five years ago, and thankfully for five years, we've uh, not required our women to be drafted. Now, at the time, there were a number of other amendments that were introduced in bills. Uh, Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard introduced one uh, that I supported, but it didn't have the votes, which was to end the Selective Service. And so uh, I've got another amendment, um, number 26 to Division D, which would just end the Selective Service or defund them. And they really don't need a draft because we don't have a declared war. Uh, I have a bill uh, that, I've, that I've introduced that, that would um, provide for how to implement a draft should there be a declaration of war. Um, and that could be taken up in separate legislation. But simply in appropriations, just quit funding the Selective Service altogether. Avoid the debate about who should be required to draft because no one should. We should voluntarily defend this great nation. And I'm honored to have the support of Congress Congressman DeFazio as a co-sponsor for this amendment. Um, so I think it'd be, be real progress for our country to uh, not compel service and certainly not to go through the effort to register for the draft and deprive people of all th kinds of things if they don't sign up for it while we aren't even in a declared war. So uh, we know the defense hawks would love to have more people signed up for more stuff to commit to more wars in more places. Uh, but we ought not make it that easy to go to war, or certainly not, ought not make it easy to, to draft people or to press them into service on our country. Frank, it's a great country, and we've had no, no trouble finding people to willingly serve and defend freedom to make and keep this country free uh, with a volunteer force. Uh, and I'm honored to have had the chance to do that myself, uh, not in combat. All right, next uh, is uh, another National Security Amendment expressed the uh, it, it's uh, number 131. It expresses the intent that the Office of Foreign Asset Control use funds specifically for addressing transnational criminal organizations who are crossing, facilitating cross-border payments and assisting illegal immigration in the United States at the Mexican border. Um, frankly, the, 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 the whole of government approach to um, drug enforcement is, is in appropriations language. It says that you can use funds to stop drug trafficking. What it doesn't say is that we could target the organizations that do all this, which are cartels, uh, commonly referred to as cartels. Um, the authorizing language is there uh, to say we could use a whole of government approach for transnational criminal organizations, but what makes it through in appropriations is something short of that. It says, uh, you know, drug, drug trafficking. We should be using all of the resources in our country to stop the cartels because, frankly, they're the ones that are really exploiting the people here. Uh, more than anyone else. I mean, and the presidents in Guatemala, El Salvador, and <clears throat> Honduras have said as much. So the policies that we're implementing make it easier on the cartels, and uh, we ought not do that. We ought to make it very hard on the cartels. So that's 131. Only two others. Um, the other is a national security one on um, my Amendment 11, and it prohibits funds from being used to increase the weight of Chinese RMB and special drawing rights in the International Monetary Fund. So, uh, you know, frankly, China is no longer really truly a developing economy. They're the second largest economy in the world. Uh, they're probably the second most powerful country in the world. They're exerting massive influence around the world, and they're using the International Monetary Fund to fund their Belt and Road Initiative. We ought not do that. We ought not increase the power of uh, China in the RMB uh, without a vote. And frankly, we're deferring this to the International Monetary Fund, and they're getting more cash. They're increasing the power of the RMB and diminishing the power of the U.S. dollar. This is Amendment um, 11. And my last amendment for consideration is Amendment 9 to Division D. Uh, it prohibits the Department of Treasury from using any funds to create new programs 
that would collect or store identifying information of individuals related to virtual or cryptocurrency holdings or transactions. Um, this last year for your taxes, if you noticed, there was a question about um, not just whether you had a gain or loss on uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, which is, of course, something you have to report. It's the law to report income uh, on gains or losses. But uh, they, they put language that said, we're going to ask whether or not you've transacted at all, which is really uh, in violation of you know, standard privacy rules. It's an overreach by Treasury. And they had to issue rules to clarify, well, we only really mean if you had a gain or loss. So this simply says, let's just be clear, you're not going to build a database uh, to see who transacted anything. You're just going to do your job, which is to collect income taxes. Um, with that, I yield to any questions the Thank you. committee Mr. may have. Mr. Wilson, uh, we'll go to you, and you could maybe introduce your grandson. Yes, I sure would. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, I'm uh, grateful. My oldest grandson, Addison the uh, Third, my namesake, is here. I'm very grateful. Next month, he begins Clemson Honors College Engineering, so he's much brighter than his grandfather. So I'm very grateful he's here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> A lot better look. No, I know. Yeah. And hey, and, and Earl, uh, about a foot taller, okay? All right, you may proceed. Yeah. I can? Oh, yeah. wow. Hey, thank you. Uh, colleagues, this amendment strikes uh, Section 314 of the Division A of the bill. Section 314, quote, says none of the funds made available by this act or any other act may be awarded to a charter school that contracts with for a a for-profit entity to operate, oversee, or manage the activities of the school, end of quote. This vague, vague language has serious repercussions for the 3.3 million students who are in the uh, various charter schools of America, and particularly with the pandemic, um, we now have over 2,500 schools in all 50 states. Additionally, I appreciate the South Carolina Virtual Charter School with Director Cherry Daniel serving 3,000 students in rural communities of my state. For example, the language is not clearly drafted to single out charter schools whose operations are entirely carried out for for-profit entity. Instead, the language creates a situation where schools that con contract with a private company for oversight functions or provisions for the therapies to children with disabilities could risk losing all of their federal funds. Occupational therapy providers, financial audits, programs, and activities to these schools' technolo technology services and janitorial services are just some of the many examples of what nonprofit charter schools outsource for profit entities for this section and could take away their federal funding. A further step, it does not define a charter school. It does not place any time limits, past, present, or future on implementation of the section, possibly restricting unspent pandemic relief funds, and does not take into account the implementation across multiple federal agencies. There should not be targeting charter schools. The regulation does not apply to other public schools. A 2020 study from Harvard found greater academic gains for school cohorts in charter schools than in district operated schools. Charter high schools make up just 10% of the country's nearly 24,000 public high schools, but they comprise 24% of the top 100 public high schools with, again, over 3.3 million students. I ask my colleagues to consider the detrimental impact of that Section 314 could have, including the potential closure of public schools that otherwise lack financial resources, especially in areas where these schools serve economically disadvantaged students and are urge you to vote in favor of the amendment. I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Estes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the Rules Committee for uh, considering my amendments. You know, as we discuss current appropriations bills, I think it's important to remember whose money is being spent this week. It's not the discretionary, uh, personal discretionary fund of any single member or an interest group. It's money earned by a mom, of, mother of four in Massachusetts who's working to buy school supplies in August, or the income of an Oklahoma farmer who spends his spare time repairing decades old machinery to stay solvent. When we talk about government spending, we're really talking about the money of the American people. During the federal spending debate in the Constitutional Convention of 1787, Mr. Elbridge Gerry, a delegate from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, noted that the House of Representatives was more immediately the representatives of the people, and it was a maxim that the people ought to hold the purse strings. It's time that we ask some of the ever-expanding federal agencies to make the same sort of tough decisions that Kansas families tell me they have to make. 
If families across the country can cut a nickel or a dime out of every dollar they spend, so can some of our federal agencies. Today I'm asking the Rules Committee to consider amendments that will begin to restore Congress's responsibility to taxpayers. We have a duty to be good stewards of the resources instead of spending without restraint, which is all too common here in Washington. We throw around numbers like billions and trillions without considering the real impact on American citizens and the children and grandchildren of this country. My amendments would simply reduce the discretionary spending in Divisions A through E and Division G of H.R. 4502 by 1%, a mere penny from every dollar this bill would spend. This would be amendments number seven to Division A, number four to Division B, number four to Division C, number three to Division D, number three to Division E, and number 11 to Division G. I want to remind everybody that this proposed cut's not really a cut since this spending levels have all increased since the previous year. And only in Washington can you actually spend more money and still be criticized for cutting spending. Yet this is a critical step securing our finances and reducing a long-term tax burden on future generations. Today, our nation's debt is more than $28 trillion. With a number so large, it's hard to understand how much taxpayer money we're talking about. $28 trillion has 12 zeros behind it. And every American, adult and child, bears a burden of more than $85,000 each. Following the global, global pandemic and trillions of dollars spent in relief and some spending spent under the guise of relief, we're looking at another $600 billion in spending on these seven appropriations bills alone. Do hardworking Americans across the country want their $85,000 burden to grow even more? Instead, we can take a common sense approach to reduce the non-defense and non-veterans affairs discretionary spending in H.R. 4502 by only 1%. I admit it isn't a magic bullet to get our fiscal house back in order, but it's a step in the right direction that recognizes the responsibility of spending the hard-earned money of our constituents and sets us up for future success. Every member should have the ability to vote on these amendments, which should also receive bipartisan support. Whether Republican or Democrat, all Americans know we're headed toward a financial disaster if we stay on the same path. A family in Maryland or a small business in North Carolina can't survive spending so much more than they take in. The only way we'll get spending under control is to stop spending more than we bring in, and a small 1% is a start. It's time for Congress to hold federal agencies responsible for the funds they use. We need to rein in spending, reduce our bloated deficits, and get our nation's debt under control. America's future generations depend on it. I urge you to make these amendments in order so that they may be, to be debated and voted on by the full House of Representatives. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Mr. Garamendi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me follow on on my colleague's point about spending money. Uh, it turns out that uh, we're going to be spending a whole lot of money on a nuclear bomb that will not be able to be used for about 20 years. Turns out that there's $691 million in the uh, appropriation bills to uh, build the W87-1 nuclear weapon. That nuclear weapon is supposed to go on the ground-based strategic defense uh, deterrent, which uh, we are now told by the military will not be used on that weapon until at least 2037 to 2040. So let me follow on what he just said. Let's save some $691 million right there. Since that weapon is going to be, to build that weapon, we're going to have, this is number 37, by the way, uh, number 35, the next amendment. Uh, this weapon would require a new plutonium pit. The plutonium pit are scheduled to be built in um, Los Alamos and at Savannah River. Since the uh, weapon is not necessary for another 18 years, amendment number 35 would strike the funding for the Savannah River project. Calm down, Joe, calm down. It happens to be in Joe's district. We've, <laughs> we've talked about this many times. But since the weapon, the, uh, re the repurposing of the Savannah River project is now to produce plutonium pits. The plutonium pits for the w, specifically for the W87-1. The capacity at Los Alamos is sufficient over the course of the time of the next 18 years to produce enough plutonium pits without Savannah. And so the Amendment 35 follows on the Amendment 37. 37 would strike the money for the W87-1 
and 35 would strike the money for the repurposing of the Savannah River to produce pits that could just as easily be, would be produced at Los Alamos. I have a couple of other amendments moving away from nuclear to uh, hometown. It turns out that the uh, Corps of Engineers wants to remove from their work this Susun Channel connecting Susun a city to Grizzly Bay and San Francisco Bay. They didn't bother to ask me about this before they decided to disposition study, meaning remove it from the Army Corps of Engineers. Amendment number 69 would reverse that, require the Army Corps of Engineers to continue this channel in their responsibility. Uh, amendment number 77 uh, speaks to a very significant controversy, 77 and 78 do. This is the Delta Tunnel uh, in California. This is an ongoing controversy dating back some 30 years. Uh, this Amendment 77 would uh, prohibit the reclamation of the, from funding the California Delta Conveyance, otherwise known as the Tunnel. Mr. McNerney is my co-sponsor on this uh, with the support of the Delta communities and counties. 78 would prohibit the Army Corps of Engineers from issuing a Clean Water Act, Section 404 permit, to the state of California for the conveyance program. Finally, Amendment 75 uh, permits the Federal Maritime Commission to pay out fines, penalties, collected from ocean common carriers for violations of the Shipping Act as de facto reparations to the aggrieved third parties. So after the uh, Federal Maritime Commission goes through all their hearings and decides that a fine is necessary for the ocean common carriers, that money could then be used to um, cover some of the losses from the domestic shippers. This is a very, very big issue for agriculture across the nation. That's it. Thank you very much. Ms. Kamak. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking to you today on Amendment Number 41, HR 4570, striking language that would effectively allow the unlimited use of additional contingency funding of the SNAP for quote unquote unanticipated costs. When it comes to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, this administration chose Policy, now y'all can hear me. You could hear me before I talk loud. <laughs> the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities to create a food stamp free for all. In November 2020, this inside the beltway, quote unquote, nonpartisan research and policy institute, and nonpartisan seems inaccurate, wrote a piece that said, quote, for other appropriated entitlements, policymakers have a simple way to protect against the inadequate annual funding by providing uncapped appropriations for the last quarter of the fiscal year to fulfill the requirements of the underlying law governing the program in question. So here we are, taking the advice of an organization and its leadership who thrive on creating dependency as opposed to studying and promoting real world solutions to poverty. This slush fund has the potential to exceed $17 billion. Interestingly, there are no parameters set forth except for quote unquote unanticipated consequences. Nutrition programs have received a colossal and historic amount of money since March 2020 to deal with the unanticipated costs connected to the pandemic. Yet here we are, seemingly writing another blank check that will no doubt perpetuate a culture of dependency. Judging from the actions thus far of this administration, including a significantly condensed and ultimately questionable process in updating the thrifty food plan, I can only surmise what in fact will be labeled as a quote unquote unanticipated cost. This is a dangerous precedent to set and only seems to be another step towards the majority's obsession with, with shifting to a reckless economic framework that closely resembles modern monetary theory. Mr. Chairman, who is not here, I urge you to allow debate on this amendment to put forth a to put forth a stop of this out of control spending. The second amendment that I would like to speak on is the repurposing contingency funds for ENT. This is number 42 HR uh, to HR 4502 to repurpose contingency funds under the SNAP program. 
for use towards employment and training programs to help Americans get back on their feet. Now, as I mentioned in my earlier statement, Congress's response to the nutrition needs of our communities have been nothing short of colossal. Since March 2020, more than $154 billion has been provided to families through nutritional programs. Unfortunately, there have been no efforts by the majority to provide additional funding to recipients who found themselves victim to shuttered businesses, job killing shutdowns, and canceled classes and training. Every single one of our districts has seen this. I refuse to sit idly by in this appropriations process, allowing to continue the failing of the American worker. We are in the midst of the second largest expansion of welfare entitlements in our nation's history. And while this administration thinks expanded eligibility and increased benefits are the answer, I disagree, as do my constituents. The work, the work disincentives are staggering, and that is not fair to a family who wants to improve their station in life. Any rational human would choose the tens of thousands of dollars in public benefits over employment. Congress is to blame for crafting a safety net that traps people rather than lifts them up. Small business owners across my district have come to me with the same problem in the last few months, labor. In fact, I would guess that every single one of us as legislators have heard from our constituents the same problem, labor. Positions remain unfilled, job openings remain open, and the shortage of labor continues. In fact, in the state of Florida, my state, nearly 530,000 jobs remain open while 523 people remain unemployed. Clearly, scarcity of work is not the issue. So instead of holding another $3 billion in unnecessary contingency funds, which is already sitting at roughly $6 billion, let's refocus on rebuilding our economy, rebuilding the confidence of our families in need, and giving them a shot in rejoining the employment world that is already looking, for a, lot, that is already looking a lot different than our bustling pre-pandemic one. This $3 billion, $3 billion can fund apprenticeships, subsidized employment programs, and career and technical education for the many unemployed and underemployed recipients. We can all agree that current employment and training services are underutilized and underfunded. We have a real opportunity here to improve services and support systems for families and give states the tools and resources to make these programs effective and sustainable. And finally, I want to speak in support of uh, an important amendment the same legislation to protect life in the unborn, Amendment Number 74, of which I am a co-sponsor. Abortion is an inhumane procedure that has ended the lives of millions of unborn children. I am here today to stand for the protection of life and against the use of taxpayer dollars to fund abortions. For many years, Congress and numerous administrations have protected taxpayers from, fun from footing the bill for abortion services. Sadly, the majority in this administration seem more determined than ever to dismantle all remaining provisions that protect life. Standing up for the unborn should not be, and as recent polling shows us, is not a partisan issue. Without this and other important amendments to the legislation before us, we risk turning the backs on humanity and requiring the American taxpayer to pay for the death of millions more of unborn children. I urge my colleagues in the majority to listen to the American people and ensure that these protections are in place. Thank you again to my colleague, Ranking Member Cole, for leading the charge on this important amendment. And with that, I yield back. Mr. Thank you very much. I think Mr. Graves, we have a few minutes be before we have to leave and vote, but they're going to hold. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the hearing and Mr. thanks Owen, for the all's Okay, we have, um, I'm sorry. Um, before I go to, I thought Mr. Owen testified. I'm sorry. I, I go to Mr. Oh, Owen, okay. I go to you, Mr. Graves. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, yeah. and ranking, ranking Member Cole and, uh, and members of the, of the Rules Committee. Uh, this uh, amendment, 101 of Division D, will prevent Democrats from shamefully, shamefully ripping educational freedom away from low-income students, including students of color, who are in desperate need for better educational options. Over the last 17 years, the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program has provided educational opportunities for more than 11,000 low-income students and their families living in our nation's yeah. capital. About 95% of participating students are black and Hispanic and come from families with an average income of less than $25,000 per year. About 97% of participating 12th graders graduate from high school. 91% are accepted to two or four year college universities. By almost any objective measure, the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program has been one of the most effective federal educational programs in American history. We know school choice works. Giving parents the freedom to choose the best educational environment 
for their children provides better long-term outcomes for students. The meta-analysis of school choice research shows that students who participate in school choice programs see large positive gains in test scores that equate to roughly 49 extra days of learning in math and 28 days of extra learning and reading. Researchers find that positive effects on test scores increase the longer students participate. Results in the more meaningful long-term outcomes are even more impressive. Research consistently shows that students participating in school choice programs are more likely to graduate from high school, enroll in college, and persist in college. A study of the Florida Tax Credit Scholarship Program, the largest school choice program in the country, found that student enrollment in two and four year colleges increased 12% from, from elementary and middle school students and 19% for high school students. Granting parents more educational freedom is also a right thing to do. Virginia Walden Ford formed Peace, uh, DC Parents for School Choice in 1998 to advocate for the greater educational freedom for DC families. Her tireless work on behalf of low-income families and families of color in the District of, of Columbia resulted in the creation of the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program. In, in 2019, the Committee on Education and Labor held a, a hearing on the legacy of Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court case. Ms. Walden Ford wrote a letter to the committee that said, and I quote, the same schools that we fought hard to get into the 1960s after the Brown decision have become the schools we diligently must find a way to get minority students out of. These schools and programs that our children are now forced to attend are creating environments where our children cannot get the education they deserve, close quotes. Now Democrats want to rip the opportunities away from the black and brown kids in the district. The underlying bill calls for a rapid phase out of the program with which if implemented would undo decades of work by advocates like Mrs. Uh, Ms. Walden Ford and nearly 20 years of work improving educational options for district schools. Unfortunately, we've seen this before. After taking office in 2009, the, the Obama administration revoked 209 scholarships from low-income students in the program. The administration then manipulated funding, uh, le funding levels to the point that by 2011, the program en enrollment had dropped by almost 500 students. These students are the most vulnerable in our nation. It's up to us to advocate and fight for on their behalf, making sure that we help provide them with opportunities and freedom they deserve. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield back. Thank you very much. And before I go to Mr. Graves, I think you've already voted, Mr. Graves. You guys haven't. I don't, I, I don't have any questions for you, do you? Otherwise, you have to come back. No. All right, you can go and don't have to come back. All right. And, what, and, and, and Mr. Graves, we're going to... Mr. Graves, you're going to, we're going to recognize Mr. Graves. And, uh, Mr. Graves, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. and Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to join you today. I want to thank you for your perseverance. Um, I want to bring up a few amendments that we're co-sponsoring with others or uh, doing on our own. Uh, first, Mr. Chairman, is uh, D-108, uh, D-110, and G-67. They all pertain to the same issue that has to do with duplication of benefits. This is a disaster federal policy whereby in the aftermath of a disaster, federal disaster victims are told that if they got a loan from the Small Business Administration, they're ineligible for a grant um, if those become available later on because they're calling a loan and a grant duplicative of one another. Obviously, they're not duplicative. They're very, very different. And we shouldn't be penalizing uh, flood victims for stepping up and trying to be more proactive. Um, I want to be clear, we fixed this in the law. The, the Disaster Recovery Reform Act of 2018 fixed this. But unfortunately, uh, HUD uh, butchered the interpretation. I think Secretary Carson slept on the job through this one. And I think that the, the current secretary we've been unable to get uh, the attention so far. But this simply fixes something that we've already, in fact, I can't say fixes. It, it, it just it forces the agency to do what they're required to do under the law already. Incredibly frustrating. This doesn't cost a penny. Money is already in the bank, and the law is already fixed. It's just bureaucrats that we're trying to cut through. Um, number E-102 pertains to a new fee that's imposed under this bill, or a fee that's being raised under this bill. This is a, a, a fee for inspection of energy facilities. Mr. Chairman, right now, the, the uh, fees that are charged results in a profit to the Department of the Interior. Yet this bill raises them even further. So they're profiting from doing inspections. And I think it's also important to note that under current law, they have the ability to raise these fees on their own if they want to do it. 
And so Congress should not be stepping in and doing this. E-53 pertains to uh, proprietary information. The, the underlying bill uh, changes the law to say that the department may protect proprietary information. Uh, Mr. Chair, that's wholly inappropriate to require folks to submit proprietary information and then potentially public disclose it, publicly disclose it. So this changes it from may to shall. Uh, G-47, um, this is a bipartisan amendment we're doing. Uh, Congressman Cicilline, we've done a lot of work on scenic byways. As you know, uh, some of the greatest jewels in America are actually in some of our rural areas. It's not going to New York, LA, and other places. It's some of these rural areas, especially during COVID. Let's, let's help to educate and, and help to promote some of these areas that are covered by our scenic byways. I urge adoption of that one. It's again, G47. Uh, G65, um, what this one does is once again, in the aftermath of a disaster, uh, Mr. Chair, you have a FEMA base flood elevation standard and you have a HUD one. They're different. Um, in fact, you can even get it more complicated. The Corps of Engineers uses different metrics as well. Um, that is crazy to have different standards or metrics for flood victims. This just says there's one. We're going to have one within the federal family and that you can't go out there and create different standards. And the reason this is important is because in some cases, disaster victims are being prohibited from getting federal assistance because they complied with the FEMA standard at the time, only to learn of a HUD standard that's different later on. We shouldn't be re-victimizing our flood victims. Lastly, Mr. Chair, look, I fully that, that some of these amendments violate Clause 2. But you know what? This entire bill does. I serve on the authorizing committees for all of the amendments that I mentioned. We were not advised or consulted on any of these things other than where we've already changed the law. So um, I understand that, that folks can raise Clause 2. This, this bill is a walking violation of Clause 2. And I'll say it again. We lost you, we lost you Mr. Graves. We still serve on the okay, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, urge you I urge you to include those within the rule for consideration. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Are there any other members who wish to testify on H.R. 4502? Seeing none, this closes the hearing on H.R. 4502. And without objection, the committee stands in recess, a brief recess, subject to the call of the chair. We hope to come back right after this vote series.
Okay. Uh, rules committee will come to order. At this time, the chair will entertain a motion from the distinguished gentlewoman from California, Mrs. Torres. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant HR 4502, the Labor, uh, Health, and Human Services, Education, Agriculture, Rural Development, Energy and Water Development, Financial Services, and General Government, Interior, Environment, Military Construction, Veterans Affairs, Transportation and Housing and Urban Development Appropriations Act 2022 as structure rule. The rule provides one hour of general debate. <laughs> equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on appropriations or their designees. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee Print 117-12 modified by the amendment printed in Part A of the Rules Committee Report shall be considered as adopted and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. The rule provides that following debate, each further amendment printed in Part B of the Rules Committee report, not earlier considered as part of amendments and block pursuant to Section 3, shall be considered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and opponent, may be withdrawn by the proponent at any time before the question is put thereon, shall not be subject to amendment, and shall not be subject to a demand or division of the question. The rule provides that any time after debate of the chair of the committee on appropriations or her designee may offer amendments and block consisting of further amendments printed in Part B of the Rules Committee report not earlier disposed of. Amendments and blocks shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for 30 minutes, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Rules and Appropriations or their designees, shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to a demand for divisions of the question. The rule waives all points of order against the amendments printed in Part B of the Rules Committee report or amendments and block described in Section 3 of the resolution. The rule provides one motion to recommit. The rule provides that House Resolution 188 agreed to March 8, 2021 is amended by striking July 30, 2021, each place it appears and inserting September 22, 2021. The rule provides that at any time through the legislative day of Friday, July 30th, 2021, the speaker may entertain motions offered by the majority leader or a designee that the House suspend the rules with respect to multiple measures that were the object of motions to suspend the rules on the legislative days of July 26 or 27, 2021, and on which the years, the yeas and nays were ordered and further proceedings postponed. The chair shall put the question on any such motion without debate or intervening motion. And the ordering of the yeas and nays on postponement motions to suspend the rules with respect to such measures is vacated. Finally, proceedings may be postponed through September 22, 2021 on measures that were the object of motions to suspend the rules on the legislative days of July 26 or 27, 2021, and on which the yeas and nays were ordered. You heard the motion from the gentlewoman from California. Is there any discussion or amendments? Uh, Dr. Burgess. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. I <clears throat> move that the committee add language to the resolution that would eliminate the tolling of days for resolutions of inquiry. I, once again, am offering a motion to restore the use of the resolution of inquiry Again, this control over House operations seems to be mostly about the Speaker's concerns over control over the floor in general. Speaker Pelosi and the Democratic majority have eliminated minority rights. Beginning at the start of the 117th Congress, in one fell swoop, they eliminated two critical minority tools, the motion to recommit and the use of resolutions of inquiry. <coughs> Committees are now open and operating. They have proven that they can and certainly are doing their work whether remotely, in person, or a hybrid version thereof. Additionally, the House is proving 
The vote times can be much more manageable over the last few weeks, allowing for a smoother and more normal operations on the floor. For this reason, resolutions of inquiry, if considered in committee, would have positively no impact on the floor schedule. Mr. Chairman, today I introduced my own resolution of inquiry with Ranking Member McMorris Rogers and Ranking Member Katko as original co-sponsors to direct the Department of Homeland Security and Health and Human Services to turn over documents and information concerning the care of unaccompanied alien children in the custody of Customs and Border Protection and the Office of Refugee Resettlement. If this language sounds familiar, it is <clears throat> very almost identical to the language that now Chairman Pallone used in the previous administration to obtain information on separations. It is increasingly frustrating knowing that the majority will now be tolling the days for this resolution because of their need to protect the administration and to maintain control over the House floor. I urge adoption of my motion and yield back. Heard the gentleman's amendment. Uh, any debate, any discussion? If not, the voters on the Burgess Amendment, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Roll call. The clerk will call the roll. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres, no. <laughs> Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Desonier, Desonier, no. Mr. Desonier, no. Ms. Ross, no. Ms. Ross, no. Mr. Negus, no. Mr. Negus, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Reschendaller, aye. Mr. Reschendaller, aye. Mrs. Fishbach. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Mr. Rushenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move the committee add language to the resolution that would eliminate the tolling of days for Section 7 of the War Powers Resolution. The House continues to abdicate their Article 1 authority by hamstringing our ability to bring up such legislation. This committee has repeatedly discussed the need for War Powers reform. But that should not preclude the ability for all members to discuss the fundamental issues of war on the House floor. Furthermore, Mr. Chairman, as the House has proven it can handle a full legislative workload and voting times have normalized, such legislation as this might lead to will not significantly impact the House's ability to operate on the floor. I urge the adoption of my motion, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back the remainder of my time. Heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? Hearing none, the voters on the Russian Thaler amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 Opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a recorded vote. Clerk will call the roll. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Desonier. No. Mr. Desonier, no. Ms. Ross. No. Ms. Ross, no. Mr. Negus. No. Mr. Negus, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Rushenthaler, Mr. Rushenthaler, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Ms. Fishbach. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee strike from the rule language providing for the same day authority beyond July 30th and make the necessary changes in the rule. Mr. Chairman, I completely understand the need for same day authority through the end of this week, given the almost seven, uh, seven week break envisioned in the majority leader's calendar. However, the House has proven over the last year that it does not need blanket martial law authority. Committees continue to do their work. Floor operations have smoothed, yet you are keeping a provision giving the ability to bring anything to the floor at, on one hour's notice. I'm concerned that the majority is keeping this provision in in order to jam through a budget resolution and the associated reconciliation bill with at least $3.5 in new spending. I cannot and will not support a rule that further tramples the rights of Republicans. And for this reason, I urge the adoption of my motion. I'm not aware of us bringing anything to the floor on a one hour's notice, but uh, I would urge a no vote on this. Um, any discussion? If not, the voters on the Fishbach Amendment, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Aye. No. Opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Uh, roll call. <laughs> Clerk will call the roll. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Raskin. No. 
Mr. Raskin? No. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon? No. Mr. Morelli? No. Mr. Morelli? No. Mr. Desonier? No. Mr. Desonier? No. Ms. Ross? No. Ms. Ross? No. Mr. Neguse? Mr. Neguse? No. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Burgess? Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Reschendaller, aye. Mr. Reschendaller, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Members not agreed to. Further amendments, Mr. Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I, I have several amendments. Before I offer them, I want to thank you for making the McGirt amendment uh, in order and the majority. And that we may or may not prevail, but it's really important that the discussion continue. I think. And I'm working closely with both subcommittee chairmen. If you had a better me. offset, I'd probably support it. Yeah, yeah. well, I, and I actually told them I'd take any offset uh -huh. you can find me. Uh -huh. uh, so I, I, this was not, and let me reassure you when we get to that, certainly not targeted at the environmental. It just, you put more money in there than any place else and more than the president asked for. That's why we went there. Although, as I said in committee, I'll take any uh -huh. offset you can get. But anyway, thanks uh, for letting us keep it alive and uh, keep the discussion going. Maybe by the end of the process, we'll get someplace. Okay. So. Good. Thank you for that. Uh, in terms of my amendment, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I move that the committee strike the section providing consideration of the text of the Rules Committee print 117-12 uh, and amend the rule to provide for separate consideration of H.R. 4502, the Labor, Health, and uh, uh, Human Services and Education Bill, H.R. Uh, 4356, the Ag Bill, H.R. 4549, Energy and Water, H.R. 4345, uh, financial Services and General Government, H.R. 4372, Interior, H.R. 4355, Milcon, and H.R. 4550. Uh, uh, as reported uh, from the Committee of Prohibition, I do this for several reasons. I mean, one, obviously we'd like to get back something closer to regular order, consider these bills one at a time, and uh, we could actually do that if we accepted this amendment. Second, and I mean this all sincerity, and I'll give you an example. I probably would vote for the interior bill if it weren't with six other bills that I can't vote for. And uh, I think you'd find, I mean, you, you saw the interplay between uh, uh, Representative Fortenberry and Chairman Bishop. But I don't have any doubt the Ag Bill, I leaned over and said, gosh, you get, get this bill on your own, you get 380 votes. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a lot of these bills that are really genuinely bipartisan. And we did the same thing, but it, it partisanizes the votes in ways that don't have to happen. When I first got to appropriations. I was on Interior. Norm Dix was the chairman of it then. Uh, he did some really good stuff on Indian stuff. And we had a policy then. Uh, we were uniformly voting against Democratic bills because of spending, but I actually went to Chairman Simpson, or excuse me, Ranking Member Simpson at the time, said, look, this is pretty great. He said, go ahead and vote for it, Cole. I said, I, I need to do that. And we, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Steve, our, our late colleague, Steve LaTourette was there. It was great on uh, uh, the Great Lakes, uh, you know, Joyce's predecessor, he voted for it. We picked up about a dozen votes on the Republican side for the interior bill, even though none of us particularly liked the EPA section or, you know, everybody's got complaints. But there were so many things. So it just down the road, we need to get back to doing this. It brings us back to open rules. It brings us back to individual deals. And it, it actually allows bipartisanship to take place. So I just put that in front of you for your consideration. Uh, but that's, uh, that's my motion. Uh, uh, amendment, any uh, discussion? Mr. Mr. Dr. Burgess. I just want to thank uh, Frank Cole for bringing this forward. This is a very thoughtful and reasonable approach that he has outlined, and I think we would do well to take him at his word and, and uh, sure. consider adopting this approach. And we all know this, <laughs> this table is simply not big enough for all the witnesses we had here today. <laughs> thank you. I'll yield back. Um, you heard the amendment, and he, uh, uh, the vote now is on the call amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 Any of the chair, the noes have it. No, Roll call vote. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Desonier. No. Mr. Desonier, no. Ms. Ross. Ms. Ross, no. Mr. Neguse, no. Mr. Neguse, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Reschendaller, aye. Mr. Reschendaller, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Book report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. The members not agreed to. Further amendments, Mr. Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee provide 
The Cole Amendment number 74 to Division A of H.R. 4502 shall be considered as adopted. Mr. Chairman, this amendment would ensure that the Hyde and Weldon Amendments, which we've discussed at length today, uh, whose critical language protects the conscience of the majority of Americans who are opposed to taxpayer funding of abortions, would be included in the bill. For 45 years, the Hyde Amendment, which protects the use of federal taxpayer dollars to fund abortions, has been carried in the Labor, Health, and Human Services Education Appropriations Bill. It's been supported by presidents and congresses of both parties for decades. Uh, the Weldon Amendment, uh, which has been carried into law for 16 years, protects the conscience rights of doctors, nurses, and other health care professionals from participating in uh, or providing an abortion uh, if they have a moral objection. I think our friend Dr. Burgess spoke very eloquently to that earlier today. Both the Hyde and the Weldon uh, Amendments uh, were intentionally excluded from this bill. So to me, saying that we don't legislate on appropriations bill when this exact same language has been here for 45 years in one case and 16 in another um, it doesn't bear up under much scrutiny. It's absolutely essential, and I really want to underline this. We can have this fight, and again, I respect everybody's uh, deals. As I said in my remarks before the committee, I really do think over time Democrats have looked at this in terms of race and equity. Nothing wrong with that. Those are legitimate concerns. We look at it in terms of life and conscience. There's nothing wrong with that either. Uh, and uh, and we stand by. That's where we're at. But for a practical purpose, uh, again, this bill, as long as this language stays in it, we can move it and inch it down the road a little further, but it will end up in the CR. Uh, and that's just uh, that's a statement of political reality, whether you agree with the Hyde and Weldon amendments or not. That's where we're headed, and I hesitate every time we move a step down that road because I think it's hard to walk back. I'd also point out, just to be consistent, two Democrat, the last two Democratic bills have had the Hyde and Weldon Amendment. In other words, this isn't something that when you were in opposition you developed. This is something you've you know, come, come to a conclusion on or consensus on, although I want to be fair to my chairman, uh, Chairwoman Delora. She's always... Uh, said, hey, if I can get it out, I'm gonna. And she's been perfectly consistent in that ever since I've known her. So, But the fact that she didn't the first two times and she got the bill across the line is evidence that, uh, you know, on the politics of it, she understands, I think, uh, as well as anybody does, where this is going to end up. So we do this partly, too, because, again, I know my friend's opinions are deeply held and, uh, and legitimately arrived at. You need to know ours are, too. And you need to know we, we are very consistent in this. So we never want to make the mistake of leaving a doubt in your mind where we'll be. So with that, uh, I would move the amendment. And I appreciate the gentleman's uh, uh, comments. I think we've debated this a lot today. Um, any other conversation? If not, the voters on the Cole Amendment, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Any of the chair, the noes have it. If I could roll call, Mr. Roll call. Chairman. Clerk will call the roll. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Desonier, no. Mr. Desonier, no. Ms. Ross, no. Ms. Ross, no. Mr. Negus, no. Mr. Negus, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Rushendaller, Mr. Rushendaller, aye. Mrs. Fishbach. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Members not agreed to. Further amendments, Mr. Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee provide for separate consideration of H.R. 18 under closed rule and make the necessary changes to the rule. I'm sure my colleagues will recall that was uh, Mr. Smith's amendment would actually do in law what we've done uh, incremental or done, you know, episodically in appropriations bill. It's unfortunate uh, that my previous request to self-execute uh, um, on the amendment protecting the conscious was uh, not agreed to. Uh, again, this is a, a deeply important moral issue that's resonated for decades across party lines, uh, and it's, this is a massive departure from precedent. H.R. 18, introduced by Congress, or Representative Smith, would codify the Hyde Amendment and ensure that no federal, form, uh, federal funds be utilized for abortions. Chairman, um, again, we're all... All we're asking here is for a debate and such a sweeping change uh, being decided without consultation despite longstanding support for such language. It's only right that we have a, a full airing and an opportunity to discuss it. So for that reason, I urge the adoption of the amendment. 
You heard the uh, amendment from the gentleman. Any discussion? If not, the voters on the Cole Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Mr. Chairman, request a roll call. Clerk, a re roll call has been requested. Clerk will call the roll. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Desonier. No. Mr. Desonier, no. Ms. Ross. No. Ms. Ross, no. Mr. Neguse. No. Mr. Neguse, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Rushendaller. Mr. Rushendaller, aye. Mrs. Fishbach. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, nine amendment days. Is not, amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Mr. Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment for one of our former colleagues on the Rules Committee, Ms. Lesko. I move that the committee make an order amendment number 46 uh, offered by Ms. Lesko to Division A of H.R. 4502. Mr. Chairman, this amendment eliminates Section 241, a provision that requires foster care and adoption agencies to comply with Obama regulations on sexual orientation and gender identity, and it prohibits the use of funds to grant exceptions to the rule. The goal of striking this language is to maximize the number of homes available to children and ensure that faith-based agencies aren't forced to choose between their faith and their ministry. Back in 2018, Philadelphia canceled child placements with religious groups to investigate whether these groups violated the city's fair practices ordinance a policy that prohibits, quote-unquote, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. Recently, the Supreme Court voted 6-3 to three to overturn the Philadelphia decision. Uh, the current uh, foster care system is in crisis nationwide. It's beyond me why we would seek to shut out well-qualified agencies uh, uh, out of the system on the basis of their religious belief. I urge adoption of the amendment. Yield back. Heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? If not, the voters on the Cole Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Opinion no. of the chair, the noes have it. Yeah, Level a roll call vote. Mr. Vote roll call has been requested. Clerk will call the roll. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin. No. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon. No. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Desonier. No. Mr. Desonier. No. Ms. Ross. No. Ms. Ross. No. Mr. Neguse. Mr. Neguse, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Rushendaller. Aye. Mr. Rushendaller, aye. Mrs. Fishbach. Aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Members not agreed to. Further amendments, Dr. No, no one more. Oh, uh, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I move that the committee make an order amendment number 49 offered by Mr. Palmer of Alabama to Division D of H.R. 4502. The amendment prohibits funds from being used to implement D.C.'s Reproductive Health Care Non-Discrimination Act, uh, RENDA. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Congress uh, should not interfere with the First Amendment right of freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Fortunately, D.C.'s RENDA does exactly that by requiring religious or pro-life advocacy organizations from making employment decisions consistent with their own beliefs. This important amendment would prevent government overreach and infringement of both the First Amendment and the Religious Freedom Restoration Act by preventing the implementation of RENDA. Certainly, uh, even if you believe RENDA is necessary, with the majority's assault on the Hyde uh, Amendment and other longstanding restrictions, the amendment uh, should at least uh, get an earnest and full debate on the House floor. So I urge adoption of my motion and yield back. Heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? If not, the voters on the Cole Amendment, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Can no. no. the chair the noes have it? And now I request a roll call. Roll call has been requested. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin. No. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon. No. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Desonier. No. Mr. Desonier. No. Ms. Ross. No. Ms. Ross. No. Mr. Neguse. No. Mr. Neguse. No. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Rushendaller. Aye. Mr. Rushendaller. Aye. Mrs. Fishbach. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman? Clerk, no. report the total? Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Uh, further amendments, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee make an order, amendment number 80, offered by Mr. Wahlberg of Michigan to Division A of H.R. 4502. This amendment increases the amount available for the Bureau of International Labor Affairs to combat child trafficking by $3 million. 
so the Bureau can meet its obligations under the TVPRA, the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act. The amendment decreases appropriations for <clears throat> the International Labor Affairs Bureau Workers' Rights Program by the same amount. Mr. Chairman, the Department of Labor requested a $7 million increase to combat child exploitative trafficking. However, the bill before us today only provides just shy of $4 million. It is unfortunate to see the priorities of the majority lie in ensuring that labor unions are funded by more than $26 million over the fiscal year 21 and $7 million more than the President's FY22 request at the expense of combating child labor trafficking. This important amendment offered by Mr. Wahlberg would at least bring the funding in line with the Department of Labor's requested level, and certainly this thoughtful amendment should at least get a fair debate and vote on the House floor. So I urge adoption of my motion so that the motion can get a fair debate on the House floor, and I yield back. All right, the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? If not, the voters on the Burgess Amendment, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Can you the chair, the no's have it. Our roll call has been requested. Mrs. Torres? No. Mrs. Torres? No. Mr. Perlmutter? No. Mr. Perlmutter? No. Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin? No. Ms. Scanlon? <coughs> Ms. Scanlon? No. Mr. Morelli? No. Mr. Morelli? No. Mr. Desonier? No. Mr. Desonier? No. Ms. Ross? No. Ms. Ross? No. Mr. Neguse? No. Mr. Neguse? No. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Burgess? Aye. Mr. Burgess? Aye. Mr. Reschendeller? Aye. Mr. Rushendaller, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Or report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Mr. Rushendaller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee make an order amendment number 176, offered by Mr. Posey to Division A of HR 5402. Mr. Chairman, this amendment prevents funding from going to EcoHealth Alliance, a nonprofit based in New York City. This pandemic has revealed major risks within our scientific systems, including concerns over lab leaks. EcoHealth Alliance sent nearly $1.7 million to the Wuhan Institute of Virology and funded major virus research projects in the lab that likely created the coronavirus. Yet the president of EcoHealth Alliance, Peter Daszak, coordinated two letters in the Lancet Journal which promoted natural origins of the COVID-19 virus and condemned other theories as conspiracies. Meanwhile, the conspiracy theory being that this virus originated in the wild. <clears throat> but back to the letters that Peter Daszak wrote, these letters heavily shaped the narrative around the origins of the virus, despite Daszak's massive conflicts of interest. Research on the SARS-like coronaviruses was performed using NIH funding provided to EcoHealth Alliance at much lower safety, safety levels than is traditionally recommended. Eagle Health Alliance has repeatedly worked with the CCP to conduct research with laboratories and researchers tied to China's biodefense programs. Mr. Chairman, I urge adoption of my motion and I yield back. You heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? Yeah, yes. This Dr. is Burgess. an extremely important uh -huh. amendment that's been offered. And we have worked on this in the Committee of Energy and Commerce. We've worked on it through the Doctors' Caucus. There should be no reason for the United States of America, for the National Institute of Health, to be funding research of this nature in adversarial countries. I mean, it's one thing if you want to do it up in Bethesda, but to be doing it at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, with, and, and now everyone just sort of tosses off the fact that, oh yeah, lab leaks happen there, we know it, they happen all the time. I gotta tell you, I've been to some significant BSL-4 labs in this country, they don't have lab leaks. No one's ever heard of a lab leak in the BSL-4 lab down in, in uh, uh, Galveston. No one's ever heard of one at the BSL-3 lab down at uh, Texas A&M. This is an important amendment. People ought to give some thought before they cast their vote because we will be judged on this. If the truth will come out. They can't suppress it forever. And this amendment is going to be seen as a, as a very powerful action that we could have taken right now to reverse this process. I yield back. The vote is on the Russian Thaler Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Opinion no. of the chair, the no's have Mr. it. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask for a recorded vote. A recorded vote has been requested. Mrs. Torres? No. Mrs. Torres? No. Mr. Perlmutter? No. Mr. Perlmutter? No. Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin? No. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon? No. Mr. Morelli? No. Mr. Morelli? No. Mr. Desonier?
No. Mr. Dussonier, no. no. Ms. Ross, Ms. Ross, no. Mr. Neguse, Mr. Neguse, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Reschendaller, Mr. Reschendaller, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Report report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment is not agreed. Further amendments, Ms. Fishbach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee make an order amendment number 16 offered by Mr. Wilson to Division A of HR 4502. This amendment strikes Section 314 of Division A, which prohibits funds made available by this act or any other act from being awarded to a charter school that contracts with a for-profit entity to operate, oversee, or manage the activities of the school. Section 314 has no business in an appropriations bill, and here's why. First, this provision is so broad that it doesn't just encompass funds appropriated in this bill, but any funds that a charter school could be eligible for, past, present, or future. This includes Title I funds, funds appropriated for COVID earlier this year, or even next year's appropriation bills. On top of that, this provision doesn't even define what a charter school is, and no federal definition exists leaving it to any relevant agency to have to define a charter school, which will certainly vary across all fed, federal agencies. And finally, Section 314 prohibits charter schools who contract with for-profit organizations to operate, oversee, or manage activities from receiving federal funds. Clearly, charter schools that contract with for-profit organizations to run the entire school would be covered, but this section is drafted so poorly that it raises the question of whether a charter school could lose its funds from contracting with a food service to provide food to the children or contracting with a financial institution to undertake an audit. Certainly, this cannot be what the majority intends. This issue is certainly one of importance, but should be heard by the Education and Labor Committee, not a sloppily written writer in an appropriation bill. For that reason, I urge the majority to make the Wilson Amendment in order. You heard the General Aid's amendment. Any discussion? If not, the voters on the Fishbach Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Any of the chair, the no's have it. I request a, a recorded uh, vote. A recorded has been vote. requested. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. De Mr. Desonier. No. Mr. Desonier, no. Ms. Ross. Ms. Ross, no. Mr. Neguse, no. Mr. Neguse, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Reschendaller, aye. Mr. Reschendaller, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, re clerk report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee make in order amendment number 51 offered by Mr. Donalds from Florida to Division D of H.R. 4502. The amendment strikes language regarding the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program. Mr. Chairman, the Opportunity Scholarship Program, originally created in 2003 with bipartisan support, is an extremely important program helping to provide scholarships to underserved families residing in the District of Columbia the average income for which is less than $27,000 per year. It is a vital lifeline for these families who believe that private school is the best, no, the only option for their children. Currently funded by the Scholarships for Opportunity and Results Act, it is unfortunate to see the majority attack this opportunity to provide parents with the education that they think is best for their children. Look, it's clear that Washington doesn't always know what's best for our nation's children, and Congress should not inhibit parents from making such important decisions regarding their children's futures. I urge adoption of the amendment. It is the right thing to do, and I yield back. You heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? If not, the voters on the Burgess Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Can you the no, no wait, wait a minute. We carried that one clearly. That was for a roll call. <laughs> And I'm, I don't know. I'm, I, I heard no. But anyway, you want a roll call? Roll, uh, a roll call has been requested. Yeah. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Mr. Desonier. No. 
Mr. Desaunier, no. Ms. Ross, no. Ms. Ross, no. Mr. Neguse, no. Mr. Neguse, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Reschendaler, aye. Mr. Reschendaler, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee make an order amendment number 102 offered by Ms. Bobert of Colorado to Division D of HR 4502. This amendment prohibits funds from going to so-called sanctuary city, cities. Mr. Chairman, simply put, cities that willfully choose to not enforce the laws of the land should not be eligible for federal funds in this bill. By refusing to prosecute undocumented aliens and denying the Immigrations and Customs Enforcement detainers, sanctuary cities are preventing federal agents from being able to enforce the law. A detainer is the primary tool used by Immigrations and Customs Enforcement to gain custody of criminal aliens for deportation. It is a notice to another law enforcement agency that the uh, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement intends to assume custody of an alien and includes information on the alien's previous criminal history, immigration violations, and potential threat to public safety or security. Congress must work to ensure that federal funds are being used towards cities that uphold and enforce the rule of law. I urge adoption of this amendment and I yield back. I heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? If not, the, oh, Mr. Neguse. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Burgess, I, I wonder a query whether or not uh, you would confirm your opposition to sanctuary state policies that have been adopted in a variety of different states uh, that have declared themselves sanctuary from any uh, enforcement of federal gun regulations. I, uh, is that your position? And I would yield to the gentleman. This particular amendment, of course, as, as you heard, applies to sanctuary cities and the withholding of federal funds for cities that willfully ignore uh, federal law. It's a, just reclaiming my time, I certainly understand uh, the gentleman's amendment. I guess what I'm asking the gentleman is that, is it his position that that would mean any city and any state in the United States that would refuse to comply with federal regulations regarding guns, for example, uh, would in fact uh, be violative of uh, this amendment? Not if they were following the Second Amendment, which I understand is, is in fact, the Supreme Court. <laughs> is that, and, and you reclaim my time, that's your construction of the Second Amendment I pose? Are we using the Dr. Burgess standard? In any event, I would just simply say, um, I'll yield back to the, uh, to the chairman, but I, I think it's important, it's an important clarification that is worth uh, stressing because there are states across the country, including Arizona, just by way of example, uh, that recently have declared themselves Second Amendment sanctuary states where they refuse to uh, enforce a variety of federal gun regulations or laws that are on the books, and I find it uh, a bit uh, ironic, uh, shall we say, that this amendment would be suggested in light of, I believe, the sponsor's opposition, I suspect, to this particular uh, concept. But in any if event, I'll yield back. If the gentleman will yield. I I'll yield the balance of my time back to the chairman. I'll, I'll yield to who I want to be yielded to, Mr. Reschenthaler. So I think there's a conflation of this issue. Um, <laughs> So, so with these detentions, your, the detainers, I was a district judge, i like very familiar with this. If, you, if someone's before you and they're a defendant and there's a detainer on them, you basically have to alert the authority who has the detainer on that person. So example, if you're a judge in one county and another person has a detainer, you just have to alert the constable in that other county <clears throat> that you have somebody in your court. This is the same thing when you're informing ICE. So I think there's a conflation of two different issues. With that, I yield back. The vote is now on the Burgess Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Can no. you the cheer the noes have it? That's what roll call. Roll call has been requested. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Dersonye. No. Mr. Dersonye, no. Ms. Ross. Ms. Ross, no. Mr. Neguse, Mr. Neguse, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Reschendaler, Mr. Reschendaler, aye. 
Mrs. Fishbach. Aye. Mrs. Fishbach. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman. No. Clerk, report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Mr. Reschenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee make an order amendment number 78 offered by Mr. Hill to Division D of HR 5402. This amendment increases funding by $50 million for the Office of National Drug Control Policies High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas Program and offsets the increase with a decrease in funding of $50 million for the Electric Vehicles Fund. Mr. Chairman, the High Intensity Drug, drug Trafficking Areas Program provides assistance to federal, state, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies to fight drug trafficking and abuse. I am grateful that last year the Trump administration designated Westmoreland County in my congressional district as one of those areas. This designation ensures southwestern Pennsylvania has the resources necessary to combat drug trafficking and keep our community safe. I want more communities across our nation to receive these dedicated federal resources that ultimately save lives. Mr. Chairman, given that last year overdose, overdose deaths increased by nearly 30 percent, this amendment should certainly be brought up for discussion on the House floor. I urge adoption of my motion. I yield back. Heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? If not, the voters. Are, oh, you, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, yeah, Mrs. I, I just want to let the gentleman know that um, the, the HIDA amendment or the HIDA grant is one of my top priorities. I work with regionally with, with um, uh, the law enforcement um, uh, offices in, in my area, and the grant received a I don't know, it, large, large uh, increase. I don't have the amount in front of me, but um, the bill is good. If you care about Haida, you should vote for the bill. And I yield back. The vote now is on the Russian Thaler Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Chairman, I ask for a recorded vote. Recorded vote has been requested. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon, Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Desonier, no. Mr. Desonier, no. Ms. Ross, no. Ms. Ross, no. Mr. Nugus, no. Mr. Nugus, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Rushendaller, Mr. Rushendaller, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Ms. Fishbach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee make an order, amendment number 59, offered by Mr. Smith of Missouri to Division D of HR 4502. This amendment reduces funding by $10 million from the Electric Vehicles Fund for the purchase of electric vehicles and charging infrastructure for the United States Postal Service and increases funding to the FCC by $10 million to dedicate more research infrastructure and resources for deployment of rural broadband. Mr. Chairman, as has been discussed before, so many rural Americans depend on the FCC to provide the tools needed for fast and reliable broadband. These tools enable rural businesses, families, schools, and farmers to keep up in the modern digital age. Congress should be focused on helping support rural broadband and expand its access by providing the necessary resources to the FCC to complete to accomplish this. Certainly, this amendment deserves an honest and full debate on the House floor. I urge the adoption of my motion. I yield back. There's the General Lady's Amendment. Any discussion? If not, the voters on the Fishback Amendment, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Opinion no. of the Chair, the no's have Mr. Chair, I request a record of vote. Record of vote has been requested. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Desonier, no. Mr. Desonier, no. Ms. Ross, no. Ms. Ross, no. Mr. Nugus, no. Mr. Nugus, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Rushendaller, aye. Mr. Rushendaller, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Mr. Rushenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee mark and order amendment number 50, offered by Mr. Smith to Division F of HR 5402. This amendment prevents funding provided by this act from being used to close the detention center at Guantanamo Bay or transfer any individual detained at the facility to another location. Since 2010, bipartisan majorities in Congress have maintained the prohibition on closing or realignment of 
Naval Station Guantanamo Bay. This longstanding provision supports our national security interests in the Caribbean and Latin America and provides a secure location for some of the most dangerous criminals and terrorists in the world, including the masterminds of 9-11. In two, uh, 2019, the DNI found that 17% of terrorists that left Gitmo re-engaged in terrorist activities. Therefore, I urge adoption of my motion. I yield back. I heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? Hearing none, the voters on the Reschenthaler Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Can you chair the no's have it? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I ask for, Mr. Chairman, I ask for a quarter vote. The quarter vote has been requested. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon, Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Desonier, no. Mr. Desonier, no. Ms. Ross, Ms. Ross, no. Mr. Negus, Ms. Mr. Negus, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Reschenthaler, Mr. Reschenthaler, aye. Mrs. Fishbach. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Ms. Fishbach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee make in order amendment number 29, offered by Mrs. Bobert of Colorado to Division F of HR 4502. This amendment prioritizes the Veterans Affairs General Administration Fund with the intent to reduce the Veterans Disability Claims Backlog. Mr. Chairman, of the roughly 520,000 pending VA claims for the disability compensation and benefits, over 191,000 are considered to be backlogged. While that number is slightly lower than it was earlier this year, it is still far surpasses the 77,000 cases that were considered backlogged in March 2020 before the pandemic struck. This common sense amendment highlights the necessity of reducing that backlog to ensure our veterans are able to claim the assistance that they need in a timely fas fashion. I urge the support of my amendment. I yield back, Mr. Chair. You heard the amendment. Any discussion? If not, the voters on the Fishbach Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Can you the chair the noes have it? Mr. Chair, I request a recorded vote. A recorded vote has been requested. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Desonier, no. Mr. Desonier, no. Ms. Ross, yes. Ms. Ross, no. Mr. Negus, no. Mr. Negus, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Reschenthaler, aye. Mr. Reschenthaler, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Uh, before we report out, I understand that Lesco 46 was actually made in order. So for that reason, I ask unanimous consent that the roll call vote number 125 be vitiated without objection. I apologize. No, <laughs> I do. I, we, we, both, we, we both. We both. Right. Okay. Yeah, without objection. Um, all right, now, uh, any other amendment or discussion? Hearing none, the question is now on the motion offered by the gentleman from California. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. Yeah, we request the roll. A roll call has been requested. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres, aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter, aye. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Mr. Raskin, aye. Ms. Scanlon. <coughs> Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, aye. Mr. Desonier, aye. Mr. Desonier, aye. Ms. Ross, aye. Ms. Ross, aye. Mr. Negus, aye. Mr. Negus, aye. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Reschendaler, yes. Mr. Reschendaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Chairman, aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Clear report the total. Nine yeas, four nays. And the motion is agreed to, and I will carry this for the uh, Democrats. And I will carry it for the Democrats. And I think that is it. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you to the staff. You're all fabulous. We will see you tomorrow. All the best. Without objection, the committee is adjourned. Well, you know.